Cloud computing is leading the digital transformation in today's IT sector. The number of apps moving on cloud is insane. One of the biggest players in the cloud computing industry is AWS. As per the recent reports and data, AWS turned out to be the biggest and top cloud service provider. AWS market share is about 32% of the total cloud service market. Amazon has become the biggest chunk of the remaining top contenders such as Google and Microsoft's Azure. The demand curve for cloud computing services continue to flourish and is a critical element in business. According to IDC, spending on public cloud services and infrastructure across the world will increase by 23.8% from 2018, reaching a total spend of $210 billion in 2023. The forecast from 2018 to 2023 is predicted to be 22.5% to reach $370 billion US dollars. Let's discuss something about AWS. AWS avails its services to businesses through dozens of data centers in availability zones that are spread in different regions across the world. Each area has multiple availability zones which in turn have several physical data centers. So there's a lot to learn and a lot to discuss in this video. So stay with us until the end of the session as we cover multiple important AWS concepts through a series of hands-on sessions, in-depth explanation of important AWS concepts and some of the most important AWS interview questions along with an explanation on how to build a career in the AWS industry. Let's jump on to the agenda of the video. But before that, do subscribe to our channel and hit that bell icon for regular updates. We will start with understanding what is cloud computing? What are the various service models and deployment models? We will move on to understanding the pros and cons of AWS as a cloud service provider. We will move on to understanding services like EC2 and understand what is an AMI. We will have a detailed discussion on an introduction to EBS and an introduction to EFS. We'll also cover advanced topics like AWS Terraform, AWS DevOps and AWS DevOps services. We'll be wrapping up this session with AWS Career Path and some of the most important AWS Cloud Practitioner and Solutions Architect interview questions. So stay tuned with us and do watch the video till the end. Thank you. AWS was introduced in 2006 and since then they have been the largest player in the public cloud market. According to Forbes, AWS grew $4.3 billion revenue just in the second quarter of 2021. The top three companies who offer cloud services in terms of market share are Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud Platform. AWS by itself covers 32% of the public cloud market share. So what exactly is AWS? Amazon Web Services or AWS is a cloud service provider owned by Amazon. It offers cloud services in compute, storage, database, content delivery, networking and other domains. Most of the offerings from AWS are infrastructure as a service offerings, but it also offers PaaS service such as Elastic Benstock and Lambda which are popular and highly used services. AWS offers you all the necessary tools you would need to set up your IT infrastructure without paying any upfront. For example, Netflix, the world's biggest premium video streaming service, is completely hosted on AWS for its application needs. The world's largest e-commerce company Amazon is also hosted on the AWS infrastructure itself. When you see such big players in the respective fields rely on AWS for their infrastructure needs, you as an individual user can trust and be inclined towards AWS for your cloud needs. AWS offers a wide range of services that can be categorized into the following. We have compute and network services, storage and content delivery services, security and identity services, database services, analytic services, application services and management tools. Now we have few applications of AWS. What are they? Let's look into it. The first one we have is storage and backup. That's Amazon's cloud storage is an easily accessible and useful services for business. 
Next we have Enterprise IT. That's Amazon Cloud Services offer the ideal solution to enterprise IT's time consuming pace. Mobile, web and social applications. AWS can launch and scale various applications like mobile applications and SaaS applications. Big data. AWS and big data work well with each other to come up with the power and infrastructure necessary to meet the needs of high end intelligent software. Websites can be hosted on AWS cloud. It is also good for hosting CDNs and DNS and domains. In gaming, AWS makes gaming applications easily available to the worldwide gaming network and provides gamers the best experience in online gaming across the globe. Now how much salary does an AWS engineer earns? In India, it earns on an average basis 7 to 13 lakhs per annum, while in USA on an average basis, he or she can earn $137,000. The reason why Amazon is so huge is because of AWS along with its retail arm. The cloud service has a very high revenue and is growing rapidly. Now did you know that AWS IaaS Cloud is 10 times greater than the 14 competitors of AWS combined? Now this speaks volumes about the strong capabilities that this service possesses. Hey folks, welcome to this session. In this session, we will be discussing about cloud computing. So let's move forward. So before understanding cloud computing, we need to understand what exactly is an internet and how internet and intranet are two different thing. So if we will see uh, what is an internet, then internet is a global system of interconnected computer network that uses internet protocol to communicate between network and device. So what exactly is an internet? Internet is the global system for interconnected computers network talking and or you can say it is a way through which we can uh, share our resources, we can have the communication and what exactly is in communication protocol? Communication protocol you can say is nothing but the rules. Let us say if now I'm speaking English, then I should be aware about the English language rule and if I'm aware about that, then only I'll be able to properly communicate. Similarly, whenever our machines communicate, then they need to be aware about the communication protocol or you can say communication rule. Then only they will be able to communicate properly. So in the protocols, we are having different type of protocol and out of those UDP and TCP IP are two of those. Moreover, if we will see what exactly is an intranet, intranet uh, you can say is more restricted network or a network which is local. Or you can say it is a sort of a private network which is having very limited access worldwide. So now uh, let's see what exactly is in virtualization. So virtualization is the process of creating a virtual environment of something. That something can be your hardware platform, your storage device or your network resource. So virtualization uh, basically is the way of creating something which is not physically available, but logically it is being available. Now let us say if virtualization is the technology or you can treat it like as a software. So let us say virtualization is the software that manipulates the hardware. So when we manipulate this thing, then whatever we get is known as cloud computing. So this is how virtualization paves the way for our cloud computing. Now, what exactly is in cloud computing? Cloud computing is the delivery of computing services like server, storage, database over the internet as per pay as you go option. So with cloud computing, we can have faster innovation, flexible resource and more economic scalability. You uh, pay only for the particular resource that you use in the cloud computing. So in this session, we are having all this See you up in the next session. Hey folks, welcome to the session. In this session, we will be discussing about cloud service models and deployment models. So if we are using cloud service models, then we have 
three different types of model available to us. One is infrastructure as service, second one is platform as service, and the third one is software as service. In infrastructure as service, it contains the basic building block for your cloud IT. It provides you with the highest level of flexibility and the management control over your IT resources. And let us say if you are using platform as service, there you are uh, not considering about the underlying infrastructure there or you can say hardware. All you are concerned about your platform, you uh, always have the focus upon deployment and management upon your application. So with this, the efficiency increases if you are using platform as service because you are uh, not consider, uh, considering the other aspects like procurement, capacity planning, software maintenance, patching or any other heavy lifting task. Let us say if you are using software as service, then you, here you are not concerned about the software and the infrastructure that is being managed or whether the service that you are using, you are also not caring about it, whether in the backend it is being managed or not. Here in software service, all you are concerned about is how to use that particular piece of code. So if we will move back here, so we can see, let us say if you are using an on-site uh, sort of resources to manage your demand, then here you will be uh, particularly managing everything starting from your application to operating system to your hardware. But let us say if you are using infrastructure as service, then majority of the things like virtualization, server, storage and networking is being uh, managed by the cloud providers. Let us say if you move into platform as service, so uh, upon your uh, hardware and the operating systems or you can say your operating softwares are being managed by the AWS or your particular cloud provider. So you are not concerned about their thing. All you are concerned about is the particular application and the data. Let us say if you are using SaaS, then here uh, you are not concerned about the particular services or the particular uh, hardware or the software that is underlining you. You are considering about the particular usage of a software. So if we will go for a SaaS, then we can have the example of emails. Let us say if you are using an email, then all you are concerned about is typing a mail and sending it to the particular user that you want to uh, send the mail to. So you are not considering about whether the email uh, servers are available or not. You are uh, only working upon that particular thing to send the particular request and you are intended that the particular person to whom you are sending should get that mail. Let us say if you are using platform as service, so you can basically use AWS Elastic Beanstalk. There you take your code and paste it there. And after that, the deployment and the running of the things and the particular time to time update is being done by the AWS Elastic Beanstalk. Let us say if you are using infrastructure as service, then it's just like interacting with your AWS account where you create all of the resources and then try to do the things. So you can also see, let us say if you're having this infrastructure, then you can imagine like uh, those are the tools for interacting with it. Then we have the platform. So upon the integration of infrastructure and platform, after that, if we will uh, perform the specific task, then we get the end uh, result. And upon that end result, we do the work. Now after this, let us move in and let us see what is cloud deployment models. In cloud deployment model, we are having basically three different types of model. One is public cloud, private cloud, and hybrid cloud. In this particular cloud deployment model, we basically try to identify the specific type of cloud environment based on ownership as well as on the cloud nature and purpose. Let us say if you are using public cloud, then uh, anybody uh, over the internet have the access to the system and the services. So using this public cloud only, uh, the particular cloud infrastructure service are being made available to the general public or you can say to major industrial groups. So in the public cloud, if you will see the security will be less as compared to the private cloud. So in the public cloud, uh, you are having a lot of uh, service providers like AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google platform uh, and the IBM is also there. Let us say uh, 
you have you are using the private cloud then in private cloud what exactly happen is the opposite of your public cloud it is far more restricted cloud it is available only for a specific uh, particular customer or client so here you get an one on one environment and for the single user it is being designed and this particular uh, type of cloud deployment model is also known as internal cloud so uh, if you are using the private cloud then you can have better control over the resources that you use and your data security and privacy also gets enhanced now at the end we are having the hybrid cloud so hybrid cloud is a mixture of both public cloud and private cloud so if you are using hybrid cloud then you will get a good flexibility and enhanced security and the organization can move their application and data depending upon their need in between the clouds if they are using hybrid cloud so if you will see all of this uh, public and private cloud provider are also being available uh, availing the particular hybrid cloud also aws also has a hybrid cloud so if you give a specific request to the aws then you can obtain the thing similarly ibm also provide this type of cloud hope you got the session see you up in the another session hey folks welcome to the session in this session we will be discussing about the advantages of cloud computing over the on premises so the very first and the major advantage that uh, we get in cloud computing is the management of the resources let us say if you are uh, having an on premise setup then let us say on monday if you are uh, using your particular resource then it is upon the mean okay and on the other day on tuesday this particular usage of your resource is more than your mean but on wednesday there is a decrease in the particular resource that you require again on thursday you need more resource as compared to your mean so and in the friday you are using your uh, a lot of resources or you can say your max capacity of the resource that you require similarly on saturday and sunday you are using relatively less resources of yours so if you will see here upon the mean sometimes you require more resource and sometimes you res require less resource let us say in a scenario where you are having resource only up till mean then you require some day more resource and upon some day you are requiring less resource let us say if you are having a lot of resources then sometimes it will be getting wasted or sometimes it might happen that you need even more resource than your available resource so this can be the scenario so if you are having an on premise setup then you need to have a lot more resource than you require so if you are using the cloud computing then this problem will get resolved how let us say on the particular day you require very less resource then basically you can scale down it and on a particular day where you require more resources you can simply scale the things up by requesting to your cloud provider so if we are able to do the things then there are lot of advantage one advantage is the cost that is being incurred let us say whatever things you are been using or what ever is being charged that is being incurred by using the resource only that thing you pay you don't do any other over provisioning thing so which uh, helps you in uh, saving up the cost as because you will be not acquiring more resources like more server or storage options so those are the options you get if you are using the cloud uh, computing and if you will see the major advantages the first major advantage is no capital expenditure because everything you access over the internet so whatever resources you want you can access it directly over the internet so there is uh, no investment done upon the hardware or the software that you need to have and everything is being charged pay as you go option so let us say if you used a particular resources for an hour then you will be only paying for that it doesn't matter for what many hours it was available to you it's only matter is for how many hours have you actually used that particular resource and getting the new uh, resources are very simple you can simply put a request then you can have 
the resource and moreover if you want to reserve the resource that options also you can do and let us say if you reserve any of the resources let us say ec2 service uh, you go for and in that if you reserve the ec2 instance resource then you can save up significantly and after that uh, if you are using the cloud computing then the resources will be highly available 99.99999 times it will be available and majority of the resources will be going with that much of availability moreover the security will also get enhanced how because all of the major cloud providers provides you encryption in whatever resource or the service that you use you also get different type of keys so that the accessibility of the thing is only limited to you if you share the things then only other people will be able to get the things upon this the flexibility also increases because you can use different types of services and resources quickly which is not that much possible if you go for on premise set so in this session we are having all this see you up in another session hey folks welcome to the session in this session we will be discussing about aws suite let us say this is an corporate data center and you are having an on premise setup and uh, let us say this is the architecture of your particular uh, network you can say or you can say your infrastructure is based upon this architecture so uh, you will be having a particular domain for the accessibility of your particular website you can say www dot uh, whatever name you want to have and let us say if they are a user so they will be interacting uh, with that and they will be accessing the thing to protect uh, from any of the unauthorized access you will be having firewalls to save the particular data you will be having databases and you will be having servers and the storage options will be available to you so whatever things are there uh, in your storage option you can take it and uh, you can uh, basically modify those things using your databases you can manipulate the data using the databases and you can store the data in the storage option for monitoring uh, the things you uh, will be having some other applications there and you will be also enabling notification to see what exactly is happening in your architecture but let us say if you are using all of these things then they will not be provided by a particular provider so you will be uh, have to uh, integrate a lot of things let us say if you are using databases so you have to set up the things manually storage options you have to invest upon the hardware cost that is going to get incurred the domain names will be provided by someone else for the uh, monitoring purpose you will be having different application so integration of the things will take a lot of time and the availability of the architecture is also in question let us say if you require a storage uh, suddenly if the demand for the storage increases in abundance then you cannot uh, manually manage the things then you have to set up uh, the more hardwares so which uh, in the meantime can cost your organization and let us see if a, there is a particular user and if it creates a fake account then and if that particular uh, user is able to breach your network then it can create a lot of uh, unsuspicious activity in your account uh, that particular user can uh, particularly damage your architecture a lot so apart from this if we will see what we have in aws suit is that in one place we are uh, able to get a lot of different services and the integration is also pretty much easy and as because this is being provided by the aws so it will have encryption in every level so it doesn't matter what service or what resource you are using so it will be far more secure far more flexible and far more available as compared to the previous setup let us say if you are having a domain and you want to manage it you can manage it using the route 53 let us say if there is a particular user and that user want to access your architecture or your website so you can particularly specify in that thing in the im you can provide them with the credentials you can even provide the permissions to them that whatever what exactly is the accessibility of that particular user what that particular user can use and what it cannot use 
let us say if you want to make your network more secure you can definitely work in vpc so vpc is the way in which you can create the architecture if you not choose vpc you will not be able to launch your machines so definitely at the very starting point only the security purpose uh, increases uh, enormously and let us say there is the particular security groups and nickels to uh, check whether the things are going properly or not whether the accessibility that you define is only going to be that much only no more no less and let us say if you need uh, more uh, storage options more uh, virtual machines so the scaling up of the thing will be far more easier and it will be far more available as compared to the previous setup let us say if you want to uh, monitor the things what is the logs that is being incurred how is your account been functioning then you can definitely use cloudwatch even cloud trail also you can use and there you can also check whether any suspicious activity is being registered in your account or not let us say if you want to have the notification you can use the sns service that is being available apart from that you also have the option of sqs and ses so all of these things you get in aws so integrating the things and the security aspect also increases in abundance so if you will go with this so in this session we are having all this see you up in the another session hey folks welcome to the session in this session we will be discussing about virtualization in aws so what exactly is in virtualization virtualization is the process of creating a virtual environment of something that something can be your hardware or it can be your storage device also or your uh, network resources you can say that so now let us say if we are using virtualization then there are a lot of advantages what are the advantage it saves up uh, space as well as operating cost moreover uh, it will enable us with the easy management of our data center now there are different types of virtualization like hardware virtualization application virtualization server virtualization storage virtualization network virtualization and desktop virtualization but uh, here in virtualization in aws we will be focusing on our hardware virtualization now if we will look into an hypervisor what exactly is an hypervisor hypervisor is a hardware virtualization technique that allows us to uh, basically run multiple uh, guest operating system on a single host system on same time the hypervisors uh, you can also say is also known as virtual machine manager now coming on to type 1 hypervisors uh, basically uh, there are two types of hypervisors uh, one is type 1 and type 2 so let us first discuss about type 1 hypervisor type 1 hypervisor is also known as native and bare metal that you can uh, see from the picture from the picture you are also able to see uh, one thing is that in type 2 hypervisor we are having an operating system but the same is not applicable with type 1 so type 1 hypervisors run directly on underlying host system it has direct access to hardware resource it does not uh, require any uh, base server operating systems you can say that so as it does not require any base operating system so it is far more efficient uh, because it has direct accessibility to the hardware uh, components like cpu memory network and physical storage the only you can say the disadvantage that we get with type 1 hypervisor is we need to have a dedicated separate machine to run the instruction so if you will uh, look for the examples of type 1 hypervisor then you can go with vmware ex1 uh, 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 particular hypervisor is an example microsoft hypervisor 5 is an example of that now let us discuss about what is type 2 hypervisor it is also known as hosted hypervisor the only difference that you will find in type 1 and in type 2 is that uh, here in type 2 our hypervisor does not uh, directly interact with an our hardware we are having an operating system in between that so that is what happens in type 2 hypervisor type 2 hypervisor runs on an underlying uh, resource this does not run directly over the underlying resource but uh, rather it runs as an application in host system so uh, and software is already installed in our operating system and using this uh, particular software the hypervisor make operating system uh, basically it reaches out to operating system and ask to make hardware 
calls so basically type 2 hypervisor is useful for the engineers or you can say security analyst to check the malware and the newly developed application so if you will look in type 1 hypervisor uh, is far more efficient or you can say is far more better performing as compared to type 2 hypervisor because in type 1 hypervisor we don't have any middleman but type 2 hypervisor is easy to set up and can be set up quickly in test driven environment now after this uh, let's move forward and let us see what is zen hypervisor so zen hypervisor is a type 1 hypervisor which provides services that allows multiple computer uh, operating system to execute on same computer hardware concurrently so uh, zen hypervisors run in more privileged cpu state than any other uh, software on machine except the firmware so you can say that um, being in uh, type 1 hypervisor whatever features that are being available in our type 1 hypervisor uh, zen hypervisor have all of those things you can see aws uses the particular gen so in this particular session we are having all this see you up in the next session hey folks welcome to the session in this session we will be discussing about uh, the top three cloud providers for the time being that's microsoft azure aws and gcp so aws is amazon web services microsoft azure is a particular you can say service uh, provider which is being powered by microsoft aws is being powered by amazon.com and gcp that is google cloud cloud platform is being uh, specified or you can say is being powered by google so microsoft azure was initially launched in 2010 similarly aws was launched in 2006 and gcp was launched in 2008 so being the oldest cloud provider aws has more availability zones and uh, you, even you can see more number of availability zones they are also rolling out similarly azure has 54 regions and uh, it is available in 140 countries though gcp also got uh, launched in 2008 but majority of its services have been started to roll out very recently so you can think gcp is very uh, new in this particular arena now if i'll move forward now uh, if you will see the market share and the growth rate currently aws is the leading market uh, share uh, it is the front runner in the particular cloud providing domain after that we have azure and then we are having gcp so now if you will uh, look into aws aws being the oldest uh, cloud provider so it has more number of features it is available in more availability zones and even more number of uh, regions are uh, even uh, being in rollout phase so aws also provides better security as compared to its other peers and the particular if you will see the documentation part of aws is also very good though aws does not have its own tools so it relies upon third party for the tools but uh, the users are pretty happy with the things because it's working very smoothly so if you will see the major uh, you can say the client for the aws are netflix airbnb unilever bmw samsung mi and there are many more and the only part where aws misses out is the complex billing architecture now if we will uh, look into the azure aspect so azure uh, works uh, being in the hybrid cloud just like uh, our aws works in public cloud so majority of the fortune 500 companies are the client of microsoft azure microsoft azure has a very good integration of the azure platform with its microsoft product but it lacks in the integration part when it comes to non microsoft product and the billing aspect of the azure is uh, you can say is good as compared to the aws but the documentation aspect is not good in uh, terms of azure you can say that and after that if we will move forward we are having google so google is very new in this field but it is the leader in ml and ai tools so it has smaller uh, global presence but if you will look in they have very good documentation and videos if you want to cover the gcp aspect 
Now, if you look into AWS for past 11 years, AWS is the current market leader in cloud domain as per the Gartner chart and even being the oldest, so AWS has the better community support as compared to its peers. In this particular demonstration, we are having all this. See you up in the next one. Hey folks, welcome to the session. In this session, we will be discussing about what is an EC2. So let's go and let's explore the things. So basically EC2 is Elastic Compute Cloud. You can think it like a uh, computing resource that you get or you can think it like a virtual server that is being available to you. Let us say if you are uh, sitting physically and if you want to interact with your website, so you need a physical machine. In that machine, you need operating systems, you need different types of CPU, processor and all of those things. So let us say if you want to use all of those things virtually, then you can use Amazon EC2. Basically, Amazon EC2 is this service and inside this service, we will be interacting with a particular resource known as EC2 instance and there we can build our virtual machine. So EC2 is a computing capacity that is scalable in Amazon Web Services Cloud. Using Amazon EC2 eliminates the need to invest in hardware upfront allowing you to develop and deploy application more quickly. How exactly can we do all of these things because if we are using the cloud then we can scale up or scale down the resources very quickly and we also have the provisioning method uh, that is being given to us so we can do all of those things very quickly. Now we will see what are the features of EC2. First of all as I told you instances are virtual computing environment. So how is it helpful to us? Let us say if you are working currently in a particular machine having the operating system Ubuntu. Now let us say your needs are changed and now you need to shift to Windows. Then if it is your physical machine then there are two options available. One you have to download some virtual box and upon that you have to install the Windows or entirely you have to buy a new system. But let us say if you are having a particular physical system and there you are able to access the cloud computing then you can basically launch a particular instance of whatever operating systems you need. So basically instances are virtual computing environment. So virtually you can do these things. After that you have the Amazon machine image. So Amazon machine image are nothing but uh, they are the ISO file or in more simpler terms these are the operating systems. Let us say if you are interacting physically with your machine then you might be having Windows or Mac OS. Similarly if you are creating a particular virtual machine there you can choose this particular AMI option under this AMI option you can get Amazon Linux, Ubuntu Linux, Red Hat Linux, Mac OS and Windows uh, type of operating system and depending upon your need you can use it and you can even create a image of that from the existing machine. After that if you will look into instance type let us say uh, if you are having a physical machine then there you will be having different types of uh, memory storage being available to you, your storage options will be there, your networking capacity will be there, your particular processors will be there like i5 or i7. Similarly, if you are choosing the instance type, there you get uh, all of this option. You can basically choose how many virtual CPUs you require, what is the memory that you require. So all of those things are being availed to you from the EC2. After that, if you will look, uh, there is also key pairs which are very essential. Let us say if you want to launch a particular machine, then if you are having the particular key pair, then only you can launch the EC2. So basically that enhance, enhances the security aspect of the thing. Now we'll move forward. Now let us try to understand what exactly is elastic mean when we say elastic compute cloud. So elasticity basically mean to particularly uh, go on with the capacity to manage the capacity. Let's say currently if I am having a lot of user interacting with my architecture. So a lot of load is upon my particular machine. So my, dynamically my EC2 instances or my EC2 service should be able to manage those things. So that is what elasticity means. It will either provision or deprovision the resources depending upon the traffic or you can say depending upon the load. Let us say now you can see if the number of users decreases then the particular resources it need to free up and let us say if 
the number of users increases then it should be able to get uh, more number of resources dynamically it should expand or it should contract so this is what we are having in this particular session see you up in the another session and in that we will discuss about regions and availability zones hey folks welcome to this session in this session we will be discussing about ec2 instance type so before that uh, let us understand what exactly is an instance type so instance type is a combination of uh, cpu memory storage and networking capacity it gives you the flexibility to choose the uh, approximate uh, minimum resource for your particular application let us say if you are having a physical machine so in a physical machine apart from your operating system you have a lot of different specifications like you might be having the storage options that is being available to you you will be having the networking setting option that is being given to you similarly you will be uh, also having uh, cpus running so let us say if you are uh, trying to create a virtual machine so while creating a virtual machine you need to specify all of these things because we have seen let us say if you are creating a virtual machine so you get the option of choosing an ami similarly you will be also uh, getting the option of choosing the particular specifications for your particular machine so now if we will move forward and if we will see here then in instance type uh, we get uh, five different type of instance type general purpose memory optimized storage optimized accelerated computing and compute optimized now if you will uh, go for the general purpose instance type here you will get a mixture of everything it can be a uh, memory you will uh, get a uh, relatively uh, storage options you will also get the option of uh, managing the particular load so in general purpose uh, you basically get a mixture of memory storage networking everything you get uh, not very much but yeah in a limit it will be in a packed manner it will be available to you and if we will go for the memory optimized from its name it is very much uh, explanatory if you are going for the memory optimized then the memory that you will be getting will be uh, pretty much more as compared to the other instance type that is being available similarly if you go for uh, storage optimized then the storage uh, class you will get a lot as compared to the other particular aspects uh, now if we will uh, look into the accelerated computing here uh, we basically use it for uh, let us say if there is a sudden spike in the particular users that is coming to your architecture or to your traffic let us say now uh, currently with your website two users are interacting and in next two minute 10000 users came up so suddenly the interaction of the user has gone tremendously up so there you can use your accelerated computing now comes uh, when exactly do we used compute optimized we use compute optimized in those particular scenarios where uh, we need a high performing cpus so if you need a high performing architecture then you can definitely go for compute optimized in this particular video we are having all this see you up in the next week hey folks welcome to this session in this session we'll be discussing about ami so what is an ami ami is basically amazon machine image so you can think ami is uh, like an iso file or uh, in more uh, layman term you can think ami is like an operating system that you choose for your particular machine let us say if you are having your physical machine so there you have the operating system that is been working upon and because of this operating system you are able to uh, interact with the hardware and you are able to do the things definitely gui will be also there so if you are choosing the uh, ami then basically you are specifying what type of operating system your particular machine should be having it can be mac os it can be windows it can be red hat linux it can be ubuntu or it can be amazon linux as well so if you are choosing the ami not only you are choosing the operating system but also you are choosing the architecture it can be 64 bit architecture or your 32 bit architecture or arm 64 is also being supported uh, so that depends upon what type of ami you are choosing and upon that it will be given if you are selecting the ami with that ami a particular storage options also get attached with it storage uh, in this sense you can say a root volume will be there and this particular root volume will be a ebs type only 
and let us say if you are uh, choosing this AMI so based upon this uh, AMI it will uh, dictate how exactly will you be using the things so this AMI uh, you can say is an important aspect if you are uh, going to choose a particular machine how exactly let us say right now you are upon your particular system and suddenly your requirement changes now let us say in your physical system you are having windows and now you want to use mac os so there are two way out to use that either you can install the virtual box and you can uh, basically install the mac os in that or else you have to entirely buy a new system for using the mac os but let us say if you are having the access to the cloud then simply you can uh, choose the ami and start using a particular uh, machine of your type so whatever way uh, whatever thing you want to have you can use that so now if we will look in uh, creating and copying an ami so if uh, you will be uh, able to launch an instance then then you will get the option of uh, creating an ami out of the particular instance so now the question come why exactly are we creating the uh, ami let us say if you are having a particular machine and your machine is somehow uh, due to some error it is not working but if you could somehow able to trace back your particular operating systems or whatever architecture it was in then let us say if you take that operating system put it in some other system then you can say that you have actually replicated your previous machine which was not working so that is the particular advantage that we get if we are able to copy our ami because instance replication is not supported in the aws but let us say if you are able to create the ami of a instance then you can do it you can do the replication let us say if your particular instance is present in one region then you can uh, with the help of the ami you can launch uh, another instance in different region with the help of ami so that is what ami provides you hope you got the things see you up in the next video Hey folks, welcome to the session. In this session, we will be discussing about regions and availability zones. So, why is it important to know about regions and availability zones? Because there will be few services which will be region specific, and there will be few services which are global. Let us say if you are interacting with EC2 service, then that particular service is an regional service. But let us say if you are interacting with S3 service, then that particular service is going to be global. So now let us understand what exactly is a region. So you can see uh, these are the particular regions that have been available uh, for the time being. In the green color you can see these things and the red are the ones that are going to come up. So a lot of uh, new regions are being uh, and going to be enrolled by the AWS. So now let's try to understand what exactly is a region. Let us say uh, here is a particular name that is known as North Virginia, North California, Mumbai, Frankrupt or Tokyo. So those are known as regions. So what uh, happens in region? Uh, regions are those geographical location where our AWS data center lies. Now the things come what is a particular availability zone. Let us say in North Virginia you can see it is also known as US East 1. There we will be having uh, availability zones. So what are the availability zones? You can say US East 1A, US East 1B, US East 1C, 1D, 1E and 1F are known as availability zones. So each region is independent of one another. So we are having availability zone because let us say if one particular availability zone goes down then there will be other availability zones to maintain the flow of the state of whatever architecture we are having so that basically our particular website does not goes down or our architecture is available for most of the time let us say if uh, we want to reduce the latency then we can do it if we are having our particular servers running in different uh, availability zones if one of the availability zones goes down then the other will come into the picture and we will be getting an uninterrupted service for whatever thing we are using so this is what region and availability zones are hope you got the concept meet you up in the next session hey folks welcome to the session in this session we will be discussing about ebs so ebs is elastic block store or you can also say it elastic block storage 
So basically this is an raw and unformatted storage option that is being available to you. Let us say if you are having your physical machine, in your physical machine you are having a RAM. So RAM as we all know is the fast accessible memory that is being uh, available to your machine. Similarly EBS is uh, similarly EBS acts like a RAM to your virtual machine. It is the fast accessible uh, memory to your virtual machine. So that is what EBS is. So uh, and other thing that let us say if you want to use your EBS then at the beginning you have to format it because it does not comes with the formatted option. So you have to format it then only you will be able to start using it. Let us say uh, if you are using your root volume which is being attached to your machine while launching your instance then that root volume is already in the formatted manner but let us say if you attach the EBS manually then you have to format the EBS first then only you will be able to use it. Now if we will look into the uh, feature of EBS then uh, there are a lot of features. The first feature that comes up is that uh, depending upon the IOPS and throughput you can choose what type of EBS you want to have. Other than that you can uh, have your EBS in the same uh, availability zone of your machine is there. So basically the accessibility will be faster. Apart from that uh, let us say if you are using your EBS then you can also specify the particular storage option that you want to achieve. It. Now uh, let us say if you are having a particular physical machine so there you will be having a storage option. After that uh, what you do? you just do the partitioning of that storage. So that thing has been demonstrated you here. Uh, let us say if you are having a storage option then you can partition it to different types of drive C drive, D drive, E drive whatever you want and once you have made that partitioning then you can move into that drives and start uh, making the particular folder inside it and once you make the folder inside it then you can start uh, storing any number of data you want. It may be file, it may be a txt or it may be a video uh, whatever way you want to have it you can have all those things. Now if we will look into the uh, Linux or Unix file system this is how the things are there. There will be a root volume and upon that root volume you create a directory. So whatever thing we uh, refer a folder in the Windows uh, file system that is we, uh, we uh, basically go with the name of directory in our Linux or Unix. Once you create the directory then you can go to that particular location and start uh, having the particular data you want to store it. So this is how the things look in the Unix. So in the next session we will be looking into our EBS concepts. Hey folks, welcome to the session. In this session we will be discussing about EBS concepts. So we already know that EBS is a raw and unformatted uh, storage option that is being made available to us. Now let us say if you are using the storage options then upon two things you will be looking on. One is throughput and one is IOPS. Now what exactly is an throughput? So throughput is basically a parameter upon which you decide that uh, what is the amount of data that is being transferred either from or to to the storage device per seconds or you can say in minutes. So based upon that you can decide that how much of data transferring are you able to do. And the other aspect that you check in is the IOPS. So what exactly is an IOPS? IOPS is basically input output uh, per second. So it basically gives you a uh, particular number that upon per second how much of input and output can be done upon your particular storage options that is being available being, uh, that is uh, basically upon an EBS how much of the input and output can be done. Now if we will move forward. So here we are uh, going to have the four different types of EBS volumes that are being available to us. Now if you will uh, see the first two general purpose and the provisioned IOPS they are having SSD. Now what exactly is an SSD? SSD is basically an storage option that is being available to us. So if you will see what is uh, SSD stands for? SSD stands for solid state drive and what does HDD stands for? HDD stands for hard disk drive. HDD is also a storage option that is being available to us. Let us say if you are having small or random uh, input output 
then you will be uh, preferring SSD over the HDD because it performs better when it comes to small or random input output. But uh, let us say if you are having a large streaming workload, then definitely you will be performing HDD. And let us say if you are using SSD, then the performance attribute is IOPS. And if you are using HDD, then the performance attribute is going to be throughput. Now coming on to general purpose SSD, then the baseline performance is 3 IOPS GV with a minimum of 100 IOPS and a maximum of 10,000 IOPS. The burst performance that it can give you is 3000. Now let us understand what is an burst performance. Let us say if there is a particular you can say mean for the particular performance and if your particular machine is unable to reach that uh, much of mean level. So whatever is being uh, you can say uh, the mean is 10 and your machine is able to perform up to 8 only because there is not uh, much more workload. Then that 2 units is being reserved. And when in the future your machine is going to need more number of performance then that 2 unit is going to be get released. Similarly if you are using general purpose then you will get a mixture of everything. But let us say if you uh, want a little bit higher performance as compared to the general purpose then definitely you can uh, look for the provisioned SSD. It will be performing, uh, it will be giving you the performance far better as compared to the general purpose SSD. Then we are having the throughput optimized HDD. Then uh, as you already know that being in HDD storage option, the major focus of this particular storage is upon the throughput. Uh, if you want the more throughput, you can definitely go for uh, throughput optimized HDD. And we are having cloud storage HDD. Let us say if there is a particular data whose retrieval is not that much frequent. And if you want the particular attribute, in that particular storage is throughput then definitely you can use the cold storage HDD. Now uh, as we already know that EBS if you want to use then your particular machine and your particular EBS have to be in the same availability zones and you can attach one EBS with only one machine. But let us say if you want to attach multiple uh, EBS then definitely you can use provisioned IOPS IO1 volume and for using that the particular uh, machine configuration has to be uh, AWS Nitro system based Amazon EC2 and that also have to be present in the same availability zone if it is there then definitely you can go for the multi attach of your EBS. Now let us say if you are having this multi attach uh, feature uh, being available to you then you can perform a better uh, sharing of the data. And the accessibility is also be good because that is those things are present in the same availability zone. Now let us see what exactly is an EBS snapshot. So snapshots are nothing but the backup of your particular volume. So EBS we already know that it is uh, similar to our RAM, uh, RAM storage that we get in our physical system. Let us say if there is some uh, of the data present in my EBS and let us say uh, due to some uh, chaos or due to some problem I lost my EBS volume then how will I be able to uh, retrieve it back only if I have uh, if I have taken the backup then only I will be able to do it. So uh, you get the option of taking the snapshots of your particular EBS all the snapshots are incremental uh, except the first one and where exactly is your snapshot being stored it is stored in the Amazon S3. Now let us say if you are having the EBS snapshot then you can basically copy your particular snapshot or your backups from one region to another region and you can even use that particular uh, backup how exactly. Let us say if you are having your particular uh, snapshot in US East 1. You take uh, the particular backup to the uh, US West 2 there you retrieve it back into the volume form and then you attach that volume to your machine. So then you will be able to use your particular uh, EBS volume uh, there. So that is how you can copy the things and after that you, you also get the option of you also get the option of managing your EBS by using data lifecycle managers. So basically you can define when exactly the backups needed to be taken 
not manually you can uh, do all of these things you can automate every of the thing and the best part about this thing is that it is free of cost so you can schedule that okay in what uh, how many number of days a particular schedule backups would be happening and all of those things then will be stored up so if you are uh, taking the uh, particular snapshots in a regular interval of time then you are protecting your data and whenever you want you can uh, just take it or you can say you can just put it back into your machine if you uh, want it it will also help you in auditors or in internal compliance whenever if anything comes out and uh, let us say if you want to reduce the storage cost then you can do it by deleting the outdated backups if you don't need any particular backup you can simply delete that and if you will look to the quotas of aws data lifecycle manager then you can uh, create up to 100 lifecycle policies per region you can attach 45 tags to your resource and you can create one schedule uh, per lifecycle policy so basically you are getting a lot of options so you can definitely use the data lifecycle manager for managing your ebs so now let us see what is EBS encryption. Let us see if you are having a particular volume, then you can encrypt it. And whenever you will require it, you can decrypt it. So if you are uh, using the things in this particular fashion, then you are protecting your data from any of the uh, malware uh, act attacks. So you can protect your data and you can keep it very safe. And uh, the one thing that needed to be note is that it is supported only for the volumes, not for any of the instances so with this we are done with the ebs concept we'll be looking into efs in our next session hey folks welcome to the session in this session we will be looking into efs so efs is elastic file system so through the efs we can share our data and uh, most of the time it is also available and the scalability also it, that it provides is also limitless the particular uh, storage capacity that e efs provide us is unlimited so let's move forward and let us see what are the features of efs so it is completely managed and uh, let us see if uh, you are using any service in the aws then it will be having its own security own encryption so the data security is also very good you can uh, also get the lifecycle management and the storage class for managing your data in the efs security purpose it is also very good the performance is also good as compared to the other uh, storage options that are being available and uh, the particular storage that it provide us let us see if we'll compare it with the ebs then it has an enormous gap in between because we know ebs cannot provide us with uh, unlimited uh, storage capacity now if we will uh, see uh, what other thing does efs provides us if we will compare it with the ebs now let us go and let us see that let us say if you are using ebs then uh, your particular machine and your EFS has to be present in the same availability zone. But that is not the case with your EFS. EFS uh, does not need to be present in the same availability zone as of your machine. Your machine can be uh, in the region and EFS will be in that region and after that you can do the connection. So the availability zone specification does not apply to the EFS. Now. EBS being an uh, elastic uh, block store so it comes in raw and unformatted manner but the same is not applicable to the EFS so you can straight away go into EFS and you can start using the thing and where does we use EBS let us see if there is any database application that is running then we will be using EBS but uh, for the companies to improve their content management systems they can be using EFS because let us say if any company is using it, uh, then they will be uh, dumping a lot of data into it. EBS definitely will be uh, fast accessible because EBS acts like a primary memory to your machine, but EFS acts like a secondary uh, storage option that is being available to your machine. But the storage option that EFS can provide, EBS cannot provide you. So that is what we are having in EBS versus EFS. We will look into FSX in our next session. See you up in the next session.
AWS was introduced in 2006 and since then they have been the largest player in the public cloud market. According to Forbes, AWS grew $4.3 billion revenue just in the second quarter of 2021. The top three companies who offer cloud services in terms of market share are Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud Platform. AWS by itself covers 32% of the public cloud market share. So what exactly is AWS? Amazon Web Services or AWS is a cloud service provider owned by Amazon. It offers cloud services in compute, storage, database, content delivery, networking and other domains. Most of the offerings from AWS are infrastructure as a service offerings, but it also offers PaaS service such as Elastic Benstock and Lambda which are popular and highly used services. AWS offers you all the necessary tools you would need to set up your IT infrastructure without paying any upfront. For example, Netflix. The world's biggest premium video streaming service is completely hosted on AWS for its application needs. The world's largest e-commerce company Amazon is also hosted on the AWS infrastructure itself. When you see such big players in the respective fields rely on AWS for their infrastructure needs, you as an individual user can trust and be inclined towards AWS for your cloud needs. AWS offers a wide range of services that can be categorized into the following. We have compute and network services, storage and content delivery services, security and identity services, database services, analytic services, application services and management tools. Now we have few applications of AWS. What are they? Let's look into it. The first one we have is storage and backup. That's Amazon's cloud storage is an easily accessible and useful services for business. Next we have enterprise IT. That's Amazon cloud services offer the ideal solution to enterprise IT's time consuming pace. Mobile, web and social applications. AWS can launch and scale various applications like mobile applications and SaaS applications. Big Data AWS and Big Data work well with each other to come up with the power and infrastructure necessary to meet the needs of high-end intelligent software. Websites can be hosted on AWS Cloud. It is also good for hosting CDNs and DNS and domains. In gaming, AWS makes gaming applications easily available to the worldwide gaming network and provides gamers the best experience in online gaming across the globe. Now how much salary does an AWS engineer earns? In India, it earns on an average basis 7 to 13 lakhs per annum, while in USA on an average basis, he or she can earn $137,000. The reason why Amazon is so huge is because of AWS along with its retail arm. The cloud service has a very high revenue and is growing rapidly. Now did you know that AWS IaaS Cloud is 10 times greater than the 14 competitors of AWS combined? Now this speaks volumes about the strong capabilities that this service possesses. Just a quick info for all of you cloud enthusiasts. If you want to make a career in AWS, then you might want to check out IntelliPath's AWS Certification Training Course for Solution Architect. Learn from industry experts through hands-on session, projects and case study. Reach us out to know more. Hey folks, welcome to this session. In this session, we will be looking into the pricing of our instances and EBS. So if we will uh, look into the pricing of EC2, then uh, if you are using, uh, if you are under that free tier eligible criteria, then you get uh, 750 R per usage of your EC2 machine. And uh, let us say if you are uh, not using that and uh, if you are not using T2.micro, but if you are using other instance, instance types, let us say M5.large, for that you have to uh, pay uh, 
0.096 dollar per hour similarly uh, apart from d2 dot micro whatever things you are going to use you are going to pay for that let us say if your particular machine is getting any data transfer in so uh, it will be free but let us say if you are sending the data from your ec2 machine to uh, services like s3 glacier dynamo db uh, simple queue service simple email service in the same region if those are available in the same region then it is entirely free but let us say if uh, those things are uh, in the different region if your machine is uh, in a different region and the services to whom you are sending it if those are in different region so you will be uh, basically uh, paying for uh, that let us say if you are using elastic ip then also you will be uh, paying for the thing uh, apart from that uh, depending uh, upon whether you are in same as you or not you will be also paying for it and let us see if you are using any resource so as per the uh, service level agreement which this is the agreement that has been done by the service provider and the client all of the resources will be available for 99.99 time now uh, if we will move in and uh, if we will uh, look into the pricing of on demand uh, let us say if you are using a particular instance type that is m5 dot x large then you can see for using it per you have to pay 0 0.192 dollar but let us say if you move into the reserve instance for one to three year term pricing then you will be able to save a lot of a lot of your cost if you are using the reserve instance because you will be reserving the things uh, early and if you are uh, reserving the things early then you can uh, save enormously so that is what uh, we are having in the reserved instance so now let us say if you are using the evs then uh, for the you will be definitely getting a particular free tier uh, a particular amount of data free you can see uh, it that you are going to have 30 gb per month uh, of free EBS data accessibility with a combination of GP2 and magnetic with uh, some uh, input output operations and with some snapshots uh, but uh, let us say if you are uh, not under the free tier and let us say if you are using this GP2 provision IOPS uh, or you can say throughput optimized then you will be paying for that if you create the snapshot then also you will be paying for it if you are not under that free tier eligible criteria and let us say if you have used the EBS uh, and if you have stored the data for uh, more than you can say 30 GB then also you will be paying it and as per the uh, service level agreement the EBS will be also available for 99.99 times. So in this pricing we are having all this see you up in the next session. Hey folks welcome to this session in this session we will be discussing about public IP and elastic IP. So what exactly is a public IP? So let us say if you have launched an instance and it is in the public subnet, then you are going to get the public IP. This public IP is not associated with your account, but let us say if you are using an elastic IP, then that particular elastic IP is going to be associated with your particular account. Now comes the thing that if you are using public IP, then it can be basically get freed once you uh, stop your instances. Let us say if you are having a particular IP and uh, it is associated with your particular instance, you stop your instance, it get freed up. And once it is free, it can be used by other. But let us say if you have associated a particular elastic IP with your instance, till the time you don't free it, it will not get free. So, if you are using in elastic IP as it is being available to you every time till the time you don't release it, so it is also chargeable, but the public IP is not chargeable. So now let us try to understand why exactly are we in need of, of elastic IP. Let us say if there is a particular company AWS and uh, they have a domain AWS.com. Let us say if they are having a particular public uh, sorry elastic IP they can basically map their domain name to that particular public uh, to that elastic IP. So whenever someone will type aws.com or even if let us say if they 
in the future changes their domain name to something else let us say to aws.com to aws.tk if they are having that elastic ip they can map n number of domain name to that particular elastic ip and all of the traffic will be then redirected to the particular website they want but let us say if you are using the public ip every time they uh, stop their instance of or you can say if their particular website does not function properly so public ip can get lost then the uh, direction of the particular traffic can be can go to anywhere and they will not be able to properly manage it so if you are having a particular elastic ip associated with your particular domain name so you can uh, map n number of domain names to the particular architecture you want so uh, that is what public ip do and your elastic ip uh, do now if we will uh, move forward and if we will see here now let us see what exactly is an elastic network interface it doesn't matter whether it is your physical machine or your virtual machine you will be having an uh, elastic network interface so basically let us say this is the particular first point of interaction of your machine to the internet if you are trying to uh, get the internet or you can say if you are trying to make the connection then the from your particular machine the first point of connection will be done through the network interface card only your network interface contain elastic ip public ip private ip and the security group of your machine we have already discussed what is elastic ip a particular elastic ip which is static it uh, does not get released till the time you don't release it public ip is attached with your machine if you stop your machines then it will uh, going to get free and it is going to be allocated to someone else private ip is the internal ip of your particular machine and what are security groups security groups are nothing but the virtual firewall that is being present in your machine in this session we are having all this see you up in the next session hey folks welcome to the session in this session we will be looking into instance tenancy and then we will try to figure out what exactly is the difference in between reserved instances and spot instances so if we will uh, look into the term tenancy then what basically that mean that basically determine who is the owner of the particular resource let us say if you are having a house then it might happen that you are the owner of that particular house so that is what happen in instance tenancy we try to figure it out that who exactly is the owner of a particular instance if we will uh, look into this scenario which is known as shared or default instances then we can see that uh, there are a lot of ec2 machines running and uh, those ec2 machines are running upon our underlying hardware and uh, it is also having zen hypervisor because aws uses zen hypervisor so that one particular underlying hardware is being used by lot of customers so that is what you can say is the default or you can say shared tenancy uh, or you can say shared instances where there is one hardware and the users are uh, more than one who are using that hardware now if we will uh, go into the dedicated instance what will happen there will be only one customer who will be using the underlying hardware so that is the difference in between shared and dedicated instance so in one you are having lot of users using uh, underlying resources and in one you are the uh, or you can say there is only one particular customer using that particular instance now let's move and try to understand what exactly is reserved and spot instances but before that we have to understand what is this placement group so let us say uh, you launch an ec2 instance then your ec2 instance is uh, spread upon the underlying hardware in such a manner that the failures of that uh, ec2 instance can be minimized and for that minimization placement groups plays a very bigger role how because uh, placement group uh, will look upon the workload then uh, it will do the placement in such a manner that your instance will be able to meet the workload that is being distributed so that is what your placement group does it will look into the underlying hardware it will look upon the particular workloads that are being employed and after that it will do the uh, particular you can say uh, it will place your instances in that manner so we we also have the cross uh, platform placement group 
so there what will happen let us say if we are uh, having a particular uh, storage option that is being shared then it has to be shared in such a manner that it is available to every of the particular availability zones or to the regions and it should be available for majority period of time it should not go down so that thing also our placement group ensures now let's try to understand what exactly is a reserved and spot instance so basically reserved instance uh, you can say is a type of a contract in which uh, you uh, buy out or you uh, pre book your instances let us say right now your organization is using two instances and you have figured out that uh, in the near future you are going to uh, need a more number of instances so basically you can pre book your instances and till the contract uh, expire those particular instances will be available to you okay either you can use it or you may not use it but it will be available to you now the thing comes is that what is the uh, benefit if i am uh, having a particular instance reserved then let us say if you need a particular instance right now and you go and buy it out then the charges that you will be uh, bearing will be uh, more as compared to the reserved instance if you reserved a particular instance then you can get the instances for much uh, discounted rates now you can uh, look into the instances sizes and the uh, normalization factor here and we uh, we will be uh, able to figure it out if you will uh, go and if you will uh, go for the reserved instances then you will be uh, able to figure it out that uh, if we go for reserved instances then we are able to save our cost enormously so you can uh, also think in such a manner that uh, if you are uh, using a particular instance let us say if you are uh, uh, using a, a you can say previous version of a machine right now and if you pre book a particular instance then you can uh, even get the advanced uh, version of that particular machine in far more cheaper rate than whatever you are using so that is basically uh, the benefit of using the reserved instances until the time the contract ends the uh, particular period and uh, your instances will be available to you so now if we will uh, look into the spot instances uh, what exactly is this spot instance um, let us say if there is an any unused ec2 instance uh, so you can uh, avail those instance in cheaper rate you can basically bid for that and uh, if the instance price uh, there uh, during your bid price then you will be able to get it but let us say uh, if the spot prices increases then the instances uh, will be terminated and you will uh, not uh, be able to get the instances so the benefit that you also get here in this spot instance is reserving uh, you can say you are able to save up your cost so that is the uh, major benefit so you can use so basically uh, you can think spot instances are those ec2 instances available to you for uh, cheaper rates which are uh, less than uh, those instances if you will go and buy which are on demand prices so you can get the ec2 instances uh, below the on demand prices so that is what we are having in spot instances so after this we will be looking into the pricing part so meet you up in the next session hey folks welcome to the session in this session we will be looking into amazon fsx so amazon fsx is easy and cost effective to launch run and scale feature rich high performance file system in cloud so basically fsx is uh, like a file system that is being available to us it make uses of uh, ssd storage to provide fast performance with low latency but it can also make use of hdd now if we will look into the use cases of uh, fsx then uh, we will be able to note that uh, it supports wide range of workload with its reliability security scalability and broad set of capabilities aws fsx is built on latest aws compute network and disk technology which is fully managed service and apart from that uh, it is compatible with a lot of the services that is being available like amazon ec2 instances of amazon workspace let us say if you are having an fsx then you can simply mount it upon the uh, windows or upon uh, the other amazon linux machine that you 
wanted to have being a file system you can think that it is an modified version of the efs now basically uh, right now amazon fsx uh, is being provided with uh, four different types one is for amazon fsx for windows file server one is amazon fsx for lustre apart from that we are having also other two that is uh, natap on tap and uh, your particular open z f s so these options are also available but we will be majorly looking into the windows and the lustre so uh, apart from this uh, one thing that is far more uh, uh, you can go with surety is that it will be highly available 99.99 .99 times it will be available to you it is simple and uh, fully managed so if it is fully managed so you need not to be uh, worry about the things like its availability and all so aws will be taking care of all of those things and uh, you whatever resources or whatever up to storage you will be using let us say if there is a particular storage limit that you are using let us say for 5 tv for that only you are going to pay and the easy integration of fsx with the other services like ec2 and all makes it even it more lucrative uh, service to be used so you can uh, just go on with that uh, amazon fsx is a modified version of the efs it has better feature as compared to the uh, efs that is being available to us in the next session we will be looking into the features of fsx hey folks welcome to the session in this session we will be discussing about features of fsx so if we will see to the first feature of fsx we can see that dfs uh, basically distributed file system namespace allows you to group files here from multiple file system into a single common folder structure a namespace from which you can access the entire file data set now what exactly does it tell us let us say if you are having an dfs basically it will allow users or application to access data files such as pdf image word document or other types of uh, data files from shared storage across any one of the network server so let us say if we are able to access the thing how will we be able to access the thing basically there will be a single folder and upon that single folder we will be able to access all of the now if we will uh, look into the other feature that is using windows uh, robust file copy to copy your files uh, directly to the amazon fsx so what basically is happening in this let us say in your machine you are having some data and you want it to be uploaded into uh, somewhere where it will be safe and your machine uh, data space will be free so then you can use this particular option so fsx provide you with this option now if we will look into the other features of fsx then it uh, actually includes as fsx uh, works with uh, the microsoft uh, active directory to integrate with the existing microsoft windows environment so let us say if you are using the active directory then what will happen then uh, the microsoft uh, directory service will use it to store the information about object or the network so it can be very useful for the administrator or for the user now apart from that if you will look into the feature of uh, fsx then as with every aws service uh, encryption will be provided to you apart from that kms is also provided to you basically key management service so you can even encrypt the data and even you can put the key upon that and apart from that uh, amazon fsx follows the iso pci ds and soc standards so basically you can think that whatever things are being rolling out it is in acknowledgement to the current uh, versions that is being specified so we are having all this in the feature of fsx see you up in the next video hey folks welcome to the session in this session we will be discussing about amazon fsx for last so fsx for lustre make it uh, very easy to launch and run the world's most popular file system so if we will look into the uh, amazon fsx for windows file server there 
If you want to use it, then you need to be available with uh, Microsoft Active Directory and you have to use that and along with that Amazon FSx for Windows file system you have to use then only you will be able to use it once you integrate this three thing with your uh, machine but if you will compare it with the Lustre then it is far more easier to work with Lustre file system is an open source and parallel file system that support many requirement of leadership class HPC simulation environment. Now, if we will look into the HPC simulation environment, what exactly the things are happening? HPC basically is high performance computing. Let us say uh, we can use it for incredibly computational uh, intensive tasks like quantum mechanics, glass uh, exploration and forecasting. So there, wherever we need better HPC simulation, there we can uh, use the FSX for Lustre for storing our files. We will look more into it in our uh, use cases. Now if we will look into the feature of Amazon FSX for Lustre, uh, whatever features we are having in Microsoft uh, uh, file system, we will be having all those things but few add-ons will be there. What are those things? First of all, we will have a seamless integration with our Amazon S3 data. So what is the major benefit if we are able to integrate it with our S3? Let us say if our data is present in the S3, then we can track our data much more properly. We will be having our uh, buckets uh, so we can uh, even give the policies as per our need and we can make our uh, file system much more secure. We will be able to uh, make our luster much more secure by because every AWS uh, service uh, provide us with the encryption so we can make our luster even more secure and our s3 policies we can make and uh, we can even make our s3 more uh, safer now uh, it is one of the world's uh, best and high performance file system that is being available to us you can also access the luster from the on premises so just like the other uh, file systems uh, if you will see it is simple and fully managed data accessible to other AWS services also. So the integration of uh, Amazon FSx for Lustre uh, has with other services also and multiple deployment options also you get when you will be using Lustre. So uh, as we are able to integrate it with the S3 then it makes the processing of our data far more easier. We can uh, have the data in our S3, we can go through it and if we want uh, to use it then also we can use it. Uh, let us see if there is a particular data which was present in our uh, Lustre then we have moved the data from Lustre to the S3. From the S3 we can load that data into our Redshift and then we can start using it. So basically it makes accessibility to the data far more easier and whatever operations we want to perform we can also perform that very well. Now if we will look into the use cases, uh, machine learning uh, uses massive amount of training data. So we can basically store all those data in our Lustre. And uh, also machine learning is changing the experience of the HPC simulation. Because if you will uh, go for forecasting or for gas exploration, everywhere machine learning is being used. So if uh, we are able to integrate the machine learning with our Lustre file system, then it can uh, provide us with uh, enormous uh, results. And let us see if you want to do any media processing like rendering of a video, visual effects. There also, the data that is being created, you can simply put it there to your uh, FSX uh, for the Lustre. From there, you can have it into the, your S3 and you can do whatever you want to do. So that is the major benefit of the FSX for Lustre. It is very much simple as compared to the other or, uh, Amazon FSX that have been present. So that's all we are having in this video. See you up in the next video. Hey folks, welcome to the session. In this session, we'll be discussing about Amazon FSx for Windows File Server. So, if you are using Amazon FSx for Windows File Server, uh, then whatever Microsoft products are there, all of them will be compatible with the uh, Windows File Server of FSx. So, let us see if you want to move any Windows-based app to this shared storage you can do it with ease. Apart from that if you are using FSx for Windows file server 
then we will uh, get full support from SMB protocol, Windows NTFS and Microsoft Active Directory. So now comes what exactly is an SMB protocol. So it is a service uh, server message block protocol. It is a network uh, file sharing protocol. So we'll get the support from a network file sharing protocol. And we will also get the support from Windows NTFS. So actually NTFS uh, is a new technology file system. This is a primary file uh, system for the recent version of Windows and Windows Server. Let us say if any a new version of Windows has been rolled out, then we can uh, will be able to use all of those features if we are using the FSX for Windows File Server. And apart from that, we can also use uh, Microsoft Active Directory for the integration purpose. And FSX use SSD for the first performance. Now, if you look into the features of AWS FSX for Windows File Server, then one thing uh, that we are very sure about is the compatibility of the Windows. But uh, the uh, Windows versions need to be uh, either 7 or above it. We can even access our Windows FSX from uh, other EC2 machines like Windows EC2 machines from Workspace or even VMware Cloud on AWS. It is even fully managed by the AWS. So let us say if any hardware patching needed to be done, uh, then all of those things is going to be taken care of by the AWS or the Microsoft because it has the integration directly with the uh, Windows. So we will uh, be very much carefree and it uses SSD for the fast performance, but it can even use HDD if required. Now, if we will look into the use case, uh, when exactly will we be using it? Let us say if there is a particular Windows based application or a workload uh, that is being running and uh, it needed to have a shared file storage. It is in requirement uh, of having a shared file storage for storing its data, then we can use it. Apart from that, uh, let us say if any development environment uh, is working upon and they want to recite their codes or build repositories so that that particular code will be available to each and everyone present in the development team or if they are working upon an application and that application needed to be available to each and everyone so that they can fix the bug, they can find out what error is it giving us or what is the particular performance level they want to judge. So they need the accessibility of that particular application or of that particular code repositories. So then we can definitely use um, FSX for Windows File Server and using that we can even transfer the things to them. Now if you will see that how does uh, FSX for Windows File Server work? First of all, we have to uh, have a particular directory available to us. Once we have the directory, we can then start integrating our particular uh, FSX with that directory. And once we do that, then we can our configure our file, then we can connect that FSX to our machine. And if any particular application is running, and if it uh, wanted to use any storage options, then we can uh, basically integrate that application uh, with our machine having the FSX or we can even integrate the application with the FSX and then they can start using the things. Now, if we will look into Amazon FSX for Windows File Server, supported client and access method and environment. So uh, if you look into the client space, then we can use the Amazon EC2 instances. Here we can use either Ubuntu or we can use directly Windows. Um, AMI if we want. Apart from that also we get a lot of other options. Now how exactly are we going to access it? We can access it using the DNS name. DNS name provided in our active directory or using the distributed file system namespace that we have already discussed and the environment uh, needed to be either an on-premise environment. If you want it, you can do it or from an AWS account, you can also access the thing. So in this session, we are having uh, this much. Now let us discuss about the failovers. Uh, we have uh, basically discussed till uh, yet in this session about the Windows file server. Now uh, we will lo look more into the failover processes that how exactly is the failover process work. So let us say if we have enabled uh, multi AZ, then the failover will start automatically. So uh, and when exactly are the conditions when it will start, let us say if there is a particular availability zone and it has gone down, then it will start uh, preferred uh, file server needed to be available, but it is not there. Or uh, let us say if any maintenance start happening at the background, then the failover process will start automatically. And uh, what exactly happens in the failover if you will look uh, then uh, let us say 
whatever things uh, we are able to access if it has gone down then uh, we will start uh, requesting for that uh, we will do the read and write request for whatever data we are having in our file system and they will uh, be st again start rolling the things back uh, then uh, once all of the resources are available in the particular subnet or you can say in the particular place where we want then the fsx automatically goes back to the preferred preferred file server and how much time will it takes uh, for it uh, it takes around 30 seconds from when it detected a file server so uh, within the uh, very small span of time it will do a lot of work so we, we have discussed uh, till yet about the amazon fsx for windows file server in the next session we'll be discussing about amazon fsx for lustra hey folks welcome to the session in this session we will be looking into amazon fsx pricing First of all, we will look for Windows file server. Now, if let us say we are in the region North Virginia. So the type of storage options that we are going to have is SSD storage capacity, HDD storage capacity, throughput storage capacity and backup storage capacity. Now, depending upon the single AZ deployment or a multiple AZ deployment, we are going to get the pricing for that. Let us say if I am using SSD storage capacity and I want to have a single AZ deployment, then I have to pay $0.130 per GB per month. But if I choose with the same storage option multiple AZ deployment, then I will be paying $0.230 per GB per month. Similarly, we will be having other storage options available. Now let us move into a problem statement and try to understand the things. So here if I will move it, we can see the problem statement is there. Assume you want, we want to store 10 TB of general purpose file share data using HDD storage in the US East North Virginia. Based upon the typical uh, duplications, saving of 50 to 60 percent, we provision 5 TB multiple AZ file with 16 Mbps of throughput capacity. Also assume that we have an average uh, backup storage of 5 TB during the month. So upon this 10 TB, we are going to segregate it into 5 and 5 TB. So if we will look in uh, to the very first statement, here we are using HDD storage capacity and it is if we will uh, look in, it is for uh, multi-AZ. So if we will uh, go back here and if we will see here, in the HDD uh, storage capacity for multi-AZ, uh, we have to pay 0 0.025 per GB per month. Now if we will move in, we can see that 5 TB is going to get multiplied with 0 0.025 because we are using HDD. So from that, we will be able to calculate what exactly we are going to uh, get billed for for the storage. Now if we will uh, look into the uh, throughput then 16 Mbps of throughput we are using. Now if we will uh, go back so we can see the throughput capacity for multi AZ is uh, 4.5 dollar per Mbps per month. So here we have done that same thing 16 Mbps into uh, 4.5 dollar per mbps uh, per month so it is going to be 72 dollar per month now we are taking a backup of 5 tb now if i will uh, go back here we can see uh, whether it is single az or multiple az uh, the price is gonna same it is 0 0.050 dollar per gb per month so upon that we will do the calculation and once we do the uh, calculation we will be getting the total monthly charge that is going to be 456 dollar so this is how you can do the uh, particular uh, pricing of your windows file server now let's look for the lustra now here if we will uh, look for the lustra then uh, we are having uh, different storage options that is being available to us either we can choose the scratch or we can choose the persistent now upon that uh, upon the particular mbps tib baseline we will be uh, going to get build. Let us say if I am using the scratch. So for 200 MB uh, per second uh, per TIB baseline up to 
GB per second per TIB burst, I am going to get build 0 0.14 dollar. Now, if I'll move in and if I'll see the problem statement, then what it is telling me? Assume we have a scratch file system. So basically, we are using this scratch storage option in the US East North Virginia region, which has been provisioned with four. Uh, 4800 uh, GB of storage capacity. We spin up our file system for 8 hours workload every day and then shut it down. We do this uh, for the 30 days. Now, if I will uh, move back in and I can see that for scratch, uh, what is the price that I am going to pay? It is 0 0.14 dollar per GB per month. But here uh, the calculation that uh, we are going to have is 8 hours. So I, first of all, I have to find that for 1 hour, how much exactly is I am paying. So how can I find it? Uh, if it is for per month, I will divide it by 30. And after that, I am going to divide it by 24 so that I will be getting for per hour, how much exactly is it costing me. So I got the things and once I get uh, how much it is costing me, I will then uh, multiply it with the 400 GB of storage capacity upon 8 hours because I am going to run it for 8 hours and for 30 days and whatever is the cost and that is going to be the cost for my lustra. So basically this is how you can uh, do the calculation upon the things. In this session we are having all this. See you up in the next session. Hey folks, so welcome to the session. In this session we will look into uh, launching an EC2 instance. In this session, we will be launching an Ubuntu type instance. So, I have already logged in into my AWS management console. Now, from here, I will go into EC2. So, EC2 is, uh, is a particular service that is being available to us and in this service, I am going to use this instance resource. So, basically, this instance is nothing but a virtual machine. So, if I want to work uh, with anything, let us say if I want to work with my website, then I need a virtual machine available with me, then only I will be able to work. So, what I will do, I will go into instance and right now, I do not have any instance running. So, I will create an instance of mine. I will click on this uh, launch instance. At the very beginning, I have to specify the name. Uh, let me give it a name, let us say Shub. After uh, this, what I will do, I have to choose an AMI. So, before moving forward, we need to understand what exactly is this an AMI is. So, uh, basically, this AMI is uh, nothing but a type of an ISO file. You can think like that or you can think like uh, it as a, like an operating system that you are choosing for your machines. I get different types of operating system. I can choose Amazon Linux, I can choose Mac OS, I can choose Ubuntu or I can even choose Windows. But in this session, I will be choosing Ubuntu. This AMI uh, contains uh, every information that we require for launching an instance. Just like let us say if you are having a physical system, there you have operating system. It can be either Windows or it can be upon Mac OS. So similarly, when we will be launching our virtual machine, we also have to specify the type of uh, particular virtual machine uh, operating system we want. And here I will be choosing Ubuntu. After this, I'll move forward. I will uh, not do any changes to here and make sure to choose uh, the type of uh, AMI which are having this free tier eligible criteria only or else you might get charged. So, if I will choose of Ubuntu, you can see in Ubuntu, I am having this as free tier eligible. This type of architecture is also having a free tier eligible. If I will move to the end, I am also having uh, Ubuntu server 1804 LTS as also uh, my free tier eligible. Similarly, if I would have chosen Amazon Linux, so here also I might be getting two or three different types of free tier eligible. So, if you are choosing any of those, make sure to choose a free tier eligible only or else you might get built. Yeah, so, let me show you. Yes. So, here it is. You can choose only the free tier. You can definitely choose other one, but uh, it's better to go with the free tier eligible or else you might get charged. After this, uh, Similarly, just like we have architectures here also in the virtual machines, uh, the architecture comes up. We will not do any changes here. 
now we will come into an instance type now before uh, selecting an instance type we need to understand what exactly is an instance type so instance type is nothing but a combination of you can say cpu memory storage and networking capacity okay so let us say if you are having a virtual server so there let us say if you are working on a windows operating system so apart from operating system uh, you have a lot of different things uh, that is being you can say fixed in your machines like the type of processors you go like you can have i5 i7 processor you can have some generations based upon that so similarly instance type will do that work uh, if you are choosing a particular instance type you can get different types of uh, virtual cpus you will be getting different types of memories and depending upon your need you can choose in this uh, demo session we will be choosing t2.micro why because it is comes under free tier eligible criteria apart from this you don't get uh, any other instance type having free tier eligible criteria after this uh, what i'll do i will have to make a key pair so now uh, let us understand what is an key pair basically key pair is a type of a security credentials that you get uh, let us say if you are creating a uh, instance then you have to specify this key pair only if you have this key pair then only you will be able to log in into your instance or else you will not be able to do uh, the type of uh, key pair let us say if i will move into here create a new key pair if i will move here then you can uh, see i have to type a particular key pair name so uh, let me write a name let us say shub i am working in north virginia so i'll specify that uh, north virginia demo key what okay so uh, this is the name of my key pair here also you, you can see the thing you will need it later to connect to instance so whenever you will try to uh, connect to your instance you need this key pair and the key type that i will have is uh, rsa and the particular uh, format of my private key file will be dot pem okay and this uh, ppk is for patti when we will be working with patti we will see how to convert this pem into patti so the this key pair that i am creating right now is the private key okay and there are two types of key that i'll be having one is public and one is private i will be having this private key with me and the particular public key will be there with aws and it will resides in my machine whenever i will try to connect to my machine then aws will check whether my private key is matching with my public key or not if everything goes well and fine then only i'll be able to connect it after this i will click on create key pair so right now uh, this particular pem file has been downloaded after this what i'll do i will uh, move into this i'll move into network settings for the time being i will not do any changes here but yes uh, in the security group what i will do i'll move here and in the type i will keep it all traffic so why exactly i am keeping all traffic because uh, now you need to understand if i am having all traffic that means i am allowing connection of my machine through any port and uh, it will be able to connect from anywhere okay so uh, for the timing you can choose this once we will move forward then you will be able to understand much more better that why uh, exactly the security groups are having different types of port but for the timing you can uh, just keep in mind that security groups are nothing but they act like a virtual firewall for your machine so here i am specifying okay through whatever ports i want my machine to get connected it can get connect after this what i'll do i'll go down i'll not do any changes here is the summary of the thing if you want you can review it and after reviewing the things you can simply click on launch instance and it will uh, get launched yeah so now it has got launched if i'll click on view all instance then you can see uh, right now it will be in pending state and after some time it will be available so the connection of the thing we will see in the another session till then thank you hey folks uh, welcome to this session in this session we will look in how to connect our ec2 instance uh, using directly from the aws management console and we will also look in how to connect our ec2 instance from a patti so uh, let us start uh, right now uh, in the previous session we have already launched an instance uh, at that time the instance state was not in available but now it is uh, running you can see moreover uh, this status checks has also been passed it will take some time 
for that you can wait for that and once it is passed now we can move forward so after launching the instance you can see a lot of uh, information that is being available to you like the public ip the private ip and the instance id is also being provided to you moreover whatever vpc it is in those things will be also visible to you the instance type that we have chosen there will be also now visible to you the vpc id and everything you can see after this uh, the security group if you will uh, move in you can see that this was the security group which we have chosen launch wizard 13 here we have allowed all traffic so that is also now available similarly you can choose each and everything uh, available here so let us see how exactly to connect this ec2 instance so simply i will uh, choose my instance after choosing it i will go into connect and here i will be getting a uh, four different types of options but i will be choosing ec2 instance connect after that i will click on connect now uh, the things will be now connected yeah so now i have successfully connected it and uh, now after connecting the very first step that you should be doing after connecting your machine is updating it how to update it you can type a particular command sudo apt get update and uh, this will particularly update your machine uh, just like in your virtual um, in your physical machines you do refresh once you start a new session similarly uh, we will be updating our machine uh, what is the significance uh, of this step let us say uh, if you are having a physical machine so why do we exactly uh, refresh our machine so that if any port or if any terminal is busy in some work and if the efficacy of our machine is not that much uh, if we want to uh, restore that efficacy or efficiency we can use that similarly if i want my machines to be available if any updates are being there it should be updated if any port is uh, not working properly if all the connections I want to have properly, then I can use this command sudo apt get update. The significance of this particular thing sudo is that uh, let us say if I am using a particular software, there are two options. Either you can straight away open it and start using it or there is an, another option of uh, run as an administrator. So why uh, do we get the option of run as an administrator while working with any of our uh, software because there are certain privileges those are being reserved only for the administrator similarly if i will try to update the machine without this sudo it will tell me okay you don't have the permissions to do that that's why i will type here sudo so that i will specify to my machine that okay i am a super user do basically i am an administrator and i should get uh, the particular you can say facility to update my machine and uh, to update it uh, the package from where i will be updating it okay the thing from which i will get the update is being residing upon here apt get update after this what i'll do i'll hit enter so it will update my machine okay. so now my machine is being updated now let us see how to connect our machine using putty basically putty is a third party uh, software uh, that you get Okay. so if you want to use putty then you have to download putty once you will download putty uh, with that uh, putty gen by default will come so what i'll do first i will show you uh, what exactly will putty gen do uh, this is putty gen okay you have to download this thing putty you have to download from it from the web browser you can download it and once you download it uh, then you have to uh, basically uh, put your pem file here if you people uh, might be remembering the particular type of file that we have chosen for our machine is a dot pem file okay this one will be having a dot pem uh, file extension at the end when we have downloaded it but if you want to work with your putty then we need to have a dot ppk file because ppk stands for putty private key file so my pem file uh, i have to convert it into dot ppk file and once I convert it, then only I'll be able to use it. So what I have to do, I, I will go to my partition. After moving into partition, I'll click on load. And once I will uh, click on uh, load, I will uh, go into downloads. And here I will do it all files. So once I'll do it all files, I will be able to see the .pem file that I have created. I'll click on open. After this a pop up will happen. I'll click on OK. And here what I'll do, I'll click on a save private key after this it will ask again a pop-up will happen 
I'll click on yes and after this I have to uh, save it okay the particular name that I have given for that uh, the same one I'll keep it and uh, the only thing uh, that I will change here is I will uh, not have a dot pem here because I need a particular ppk file yeah, so it is here after this I'll click it uh, save and it has now got saved okay so after this what I'll do I'll open my putty so this is the uh, putty that I need to open so after opening putty what I need to give I need to give the public IP of my machine so I will take the public IP of my machine I will select my machine after selecting it I will take the public IP of my machine after that I will paste it here and after pasting it I will move into SSH from here I will move into authorization and from here I will browse in and I will be able to see it make it all files ok let me check in uh, where exactly it is oh, so here it is so I will choose it I will click on open and after this I will click on open so I will be getting this pop up and that means that everything is successfully done so I will then click on accept after this I will type here Ubuntu as uh, my login why I am typing here Ubuntu uh, it is because uh, the type of machine that I have chosen here is Ubuntu and if you want to know how to see the username you can go into connect and here you will be able to find the username that is Ubuntu so after this I will uh, hit enter and I have successfully uh, logged in into my Ubuntu if you want uh, we have already updated our machine uh, so if you are uh, getting into the putty and this is the first time you are get, trying to log in into your instance then you should update it then the same command you have to paste here sudo apt get update after that you have to hit enter so it will update our machine the small updation has only come because uh, we have already done the updation earlier so in this session we are having all this much see you in the next session till then thank you just a quick info for all of you cloud enthusiasts if you want to make a career in AWS, then you might want to check out IntelliPath's AWS Certification Training Course for Solution Architect. Learn from industry experts through hands-on session, projects and case study. Reach us out to know more. Hey folks, uh, welcome to this session. In this session, we will be looking into launching an EC2 instance of Windows type. So I am currently in, I have logged in into my AWS management console and now I will be moving into resources of instance. So um, here I will uh, create an entirely a new uh, instance. So I will first move into launch an instance. After uh, moving into launch an instance, I uh, will be specifying a name. Let us say I am doing it for Windows. So let me choose Windows. So uh, after choosing the name here comes the important uh, aspect that we need to see the AMI in this session uh, we will be going with Windows AMI and uh, what is an AMI if we will look uh, AMI is nothing but uh, it is a type of an operating system uh, that you choose for your machine AMI also contain every information that you require for launching an instance similarly uh, this is because an virtual server so we are choosing the AMI uh, if it would have been a physical server that you people or me will be working upon we can also have the same type of operating system that you want either you can go with Mac OS Windows or whatever you like so here I am choosing Windows after that I will keep it under the free tier eligible criteria only or else I might get built so I will not do any changes here I want the latest version to be uh, enabled so I will go with whatever default setting it is be now after this the instance type I will be choosing t2.micro only because this is the only instance type which is uh, available under free tier eligible criteria and what is an instance type instance type is basically a combination of CPU storage and uh, other lot of things uh, let us say if you are having a virtual machine and if you are uh, purchasing a sorry if you are purchasing a physical machine having an windows operating system after that you see a lot of specification what are those specification it can have i5 or i7 processor it can be a 9th gen or a 7th gen uh, operating and operating system enabled machine 
similarly uh, if you want to have a lot of different types of virtual cpus memories that thing you can choose using the instance type but currently we'll be working on with t2 dot micro because it is present under free tier eligible criteria after this uh, we will be uh, looking into key pairs uh, what is an key pair basically uh, when we will go in and create a new key pair uh, let us say well, let me give a name let us say it is windows so what basically is this key pair is uh, basically it is a private uh, key pair that is being given to me in the pam format okay so what is the significance of this key pair let us say if i am launching my machine then uh, this key pair uh, will be matched with my public key the particular key pair that i will download now will be a private key pair okay private key file it will be but whenever i will try to launch an in instance then this private key file will be checked on with a public key file so there will be two type of file one will be public one will be private the private will be with me and the public will reside with my instance so whenever i will specify this private key then it, the particular aws will check whether the private key and the public key are matching or not basically you can remember key pair is a type of a credential that has been given to us and if you want to launch an instance then you need to specify the particular key pair if you are not having a key pair you can click on simply create a key pair okay you can click on it and after this it will uh, get downloaded after this i will uh, not do any more further changes i will keep whatever uh, it is in the default setting after that i will just go down and i'll click on uh, launch instance so uh, with this uh, we are done with the our session uh, see you people in the next session hey folks uh, welcome to the session in this session we will look in that uh, how to create an ami and uh, how to uh, copy it into an another region so for doing that what i'll do i'll go into launch instance so let me launch a particular uh, machine of ubuntu type so i will name it as ubuntu after naming it as ubuntu i'll choose the ubuntu ami after choosing the ubuntu ami i will choose a key pair so uh, let me choose the key pair that i have created so here it is uh, so i'll choose it and after choosing the key pair i'll not do any other changes i don't require it so after that i will click on launch instance so now i'm going to do all instance so right now uh, it is in pending state this one so once it will be in running state then i shall be moving forward so now the thing comes is that why actually are we trying to copy an ami that is basically uh, because uh, we cannot uh, take a machine from uh, one region to another region but uh, just think let us say if i am having a machine though i cannot uh, take it it from one region this is the, i am currently working in north virginia so let us say if i want to take uh, this machine into an another region though i cannot take it but if i will be somehow able to take the operating system of this machine or you can say ami of this machine then you can say that i am able to replicate this machine into an another region so that is what the significance of ami copying will do so i will select my machine after that i will go into action here in the action i get an option of image and template i'll go into image and i will click on create image after that i will uh, give it a name uh, let me give it a name somewhat like uh, ubuntu ubuntu ami copy after that uh, if you want to give a description you can give it uh, let me give it uh, copying ami and after that uh, we need not do any other things so what i'll do i'll click on uh, create image so after uh, clicking on create image if i will now move into ami you are able to see this is the image that uh, we have just created okay so here you can see the ami name and that we have given uh, ubuntu ami copy i misspelled copy no worries in that so right now the state is pending 
can see uh, other details uh, right out there. So let me give it a name. So let me give it a name. Let us say Ubuntu copy. To copy and I'll save. Now uh, the currently this date is in pending. So I shall wait. Once it will be available, then we will look in for more things. Okay. So uh, I waited for a few minutes and now uh, the particular state is available. Okay. So once you have the AMI, uh, you can do a lot of different things. You can uh, simply uh, launch an instance if you want. But uh, before doing that, what I will do, I will try to copy the AMI. So I will click on copy AMI. The AMI name uh, will come automatically. So now you have to choose the destination region. Uh, let me choose uh, destination region of Oregon. I will choose it. And after that I will click on copy AMI. So you can see the AMI copy operation uh, for the particular AMI ID is initiated. It can take few minutes for AMI to get copied. So if now I will move into Oregon region. So you will be able to see the particular AMI that we have created there is being available here. So if I will uh, name it, let us say Ubuntu, Ubuntu AMI. So I'll save it now. I shall, uh, okay, so the state is pending right now. Uh, if, now what I can do, if I want to launch the instance from the AMI, I will be able to do it, but it will uh, not allow me because for the timing, if I'll go and if I'll start launching it, uh, it uh, will give me an error because uh, the state is currently in the pending state. Okay, the AMI state is now in pending. So now what I'll do is that I shall wait, and once the AMI will be. Uh, in the available state I shall then see. So I waited for a few minutes and now you can see that uh, it is available. So once it is available then I shall go and launch an instance from the AMI. So here uh, the very significant step that you will notice here is that uh, let us say if I am creating a particular instance let me give it a name Ubuntu. So if I will try to create an AMI this time I don't get the option of selecting any AMI because I already have an AMI that is being selected. So this is what you get when you already have an AMI. Apart from that you have to give an key pair and after giving the key pair you can simply uh, click on launch instance. So let me do the things. I think I already have a key pair in this region. So yeah, so let me select it and uh, after that what you can do can simply uh, launch an instance and the particular instance will be available to you. So if I go here and view all instance, so this particular instance is now available to me. So this is how you can copy an AMI and you can launch the instance. In this session we are having all this. So meet you up in the next session. Till then thank you. Hey folks, uh, welcome to the session. In this session we will look in how to connect our EC2 of Windows type. So I will refresh it. So you are able to see that uh, currently the instance state is running and the status check has also been got passed. So after this what I will do, I will uh, select my particular machine. After selecting it, I will go into connect. So here I have to go into RDP client. After uh, going into RDP client, uh, for connecting our machine, I need and remote desktop file. So I will click on download. So my remote uh, desktop file has now got download. What I'll do, I'll open it. So after opening it, I will uh, click on connect. But uh, before uh, connecting it, what I'll do is that I will get the password of it. So what I'll do, I'll click on get password. So if I'll click on uh, password, then it will ask me, okay, upload your private key file. So I'll click on upload and once I'll click on upload, I will uh, move into the particular location where I'm having the particular key. Uh, so this is the particular private key that I require windows.pem. So I'll select it. 
and after this I'll click on open. So this private key uh, will get uh, pasted here. After this I'll click on decrypt password. So after this if you will see I have got the password. So after this I will uh, come back to my remote desktop connection and after that I'll click on connect. So uh, it will open up uh, with all of the things that it requires and after it uh, what I have to do I have to uh, specify the password only here you can see the public DNS is already uh, taken care of and the username is administrator so if you people can see that the username is administrator and that is also being reflected so after this all I have to do is to give it the password I have copied the password uh, I will go into a remote desktop file I'll just simply paste it and after that I'll click on OK and after that it will uh, ask me for few verifications and I'll do that and once I select every yes option then I'll be able to connect into my particular Windows uh, EC2 so now it will prepare up So this is a major uh, benefit of you can say of cloud uh, here if uh, I would have taken some other thing let us say virtual box or uh, there what if I would have tried to install an operating system of Windows type then it would be consuming my resources but here uh, you can see uh, this is the major benefit that I get using cloud I am using an AWS account and upon browser I am uh, running this particular uh, you can say the operating system based upon windows this is my ec2 and here i am running my windows and after this uh, you can basically give the permissions and after this you can just move in and do whatever you want if you want to open the chrome uh, you can open it so whatever want uh, work you want to do uh, you can do it starting from here so you can open your chrome and uh, you can do whatever you want uh, there is an another way also to connect to your uh, particular rdp okay i'll show you that also so let me minimize this uh, in my system uh, if you people are using windows then you people uh, will be having a remote desktop file you can either open it this is an another way of connecting uh, to your machine you can uh, take the public dns after uh, taking the public dns you can paste it here after uh, pasting the public dns you can just simply click on connect so it will ask for the password uh, you can take the password and once you take the password you just paste it here and then you can click on ok and if you are having a uh, remote desktop file uh, if you are using windows then you will be having definitely having a remote desktop file so you can also connect it using this okay so another connection has was in progress so that's why i'm not able to do it so let me show you that also let me stop the previous connection that i am having okay, let me try it again so let me try to connect it once again I will be pasting the password again after that I will click on ok now I have successfully uh, logged in using this RDP also so these are the two ways through which you can connect uh, if anyone is using Mac OS then what they have to do they have to go to the iStore and from there they have to download the remote desktop file because in Mac OS the particular remote desktop file is not downloaded by default you have to download it and after that you have to give the public DNS name and you have to give the username after that you have to give the password and you will be able to connect it so with this uh, we are done with our session see you people in the next session Hey folks, uh, welcome to the session. In this session, we will look in how to create an EES volume and uh, how to attach it to our particular machine. So in this uh, demonstration, we will look in how to attach our EBS to our particular machine. If you will uh, see, this is an Ubuntu machine that I have already created. So after this, uh, what I will do, if I will move into storage, 
So I will be, you will be able to see uh, that uh, I am already having a particular EBS volume. So this is the root volume and uh, it doesn't matter whether it is root or not. Uh, it is uh, your EBS volume only. So this is the by default EBS volume that uh, get attached to your machine when you will be trying to create your machine. But uh, let us say if I need to attach more EBS volume then how can I do uh, so that thing we will look in. So here you can see the root device type and it is an EBS volume. So EBS volume is what EBS volume acts like a primary memory uh, to your particular machine. It will be the fast accessible memory but with that we also have a limitation in EBS that it provides you with limited uh, storage capacity only and uh, if you will uh, see another thing uh, while working with EBS is that let us say if you want to attach any of your EBS volume with your machine then you need to specify your EBS volume in the same availability zone as of your machine. So right now if you will see our machine is currently is in US East 1B. So while uh, creating an EBS I will specify my EBS volume also in the same availability zone. So for creating a EBS volume I will move into this volume sections. Here I will get an option of create volume I will click on that and after that uh, I will uh, go on to the type of size, okay, size that I want to specify. Uh, let me specify the size as 5. After that, as I already told you, the particular availability zone that I need to specify has to be the one in which my machine is there because I will be attaching my this EBS volume to that machine only. So I will select the availability zone. After selecting the availability zone, what I will do, I will go and click on create volume. So uh, right now if you will see with the available volume this is the only volume that is having 5 GIB and uh, I just created it just because I created it right now and I have not attached it to any of my machine you can see the current volume state is available. So first of all uh, let me name it let me name it as Ubuntu EBS Ubuntu EBS I will do that and I will save it. So after uh, doing that what I will do, I will attach this EBS volume to my machine. So I will go into action and here I will get an option of attach volume. So I will click on attach volume and here if I will type, I will uh, get the particular machine name that I want to attach with. So I will select Ubuntu and once I select the Ubuntu a uh, particular device name will come up that is dev slash sd app. Okay and after that what I will do. I will click on attach volume. So right now if I will go in here you can see this is currently in use. So the same thing uh, will also be reflected in my instance if I will move back to here and if I will select my machine and if I will uh, go into storage earlier I was just having one uh, volume but now I have two volume. This is the particular volume having the 5 GIB is the volume that I have recently attached it. So after attaching my volume I have a lot of other things to do. Uh, what is that? Uh, I have to uh, properly format it because uh, EBS is a raw and unformatted uh, storage type. So I have to format it. After formatting uh, it I have to mount it upon a particular folder then only I will be able to use the thing. So how to do that? If uh, I will select my machine after that I will go on to connect. I will move into EC2 instance connect. After moving that, I will click on connect. So after connecting, uh, the very first uh, step that I will be performing here is sudo updating it. Okay, sudo, I will type for that, I will type sudo apt get update. And I will hit enter. So now uh, my machine is updated. So after updating my machine, I will type a particular command lsvlk to see the available storage options to me. So you can see this this particular under this name section, uh, I am having a particular storage that is xvde. This is nothing but your default root volume that you have attached while creating your machine. And after that, if you will see this xvde. DF is the particular uh, you can say is the pretty 
cooler EBS volume that you have attached okay and from the size also you can verify it it's 5 G so after uh, doing that what we need to see is that whether this particular volume is uh, unformatted or in format option so how to check that uh, for checking that we can do one thing first of all we will try checking the XVDA which is our root volume so by default though root volume is uh, EBS volume type but it is already in the formatted manner so how to check that for that we will type a command i minus s forward slash tab forward slash xvda so after that if i will hit enter okay so it is telling me i don't have the permission so for that what i will do i will type here after that i will hit enter so you can see it is telling something like dos mbr boot sector extended partition table so what does this signify that my particular uh, EBS volume of root volume is particularly you can say in a particular formatted manner but if I will uh, do the same uh, thing for my XVDF or my EBS volume that I have just attached if I will do the same you will see something written as data so what does this signify that signifies that our system is telling yes there is a particular uh, volume uh, that is being associated with us but I exactly don't know in what format it is available. So for that what we will be doing, we will be uh, basically making it in a particular format option. So how to do that? For that we will type a command sudo mkfs. After that we will type here minus t ext4 ext4 forward slash tab forward slash xvdf. So what does this uh, do? This is basically uh, making a particular format option. Uh, ext4 is a particular formatted uh, option that we get and we are trying to format our particular xvdf. After that I will hit enter. So now uh, you can see uh, the things like uh, allocating group tables done, creating generals done and whatever backups and all it needed to do. All the formatting it has been done. Now if I'll go back and if I'll paste the same file, uh, same command that I was using earlier. Earlier when I used the uh, same command sudo file minus s forward slash dev forward slash xvdf it was telling okay something is there but I don't exactly know in what format option is it available. Now if I will type this same particular command and if I will hit it you can see that the things uh, it is in uh, this particular things. Uh, tells us that yes now the things are been properly formatted and now we can start working upon it so after this uh, what is the step that we have to do we have to create a directory and we have to mount this volume onto that directory so how to do that for that i will type a command sudo mkdir mkdir and the particular of directory name that i will give is ebs volume that I will hit enter. So if I will do here ls command to see whether this directory is available or not, you will be able to see EBS volume is available. So once this EBS volume is available to me, what I will do now? Now I will start mounting my particular EBS volume. So how to mount it? I will type a command sudo mount. After that I have to specify the particular EBS volume that I want to mount on xvdf. After that, I will just simply write the directory name upon which I want to mount it. After that, I will hit enter. So now here, if I will do ls dlk and if I will hit enter, you can see my xvdf is now being mounted upon this EBS volume. Okay, and uh, if I would go back and if I would see here earlier, this same thing was not there, but right now it is available. So with this uh, we are able to see that yes now we are successfully able to do the things. Now the another thing that we would be looking in is that let us say if I am typing here another command df minus h uh, to see uh, exactly how much things are been available to see that okay in this xvdf though I will be it has been specified that I will be getting 5g of storage option but in exact if you want to see how much is being actually allocated to my uh, particular xvdf you can see this using this command uh, df minus h 
and it is 4.6 G only. So let us say if you uh, want to increase it, how you can do that? If you want to have the particular size that is being specified, uh, for that you can type a command size to fs. After uh, that, you can type here dev slash x d d f. Okay, and if you will hit it enter. Now you can see okay permission denied because I have not written sudo here. So let me type here sudo. If I hit enter, now uh, nothing do. The file is already long block. Okay. So whatever things it needed to do, it is already has been given. That's why it is showing me. But uh, let us say if there is some particular scenario where the things are not given, where the storage option, uh, whatever it needed to give you, is not available. If you want to make it available. Then you can use this command sudo resize to fs uh, forward slash dev forward slash xv df and you can just hit enter and you will be able to do the things. And after this, uh, the last thing that we need to see is that let us say if you want to unmount this particular EBS volume from this particular directory, how to do that? For that, you have to type another command sudo umount. Though we are unmounting, but the command will be u mount. After that, you have to specify uh, the device name, or you can say the particular volume that you want to disassociate, and after that, you can hit enter. After that, if I will uh, do here ls vlk, and if I hit enter, we will be able to see that we have successfully unmounted it. So, uh, in this demo, we are having all this. Let's meet you up in the next session. Hey folks, welcome to the session. In this session, we will look in uh, how to attach our EBS volume to our Windows machine. So I already have a Windows machine uh, running. You can see this. And uh, what now I'll do is that I will create a particular EBS volume and I will attach it. And then I will try to do uh, the mounting upon this particular machine. Okay, so before uh, creating an EBS volume, I need to check out what is the availability zone of my machine because EBS needs to be in the same availability zone as of my machine. So my machine is available in uh, US East 1B. So I'll create a volume and I will keep that uh, particular EBS volume in the same availability zone. I will go into create volume. After the, the size that I'll specify, uh, let us say it is 10. And after this, uh, let me choose an Availability zone. Let me go for US East 1B. After that, I'll click on create volume. So, uh, if you will see, this is the particular volume that I have just created. Uh, you can see the time from that also you can know, and from the volume state it is creating right now. So, I'll select it. After that, I will uh, name it. Let me name it as Windows EBS. After that, I'll click on save. So, let me check. Yeah, so now it is available. So, what I'll do now is that I'll select the EBS and I will go into action. And here I will click on attach volume. So, I will choose the instance that I want to attach with. I will choose the Windows. So, the device name will come up. And after that, I'll click on attach volume. So, successfully, I have now attached it. Now, if I'll move into my particular machine, now if I'll go into storage. Should be able to see it. Yeah, you can see this particular machine that I've just attached. After this, uh, what I'll do, I'll go into uh, connect option, go into RDP client. I will basically download the RDP for it. I'll open it. But before connecting, uh, what I need to have, I need to have the password. So I'll get the password. This is the particular, uh, you can see the file that I require windows.pem. After that, I'll click on open. So this file will get open. After that, I'll click on decrypt password. So now I will be having the password. So for that, what I'll do, I'll open the RDP uh, again. And after that, I'll click on connect. So it will ask me for the password. I will um, copy the password. After that, I'll paste the password here. After that, I will click on open. Click on yes. Okay, so now I have successfully connected into my RDP. The RDP I have I mean. So for the time being, I don't require it. Data. 
okay so i don't require uh, all those things right now so what i'll do i'll close it if you want to set up set it up this is how you should set it up i'll close it okay so what uh, i'll do is that as i have uh, successfully mounted uh, the thing now if i'll come into this pc you will be able to see this particular thing in this local disk uh, c and this is the uh, root volume that is being attached to it the uh, particular root volume having a size of 30 gb now here it is showing 29 so this is what our root volume is but uh, now i am unable to see uh, the particular volume the particular evs volume that i just mounted so what i'll do i will uh, uh, though i have attached it now i need to uh, bring it here so i can do it I, i'll search disk management i'll click on disk management so it will open up uh, first of all you can see this is the particular root ebs volume that is being available to me so now uh, and this is the another volume the particular ebs volume that i just attached so before doing anything what i'll do i'll first bring it into online So it is taking time, we shall wait. And once uh, this will be available, what I will do, I will click on new simple volume and after that uh, I need to do few steps and this particular volume will also be reflected there. So let me click on initialize disk. Click on OK. okay. So now uh, it is uh, present, OK. So now it has gone to online. So everything that I am missing. How do this? Uh, I'll go on to new simple volumes. I'll click on new simple volume, and after that, what I have to do? I have to just click on next, and uh, I'll be clicking on next. I'll not do any other changes. Yeah, I'll be doing it uh, assigning the following drive letter as D. Okay, whatever you want, you can do it. But I'm happy with D. How do this? I'll click on next. After this, I will uh, go with NTFS only. I will not do any changes. I will click on next. After this, I will click on finish. And now, uh, if I will go back here, you will be able to see the D drive is also available. So, in this session, we are having all this. Meet you up in the new session. Till then, take care. Hey folks, welcome to this session. In this session, we will look in how to create a snapshot, how to encrypt our EBS volume. So if you could see I already having a particular instance running okay it is of Ubuntu uh, type so uh, basically the AMI that I have chosen here is Ubuntu so if I will uh, select my machine and if I will go here you can see the particular platform is Ubuntu and uh, apart from that in the security group I have allowed all traffic so now uh, if I will move into storage now here you can see only one particular volume is present that is my root volume that is also of EBS type and now what I will do I will attach and I will also show you once I modify the EBS volume the same will be reflected here. So for attaching my EBS volume I need to be uh, aware of where exactly is my machine available. So you can see it is available in the availability zone us east 1c this is my machine after this what i'll do i'll go down and then i'll move into volumes so here i'll be creating a volume i'll click on create volume so volume type will be general purpose ssd this size that i'll have here will be 6 6 gib after that the availability zone that i'll be choosing here is us east 1c because my machine is available in the same availability zone and after this I will uh, encrypt my volume how to encrypt your volume you have to click on encrypt this volume once you click on that it will ask you for the KMS key if you want to have it uh, you can give a specific custom KMS key otherwise you can go with default AWS EBS KMS key also once you select it all these things will be available your KMS key description will be there 
केमिस्ट की दैट प्रोटेक्ट माई बी एस वॉल्यूम वन नो अदर की इज डिफाइंड एंड ऑल अदर पर्टिकुलर थिंग विल बी अवेलेबल टू यू ओके सो दिज आर दिंग्स दैट यू विल गेट एंड वट एग्जैक्टली इज दिस केम एस की विल डू बेसिकली इट इज अ सर्विस दैट इज बींग अवेलेबल टू यू इट इज की मैनेजमेंट सर्विस एंड वाई इज दिस सर्विस बींग क्रिएटेड सो दैट यू कैन इन अ बैटर वे कंट्रोल एंड क्रिप्टोग्राफ योर केस सो दैट यू कैन प्रोटेक्ट योर डेटा एंड वंस वी आर डन विद दैट आई विल क्लिक ऑन क्रिएट वॉल्यूम एंड नाउ माई वॉल्यूम इज बींग क्रिएटेड ओके सो दिस इज द वॉल्यूम It is right now in creating state. If I'll refresh it, you will be able to see this is available. Okay, this is the six GIB size that I have specified. So if I'll refresh it, you can see it is now available. So I will give it a name. Open to EBS. After that, I will save it. So this is how you can encrypt your particular key. You can see the particular. KMS key thing is also available to you. You can see it, and the KMS key ID is also been associated now. So after this, what we will do? You can also see the encryption thing that is being also leveled here is encrypted. So after this, what we will do? We will attach it into a machine. So let me select my volume. Out of that, I'll move into action and I'll click on attach volume. Here I will have to. choose the particular instance that i want to attach with ubuntu ebs is the one machine that i want to attach it with after that i'll click on attach volume so now uh, my volume is being attached with my machine now if i will move back into my machine so now if i'll refresh the thing you will be able to see ubuntu ebs i'll go in here i'll go into storage you can see this is available okay and you can see uh, whatever thing was there it is also present here encrypted yes kms key id is also available and after this what i'll do let us say if i want to modify this ebs volume how i can do that i will simply select my ebs volume i'll then go into action i'll then click on modify volumes and one thing that you should know is that you cannot reduce the size of the volume that you have specified at the beginning you can only increase it if i'll try to decrease it let us say you can see this particular pop up will happen the size of the volume can only be increased not decreased so what i'll do i will then just increase it and let me increase it to let us say 9 after that i'll click on modify and here it will ask do you want to modify it i'll click on yes modify it now you can see if i'll refresh it here you can see it has been successfully modified now if i'll go back to my instance and if i'll refresh here now you will be able to see the updated thing here i'll move into storage you can see the volume size is now 9 okay now what i will do if i will uh, now let us create a snapshot and let's Look at that. Let me select my EBS volume. After that, what I'll do? I'll go into action, and here I'll get an option of create snapshot. I will click on create snapshot. After that, I will be giving a particular description. Let me give it a description. Let which is say it is Ubuntu. It is Ubuntu snapshot. Ubuntu EBS snapshot. after giving the description i'll click on create snapshot if you want to give the tag you can give it let us say if you have any key you can give it i don't have so let me give it a name and after that if you want to give some value let me give it a name as ebs ebs snapshot after that you can simply click on create snapshot So you can see successfully created snapshot from volume. This this is the volume ID and this is your snapshot ID. After that, if I'll move into snapshot, so here you can see from the description, this is the snapshot that I have created. It is Ubuntu EBS snapshot. You can see snapshot status and everything. 
you can even see the encryption was enabled for my ebs but that thing also got reflected here also and what is this snapshot snapshot is nothing but an backup of your volume let us say if you created a volume and you want to uh, have a backup of that so you can basically create a snapshot so let us say if your ebs uh, volume get deleted mistakenly then you can restore this snapshot and you can get your data back so you can see here this is my particular snapshot that i have created let us uh, do the thing let me give it a name ubuntu snapshot ubuntu snapshot after that let me save it now let us see if i am having my volume this i go to here and let us say let me force detach it now if i will go here successfully force detach a volume now let us say if by mistakenly this volume of mine got deleted okay. okay let me say let us say by mistakenly this volume of mine now got deleted so what i can do now I, the thing that i can do here is i can bring this same volume back from this snapshot if i am having so how to restore the particular ebs volume that has just got deleted mistakenly you can select your snapshot after that you can go into action and here you get an option of create volume from snapshot so you have to click on that okay everything will come in the manner that you have specified and after that you can just have to select the availability zone let me select it one see able to select the snapshot first snapshot restore no need to do any other things you just have to click on create snapshot and this snapshot will be becoming your particular ebs volume so you can see here snapshot id that is 05 or this is our ubuntu snapshot that we have just created after that if i'll click on create volume and now if i will move in here you will be able to see this snapshot that we have just created okay so let me go in and show you so basically uh, this is the snapshot that we have created and right now it is available and it is having everything same encryption is encrypted you can say the encryption is thing has been specified as encrypted it is having the kms id so our exactly same ebs volume we are able to restore if somehow you delete it so this is the major benefit if we are creating snapshot so in this session we have done uh, whatever things we needed to achieve show up in the next session hey folks welcome to this session in this session we will look in how to create and mount an efs so for working with efs we need an instance so let us go and uh, launch an instance i'll click on launch instance after that i have to give a name to it so the name that i will provide here is ubuntu efs after giving it a name i will choose the ami is of ubuntu so i'll be basically working with ubuntu now i'll be moving down here i will choose a particular key pair that we have created that is should not virginia demo key one i'll select it now i will go into network settings i'll click on edit after that i'll not do any changes in vpc subnet or in this particular aspect but i will be going down here and in my security group i will keep it as all traffic and the source type will be anywhere so you can remember the security group name uh, uh, we will be looking into this that it the name is launch wizard 18 why i am uh, change the things and why i am keeping a note of it we will be able to figure it out in few more minutes okay i'll do the changes and after that i'll move down i don't need to do any more changes if you want to see the summary you can look in that after that you can simply hit on launch instance so uh, now my instance will be launched so it will take few moments to uh, be available to me so basically uh, here will be our instance yeah ubuntu efs currently it is in pending state 
so in the meantime as uh, my machine is getting created what i'll do i'll now move into efs and i will create a particular efs okay so i'll go here i'll click on create file system all i need to give is to provide it a name uh, let me give it a name as ubuntu efs ubuntu efs and the vpc that i will have here will be of default type if you people could recall the things then uh, in while launching my machine also i'll be uh, having i was having the same default vpc so i'll keep the same vpc here also the storage class that i'll be going on with is standard after that i'll click on create so now this is my particular machine uh, sorry my particular efs that i have created and the file system is now available now if i will click on the name of my efs what i can see if i'll move into networks right now the mounting targets are being created so i need to change this mounting targets okay so uh, apart from this other thing that we should be looking in is that there are a lot of benefits if we are using efs as compared to the ebs so in the ebs if you people could recall then ebs was very you can say availability zone specific you need to specify your ebs in the same availability zone as of your machine and uh, the storage capacity that we get in ebs is also limited but the storage capacity that we get in efs is unlimited moreover uh, we can also uh, connect our efs with n number of instances we require but the same option was not available in ebs now uh, if i will refresh it still now it is creating so what we need to do is that we need to click on this manage and then we will be changing our security groups we need to attach the same security group that is being attached with our machine so basically we have to do the changes with the availability zones so if i'll move back to my instance here so right now it is an initializing state so if you people unable to recall that what we have attached so if i'll move into security you can see launch wizard 18 is the one so i will uh, particularly keep the same uh, security group with my efs also and apart from that another thing that you people should be aware of is that uh, while trying to connect uh, while trying to uh, connect or you can say it while trying to mount my efs then uh, with my ec2 instance at that time what i'll be doing is that i will be installing nfs common so now uh, you need to understand why exactly are we trying to install an nfs common it is because your ec2 instance and your efs are two different service so if those two different service want to access each other then we need a medium so that they can do the things so for that for the accessibility of the things we will be installing nfs common so now let me check if my machine is available or not so if i will refresh here okay still it is initializing so let me check if my efs has given me the mount targets are available or not yeah so now uh, the mount targets are available so i'll click on manage i'll go inside and i'll change this default security groups so i'll uh, remove it one by one after removing it i'll move into security group and i need to select the one security group that is being attached with my machine so it was launch wizard 18 so here it is so i will uh, have this same launch wizard available to every of my availability zone so i'll move in one by one and i'll do the things and uh, here i'll move into 1d type 18 i'll select it again let me go 18 at the end let me select 18 okay after uh, doing the things uh, what i'll do i'll click on save so uh, now our efs is ready to be mounted uh, why i have attached launch wizard 18 because if you will people go and look in this is the particular security group that is being attached with my machine now if i'll refresh it you can see this ubuntu efs is now running state so what i'll do i'll select it out of this i'll click on connect and now i'll connect this particular machine 
so it will now come up now the very first step that i'll be doing once my machine is available is that i'll be updating my machine so as i'm working with uh, ubuntu so i'll type here sudo apt get update and after that i'll hit enter so now uh, my machine will be updated and after updating my machine the next step that i will do here is installing nfs common if you people could recall i have already told you what uh, is the significance of nfs common my ec2 instance wants to access efs so it needs a medium so that it can access the thing so who is going to provide that medium a way to access the thing it is going to be provided by nfs common to me so to install that i'll type a command sudo apt get install nfs common and after that i'll type here minus y so that uh, if any permissions has been required whether you want to download it or not it will not ask me straight away it will download after this i'll hit enter so uh, now all of the packages that i require uh, will be getting downloaded and now yeah it's available now so after uh, this what i have to do i have to create a directory upon which i want to mount the efs now uh, why do we want to create a directory to mounting it now if i'll move in to my efs and if i'll click on attach i get two options of attach either i can at, uh, you can say mounted by dns so what will happen upon this dns name fs a particular id is given and after that uh, dns name a whole of this us is to an amazon.com yes this upon this particular you can say upon this particular dns name uh, the particular efs will get installed sorry will be mounted and here if i will click on mount via ip then what will happen upon this ip address this particular efs will be mounted now if you could see in the architecture of both of this this is the particular command that is being provided to us from the aws for mounting our efs here what i am having i am having uh, this particular command and at the end if you could see this is written efs so what basically is this telling that the architecture is such a way in that if you want to mount your efs you need to create a directory of the name efs let us say if you don't want to give the name what you can do you can create a directory of whatever way you want to have or whatever name you want to have in after that you you can give whatever name you want to give it okay so if i want to mount it via dns then same thing goes on upon this dns name it will be uh, you can say mounted and i have to create a particular directory named as efs if you want some other name you can do it and you can change it once you paste it there so i'll go into connect to instance so ac2 instance connect i'll go here so first of all what i have to do i have to create a directory so how to create a directory i will type here sudo mkdir basically make directory out of this the efs that i the directory name that i'll give here is efs out of that i'll hit enter so now i'll type here ls command to see if the efs directory is available or not you can see it is available and once it is available what i'll do i'll go back either thing you can take either you can take the dns name you can copy this and paste it there or you can take this ip name uh, you can sorry you can take this uh, nfs client command code and you can paste it there so you can i'll be taking this particular code i'll take it i'll go back and simply i'll paste it here after pasting it uh, what i'll do i'll simply hit enter yeah so now uh, it has been successfully mounted now if i will type here command df minus h then you can see i am being successfully able to mount this thing upon this particular directory named as efs if you want to create any direct uh, you can say any file in this efs directory how you can do that you can move into this directory by typing a command change directory efs you can hit enter now i am in efs let us create a file sudo uh, using touch command you can create it sudo touch uh, let me create a file named as one.txt and you can do that you can hit enter now if you will do the things you will be able to see this file is available in this efs okay people with this we are done with our uh, demonstration thing let's meet you up in the next session till then god bless you all just a quick info for all of you cloud enthusiasts 
If you want to make a career in AWS, then you might want to check out IntelliPath's AWS Certification Training Course for Solution Architect. Learn from industry experts through hands-on session, projects, and case study. Reach us out to know more. Hey folks, welcome to this session. In this session, we will see Amazon FSX for Lustre. So, if you are using Amazon FSX for Lustre, then it make it easy and cost-effective to launch and run the popular and high performance Lustre file system. Moreover, we can use Lustre for workloads where storage speed matter such as machine learning or high performance computing. So now let's go and create our file system. So I'll click on create file system. This is the one that we'll be choosing uh, Amazon FSx for Lustre. I'll select it. After that, I'll move down and I'll click on next. Once you click on next, then you can provide the file system uh, name. So let me give it FSX file system only. So after providing that, you can come and choose the deployment and storage type. So I'll be going on with scratch and SSD. SSD basically is the storage type that is being provided to me. So after that, we will be coming down to throughput per unit of storage. So here uh, I'll be giving the storage capacity. The minimum size that I can provide here is 1.2 TIB. So I'll be giving that 1.2 TIB. And once I give that 1.2 TIB, then the throughput capacity will be calculated upon 200 uh, Mbps TIB into 1.2 TIB. And that comes out to be 240. So after that, I'll move down. And here once I reach in network and security, here the uh, particular VPC that I'll be choosing will be default VPC. Now here comes uh, to specify the VPC security group. And here if you will come down, you will be able to see the VPC security group associated with your file system network interface must allow inbound uh, luster traffic like TCP port 988, 101, uh, sorry, 1021 to 1023. So this thing we have to enable in our machine. So I have already uh, launched a machine, if you will see the name. So this is the particular machine that is running, Amazon Linux FSX and uh, the AMI that I have chosen for this machine is uh, Amazon Linux and it is currently available. So now uh, let us go into its security group and do the following changes that is being asked to us to do. So we will move into this and after that we will click on edit inbound rules. So here basically we will be adding a few more rules like custom TCP and the port range that we will be giving here with 988 and I will make it at anywhere IPv4. After that I will click on add rules and here again it will be custom TCP only and after that the port range that I will be specifying here is 1021 to 1023. So after that, I'll uh, choose anywhere IPv4. So uh, we have done uh, whatever things needed to be done. And after that, I'll click on save changes. And why we have given SSH? Because we want to connect with our machine. After that, I'll click on save rules. So here it is launched with our 29. So if you want to give that particular uh, security group, you can also choose that. Or else you can go on with this default only. So let me choose it. So after that, uh, you can select the subnet in which your uh, particular file uh, system will reside. So you can choose it. So mine is for default US East one. So I'll go with that. And after that, if you will come into data repository, uh, then you can import or export. So this is an optional step. If you want the particular data uh, of your file system to be imported or exported to S3, you can do this, but I'll be not doing it. After that, I'll simply click on next and you can basically uh, review the things and after that, you can see uh, what are the things that is being enabled, editable after creation. So you can see what are not editable after creation, your deployment type, your storage type and uh, the other things that you can see. So after that, you can click on create file system. So uh, it will take a few moments to be available so we shall wait till that okay so i waited for uh, five to six minutes and uh, now you can see our file system is available
so now uh, let's go back to our uh, ec2 management console and now let's connect our machine so i'll click on connect and after that i'll come here and i'll click on connect so now uh, once i am successfully able to connect it so first of all i will update it sudo yum update and once i update it okay, so all of the things will get updated and once i update it uh, then i'll be installing a uh, particular dependency so that i can use my amazon fsx cluster so i'll wait uh, once uh, this particular updation is done then i'll be installing the dependency then we shall be moving forward oh okay, so once it has been uh, successfully uh, particularly you can say updated now uh, let us install this particular dependency and it goes something like uh, sudo amazon linux extras after that you have to click on install minus y plus free 2.10 and uh, once you type this particular command after that you have to click on enter so basically it will uh, install all of the dependencies that we require for connecting uh, with our particular amazon fsx so after that what we have to do we have to select our file system and we have to click on attach once you click on attach then we have to make a directory and apart from that if you want to see um, this is the particular file system id you can basically move inside it and uh, you can check other things like uh, the network security the monitoring aspect the administration data repo we have uh, not created any s3 for that so we'll not be getting it so if any updates uh, available then we can see that the network security can come to the subnet and you can choose all of the network interface that is being attached so now let me go on to attach and uh, we have to uh, make a particular directory so let me copy this particular command and so copy it take it back and simply paste it here and once you paste it hit enter so now if i'll do ls command you will be able to see th this particular directory uh, is already been created though we are not able to see it but no worries so let me take this particular command now i'll copy it and if i'll paste it here now and if i'll hit enter and now if i will do df minus h command now we'll be able to see that we have successfully uh, made this uh, Amazon FSX and it is mounted upon our FSX directory. So basically this signifies the fact that uh, this FSX is also got created and we have successfully mounted it upon our particular DNS name that we've been given. So here was the particular FSX DNS name that was given to us and we have successfully mounted our things upon that so this was the particular thing that we needed to uh, accomplish and we have successfully done it so hope you got the things so meet you up in the next session hey folks welcome to this session in this session we will see how to create an amazon fsx for windows fsx for windows file server provide a fully managed native microsoft windows file system so that you can move your windows based application that required shared file storage to aws so for uh, using this amazon fsx first of all we have to create a directory we also need to have a particular instance of windows ami and an amazon fsx so i have already created the things because the creation of uh, amazon fsx and your directory service is going to take uh, 20 to 30 minutes so that's why i have already created the things so let me show you up how to do the things first of all you have to create uh, this directory because using this directory only your amazon fsx is going to get created so first of all you have to go and you have to create a directory service so you have to go to setup directory after you go to setup directory choose the aws managed microsoft ad after that click on next so here in the addition uh, you can choose standard addition 
after that uh, provide a dns name uh, if you are having any dns name then you can provide it or just you can provide a dns whatever you like and uh, after that uh, provide a particular admin uh, password so this password uh, should be containing at least uh, three of the things out of this four either uh, it should be having a low case upper case numeric and special character after that once you confirm it so let me uh, give a particular password and uh, after that click on next so here uh, in the vpc you can uh, go with no preference also but let us say if you want to uh, give the particular preference in this subnet then you can choose the same uh, particular uh, availability zone in which your machine is available so that the connection will become pretty easy and uh, the vpc you will choose in which your machine is there uh, it's in default so we will uh, be going with default and you can go back you might be having this instance running so you can go here you can check uh, in which availability zone it is there and after that you can give the preference uh, accordingly even if you leave it no preference then also there is no problem so let me uh, go on with no preference after that you can click on next once you click on next a review page will pop up in front of you after that uh, you can go on with uh, the charges that is going to get incurred and ap ap apart from that you can also see a 30 day a tri a limited trial will be also there so you can also use that after that you can click on create directory so it is going to take uh, 20 to 30 minutes for the creation so i'll not create it because i already have one so uh, once you do that uh, this particular directory will be getting created and once you create uh, this directory you have to come to amazon fsx here you have to go to create file system and here you have to choose amazon fsx for windows file server choose it after that click on next and here you can basically provide a file system name that you want let me provide one and after that you can go with deployment type either you can go with multi az or even you can go with single az so whatever you prefer you can go and here uh, the storage capacity that you will be choosing is 32 gib why because this is the minimum capacity that you need to give and the storage type will be ssd only so here also if you want uh, the particular subnet you can go on with this particular subnet in which your machine is available or else you can go on with whatever default is being given to you so after that uh, let us say if you are microsoft active directory will be available then once you click on it you will be able to see uh, something like this particular directory as uh, this particular directory is already available so you will get this option of creating the particular directory you can choose it after that so let me choose it once you choose it after that you can click on next once you click on next uh, you will get this type of a pop-up and uh, after that you can review the things these are the things that are not editable after creation you can check it out and after that you can simply click on create file system once you do that your uh, file system will be created so i already have the one so i'll not uh, i have not created it and creation of this uh, fsx is going to also take 20 to 30 minutes so you need to be a little bit patientful so once you have done uh, all of these things you have to go back and then you have to connect to your machine so choose your machine after that click on connect once you click on connect go to rdp client so here you will get an option of download uh, rdp file so i'll download it once you do it uh, just open it so before uh, connecting it i need to have the password so i'll click on get password so here i have to give upload the particular private key file so here i i have to upload my private key file so i'll click on upload and once i do that i'll come to downloads and this is the particular pem file so i'll select it after that i'll click on open and once i'll do that i'll click on decrypt password so once i'll do that i'll uh, get the password so now let me try connecting through rdp so i'll click on connect so then i have to provide the password i'll copy it and here i have to paste the password and i'll click on open so now uh, i'll click on yes so it will uh, take 
time to come up so we shall then wait for that and once it comes up then we will be doing few setting options then we will be able to see amazon fsx in our particular windows system okay so uh, it has started to come up uh, it will be available in just one or two more minutes then we shall be moving on then yeah. so it has come up so after this but uh, here we have to search for network settings so uh, here we have to go for a windows system in our windows system we have to choose go to our control panel not, not the network settings so you can search it you can go to control panel okay, so go to control panel and here in the control panel here we have to go to network and internet once we move into a network and internet from here we have to go to network and uh, sharing center go to that once we uh, move into that then we have to go to change adapter settings so here it is available so once we move into change adapter setting then we have to uh, go to our ethernet so if we will press upon it uh, we will have to move into properties so once we will move uh, come here then we will be getting this internet uh, protocol version 4 tcp ipv4 we have to choose it and we have to click on ok, okay. so let me double tap on it but so here uh, once this page come up we have to use this we have to click on use the following dns server address and once we choose that then we have to go back to our active directory we will be moving into our active directory and from here we will have to take this dns address so let me copy it and here we have to paste it and uh, after that we will again move back and we will take the another uh, dns address so let me copy it and uh, we will be pasting it here on the alternate dns server so once we do that then we can click on ok after that uh, once again do ok so now uh, once we are uh, done with it we shall be moving back now we will be moving into our system and uh, security we will have to go inside that and here uh, we have to then move into the advanced system setting option so once we will uh, move into our advanced setting system option there we will be able to do so let me move into system this one so let me check it out in token internet we have already done it now we will have to system moving back here yeah okay so uh, let us go back we have given the dns name okay so it was here that I was checking for the DNS name okay so now uh, let us come into system and from here we will go into advanced system settings once we come into this advanced system setting then we will be moving into computer name and here we have to click on change then here we have to choose uh, the member of domain and once we choose the member of domain then we have to provide the domain name that we have given so if we will go here so here we will be able to get our domain name let me go to application yeah so here it is already ship.tk so let me copy it and once you copy it come back here and paste it so once you do that then click on okay. ok so now it will ask you for the username and the password so we will be providing it so let me provide it click on ok and once you will uh, do that so now your connection will be established so i provided uh, the uh, particular password that i have used for my active directory so i shall wait now okay so let me try connecting it once again okay so here it comes up so let me click on ok 
you must restart your computer to apply these changes so i'll again click on ok so now uh, it will be basically restarted and once it is done then we will be moving on so then we shall be restarting the things okay so we have done all of the things now it's all about uh, the restart so let me restart it so let me do it okay let me click on restart now once again okay so now it, it will get restarted the remote desktop session is end your uh, remote computer is restarting let me click on okay so now again i will be connecting to it let me see if it is available or not okay so uh, i'll be giving few more time after that what we will be doing is we will be moving into our amazon fsx and here i'll select the amazon fsx and i'll click on attach and here i will have to copy this and paste it there so let me check let me select the machine let me try connecting it once again so let me download the rdp once again so let me open it click on connect so it will ask for me the password let me get the password once again click on upload password this is the particular key i'll click on open and once i'll do that i'll click on decrypt the password so i'll uh, basically have the password with me and now let me connect it so i'll click on okay click on yes okay so now the things are available so once i'll move inside it i'll copy that and i'll paste it in the command prompt then we shall be able to see the things yeah so now uh, it's available so now uh, if i'll go here we'll be able to see let me go into this files or from here also here only let me go to files so if i'll move here right now so if i'll move into this pc yeah so you can only see that local disk c is now available so now uh, after the things you will be able to see another particular uh, storage option will be available to us let me open the command prompt yeah the things will be pretty slow but we need to uh, wait so after this what i'll do i'll open the command prompt after that i'll go to amazon fsx so i'll copy it and uh, once i copy it so i'll come back here and here i'll paste it so the if you want whatever directory uh, name you can give you can basically give whatever directory or drive you want let me go for hatch so once i give give it hatch then after that i'll uh, simply enter so it will basically ask for the username to me so uh, the username that uh, will be of mine is this particular uh, thing shub.tk so let me copy it so you can come back here and here you can paste it and after that you have to give the slash and here you have to type admin once you type the admin hit enter so it will ask you for the password uh, give the password that you have given for your active directory after that hit enter you can see the command uh, completed successfully once it is done uh, now if i'll go back and now if i will move into this pc you will be able to see we have successfully uh, given or we have successfully mounted our uh, amazon fsx on to our windows system so this is how you will be doing the thing so we are having all this in this session Hope you got this session. See you up in the next session. Hey folks, welcome to this session. In this session, we will be looking into Amazon FSX. So, Amazon FSX is easy and cost-effective to launch, run, and scale feature-rich, high-performance file system in cloud. So, basically, FSX is uh, like a file system that is being available to us. It makes uses of uh, SSD storage to provide fast performance with low latency, but it can also make use of HDD. 
Now, if we will look into the use cases of uh, FSX, then uh, we will be able to note that uh, it supports wide range of workload with its reliability, security, scalability and broad set of capabilities. AWS FSX is built on latest AWS compute network and disk technology, which is fully managed service. And apart from that, uh, it is compatible with a lot of the services that is being available like Amazon EC2 instances of Amazon workspace. Let us see if you are having an FSX, then you can simply mount it upon the uh, windows or upon uh, the other Amazon Linux machine that you wanted to have being a file system you can think that it is a modified version of the efs now basically uh, right now amazon fsx uh, is being provided with uh, four different types one is for amazon fsx for windows file server one is amazon fsx for lustre apart from that we are having also other two that is uh, natap on tap and uh, your particular open z F S. So these options are also available, but we will be majorly looking into the windows and the lustre. So uh, apart from this, uh, one thing that is far more uh, uh, you can go with surety is that it will be highly available 99.99 times it will be available to you. It is simple and uh, fully managed. So if it is fully managed, so you need not to be uh, worry about the things like its availability and all so aws will be taking care of all of those things and uh, you whatever resources or whatever up to storage you will be using let us say if there is a particular storage limit that you are using let us say for 5 tv for that only you are going to pay and the easy integration of fsx with the other services like ec2 and all makes it even it more lucrative uh, service to be used so you can uh, just go on with that uh, amazon fsx is a modified version of the efs it has better feature as compared to the uh, efs that is being available to us in the next session we will be looking into the features of fsx hey folks welcome to this session in this session we will be discussing about features of fsx so if you will see to the first feature of fsx we can see that dfs uh, Basically, distributed file system namespace allows you to group files here from multiple file system into a single common folder structure and namespace from which you can access the entire file data set. Now, what exactly does it tell us? Let us say if you are having an DFS, basically it will allow users or application to access data files such as PDF, image, Word document or other types of uh, data files from shared storage across any one of the network server. So let us say if we are able to access the thing, how will we be able to access the thing? Basically, there will be a single folder and upon that single folder, we will be able to access all of the thing. Now, if we will uh, look into the other feature that is using Windows uh, robust file copy to copy your files uh, directly to the Amazon FSX. So what basically is happening in this? Let us say in your machine you are having some data and you want it to be uploaded into uh, somewhere where it will be safe and your machine uh, data space will be free. So then you can use this particular option. So FSX provide you with this option. Now if we will look into the other features of FSX then it uh, actually includes as FSX uh, works with uh, the Microsoft uh, Active Directory to integrate with the existing Microsoft Windows environment. So let us say if you are using the Active Directory, then what will happen? Then uh, the Microsoft uh, Directory service will use it to store the information about object or the network. So it can be very useful for the administrator or for the user. Now, apart from that, if you look into the feature of uh, FSX, then as with every AWS service, encryption will be provided to you. Apart from that, KMS is also provided to you basically key management service. So you can even encrypt the data and even you can put the key upon that. And apart from that, uh, Amazon FSX follows the ISO, PCI, DS and SOC standards. So basically you can think 
that whatever things are being rolling out it is in acknowledgement to the current uh, versions that is being specified so we are having all this in the feature of fsx see you up in the next video hey folks welcome to the session in this session we will be looking into efs so efs is elastic file system so through the efs we can share our data and uh, most of the time it is also available and the scalability also it, that it provides is also limitless the particular uh, storage capacity that e efs provide us is unlimited so let's move forward and let us see what are the features of efs so it is completely managed and uh, let us see if uh, you are using any service in the aws then it will be having its own security own encryption so the data security is also very good you can uh, also get the life cycle management and the storage class for managing your data in the efs security purpose it is also very good the performance is also good as compared to the other uh, storage options that are being available and uh, the particular storage that it provides us let us see if we will compare it with the ebs then it has an enormous gap in between because we know ebs cannot provide us with uh, unlimited uh, storage capacity now if we will uh, see uh, what other thing uh, does efs provides us if we will compare it with the ebs now let us go and let us see that let us say if you are using ebs then uh, your particular machine and your efs has to be present in the same availability soon but that is not the case with your efs efs uh, does not need to be present in the same availability zone as of your machine your machine can be uh, in the region and efs will be in that region and after that you can do the connection so the availability zone specification does not apply to the efs now ebs being an uh, elastic uh, block store so it comes in raw and unformatted manner but the same is not applicable to the efs so you can straight away go into efs and you can start using the thing and where does we use ebs let us see if there is any database application that is running then we will be using ebs but uh, for the companies to improve their content management systems they can be using efs because let us say if any company is using it uh, then they will be uh, dumping a lot of data into it EBS definitely will be uh, fast accessible because EBS acts like a primary memory to your machine but EFS acts like a secondary uh, storage option that is being available to your machine but the storage option that EFS can provide EBS cannot provide you. So that is what we are having in EBS versus EFS. We will look into FSX in our next session. See you up in the next session. Hey folks, welcome to the session. In this session, we will be looking into Amazon FSX pricing. First of all, we will look for Windows file server. Now, if let us say we are in the region North Virginia. So the type of storage options that we are going to have is SSD storage capacity, HDD storage capacity, throughput storage capacity and backup storage capacity. Now, depending upon the single AZ deployment or a multiple AZ deployment, we are going to get the pricing for that. Let us say if I am using SSD storage capacity and I want to have a single AZ deployment, then I have to pay $0.130 per GB per month. But if I choose with the same storage option multiple AZ deployment, then I'll be paying $0.230 per GB per month. Similarly, we will be having other storage options available. Now let us move into a problem statement and try to understand the things. So here if I will move it, we can see the problem statement is there. Assume you want, we want to store 10 TB of general purpose file share data using HDD storage in the US East North Virginia. Based upon the typical uh, duplications, saving of 50 to 60 percent, we provision 5 TB multiple AZ file with 16 Mbps of throughput capacity. Also assume that we have an average uh, backup storage of 5 TB during the month. So upon this 10 TB, we are going to segregate it into 5 and 5 TB. 
So if we will look in uh, to the very first statement here we are using HDD storage capacity and it is if we will uh, look in it is for uh, multi AZ. So if we will uh, go back here and if we will see here in the HDD uh, storage capacity for multi AZ uh, we have to pay 0 0.025 per GB per month. Now if we will move in we can see that 5 TB is going to get multiplied with 0 0.025 because we are using HDD. So from that, we will be able to calculate what exactly we are going to uh, get billed for, for the storage. Now if we will uh, look into the uh, throughput, then 16 Mbps of throughput we are using. Now if we will uh, go back, so we can see the throughput capacity for multi AZ is $4.5 per Mbps per month. So here we have done that same thing. 16 Mbps into uh, $4.5 per Mbps uh, per month. So it is going to be $72 per month. Now we are taking a backup of 5 TB. Now if I will uh, go back here, we can see uh, whether it is single AZ or multiple AZ, uh, the price is gonna same. It is $0.050 per GB per month. So upon that we will do the calculation and once we do the uh, calculation, we will be getting the total monthly charge that is going to be $456. So this is how you can do the uh, particular uh, pricing of your Windows file server. Now let's look for the Lustre. Now here if you will uh, look for the Lustre then uh, we are having uh, different storage options that is being available to us. Either we can choose the scratch or we can choose the persistent. Now upon that uh, upon the particular mbps tib baseline we will be uh, going to get build let us say if i'm using the scratch so for 200 mb uh, per second uh, per tib baseline up to 1.3 gb per second per tib burst i'm going to get build 0 0.14 dollar now if i'll move in and if i'll see the problem statement then what it is telling me assume we have a scratch file system so basically we are using this scratch storage option in the US East North Virginia region which has been provisioned with 4,800 uh, 4, GB of storage capacity. We spin up our file system for 8 hours workload every day and then shut it down. We do this uh, for the 30 days. Now if I will uh, move back in and I can see that for scratch. Uh, what is the price that I'm going to pay? It is 0 0.14 dollar per GB per month. But here uh, the calculation that uh, we are going to have is 8 hours. So I, first of all, I have to find that for 1 hour, how much exactly is I'm paying? So how can I find it? Uh, if it is for per month, I'll divide it by 30. And after that, I'm going to divide it by 24 so that I'll be getting for per hour. How much exactly is it costing me? So I got the things and once I get uh, how much it is costing me, I'll then uh, multiply it with the 400 GB of storage capacity upon 8 hours because I'm going to run it for 8 hours and for 30 days and whatever is the cost and that is going to be the cost for my lustra. So basically this is how you can uh, do the calculation upon the things. In this session we are having all this. See you up in the next session. Hey folks, welcome to this session. In this session, we'll be discussing about Amazon FSX for Windows File Server. So, if you are using Amazon FSX for Windows File Server, uh, then whatever Microsoft products are there, all of them will be compatible with the uh, Windows File Server of FSX. So, let us see if you want to move any Windows-based app to this shared storage, you can do it with ease. Apart from that, if you are using FSX for Windows File Server, then we will uh, get full support from SMB protocol, Windows NTFS and Microsoft Active Directory. So now comes what exactly is an SMB protocol. So it is a service uh, server message block protocol. It is a network uh, file sharing protocol. So we'll get the support from a network file sharing protocol. And we will also get the support from Windows NTFS. So actually NTFS uh, is a new technology file system 
this is a primary file uh, system for the recent version of windows and windows server let us say if any a new version of windows has been rolled out then we can uh, will be able to use all of those features if we are using the fsx for windows file server and apart from that we can also use uh, microsoft active directory for the integration purpose and fsx use ssd for the first performance now if you look into the features of aws fsx for windows file server then one thing uh, that we are very sure about is the compatibility of the windows but uh, the uh, windows versions need to be uh, either 7 or above it we can even access our windows fsx from uh, other ec2 machines like windows ec2 machines from workspace or even vmware cloud on aws it is even fully managed by the aws so let us say if any hardware patching needed to be done uh, then all of those things is going to be taken care of by the aws or the microsoft because it has the integration directly with the uh, windows so we will uh, be very much carefree and it uses ssd for the fast performance but it can even use hdd if required now if we will look into the use case uh, when exactly will we be using it let us say if there is a particular windows based application or a workload uh, that is being running and uh, it needed to have a shared file storage it is in requirement uh, of having a shared file storage for storing its data then we can use it apart from that uh, let us say if any development environment uh, is working upon and they want to recite their codes or build repositories so that that particular code will be available to each and everyone present in the development team or if they are working upon an application and that application needed to be available to each and everyone so that they can fix the bug they can find out what error is it giving us or what is the particular performance level they want to judge so they need the accessibility of that particular application or of that particular code repositories so then we can definitely use um, fsx for windows file server and using that we can even transfer the things to them now if you will see that how does uh, fsx for windows file server work first of all we have to uh, have a particular directory available to us once we have the directory we can then start integrating our particular uh, fsx with that directory and once we do that then we can our configure our file then we can connect that fsx to our machine and if any particular application is running and if it uh, wanted to use any storage options then we can uh, basically integrate that application uh, with our machine having the fsx or we can even integrate the application with the fsx and then they can start using the things now if we will look into amazon fsx for windows file server supported client and access method and environment so uh, if you look into the client space then we can use the amazon ec2 instances here we can use either ubuntu or we can use directly windows um, ami if we want apart from that also we get a lot of other options now how exactly are we going to access it we can access it using the dns name dns name provided in our active directory or using the distributed file system namespace that we have already discussed and the environment uh, needed to be either an on-premise environment if you want it you can do it or from an aws account you can also access the thing so in this session we are having uh, this much now let us discuss about the failovers uh, we have uh, basically discussed till uh, yet in this session about the windows file server now uh, we will lo look more into the failover processes that how exactly is the failover process work so let us say if we have enabled uh, multi az then the failover will start automatically so uh, and when exactly are the conditions when it will start let us say if there is a particular availability zone and it has gone down then it will start uh, preferred uh, file server needed to be available but it is not there or uh, let us say if any maintenance start happening at the background then the failover process will start automatically and uh, what exactly happens in the failover if you will look uh, then uh, let us say whatever things uh, we are able to access if it has gone down then uh, we will start uh, requesting for that uh, we will do the read and write request for whatever data we are having in our file system and they will uh, be st again start rolling the things back uh, then uh, once all of the resources are available in the particular subnet or you can say in the particular place where we want then the fsx automatically goes back to the preferred preferred file server and how much time will it takes uh, for it uh, it takes around 30 seconds from when it detected a file server 
सो विद इन दी वेरी स्मॉल स्पेन ऑफ टाइम इट विल डू अ लॉट ऑफ वर्क सो वी हैव डिस्कस्ड टिल येट अबाउट द एमेजोन एफ एस एक्स फॉर विंडोज फाइल सब इन द नेक्स्ट सेशन विल बी डिस्कसिंग अबाउट एमेजोन एफ एस एक्स फॉर लस्ट हे फोक्स वेलकम टू दिस सेशन इन दिस सेशन वी विल बी डिस्कसिंग अबाउट एमेजोन एफ एस एक्स फॉर लस्ट सो एफ एस एक्स फॉर लस्ट मेक इट वेरी ईजी टू लॉन्च एंड रन दी वर्ल्ड्स मोस्ट पॉपुलर फाइल सिस्टम सो इफ यू विल लुक इन टू द एमेजोन एफ एस एक्स फॉर विंडोज फाइल सब देयर If you want to use it, then you need to be available with uh, Microsoft Active Directory, and you have to use that. And along with that, Amazon FSX for Windows file system you have to use. Then only you will be able to use it once you integrate this three thing with your uh, machine. But if you will compare it with the Lustre, then it is far more easier to work with. Lustre file system is an open source and parallel. file system that support many requirement of leadership class hpc simulation environment now if we will look into the hpc simulation environment what exactly the things are happening hpc basically is high performance computing let us say uh, we can use it for incredibly computational uh, intensive task like quantum mechanics glass uh, exploration and forecasting so there wherever we need better hpc simulation there we can uh, use the fsx for lustre for storing our files we will look more into it in our uh, use cases now if we will look into the feature of amazon fsx for lustre uh, whatever features we are having in microsoft uh, uh, file system we will be having all those things but few add ons will be there what are those things first of all we will have a seamless integration with our amazon s3 data so what is the major benefit if we are able to integrate to it with our s3 let us say if our data is present in the s3 then we can track our data much more properly we will be having our uh, buckets uh, so we can uh, even give the policies as per our need and we can make our uh, file system much more secure we will be able to uh, make our luster much more secure by because every aws uh, service uh, provide us with the encryption so we can make our luster even more secure and our s3 policies we can make and uh, we can even make our s3 more uh, safer now uh, it is one of the world's uh, best and high performance file system that is being available to us you can also access the luster from the on premises so just like the other uh, file systems uh, if you will see it is simple and fully managed data accessible to other aws services also so the integration of uh, amazon fsx for lustre uh, has with other services also and multiple deployment options also you get when you will be using lustre so uh, as we are able to integrate it with the s3 then it makes the processing of our data far more easier we can uh, have the data in our s3 we can go through it and if we want uh, to use it then also we can use it uh, let us see if there is a particular data which was present in our uh, lustre then we have moved the data from lustre to the s3 from the s3 we can load that data into our redshift and then we can start using it so basically it makes accessibility to the data far more easier and whatever operations we want to perform we can also perform that very well now if we will look into the use cases uh, machine learning uh, uses massive amount of training data so we can basically store all those datas in our lustre and uh, also machine learning is changing the experience of the hpc simulation because if you will uh, go for forecasting or for gas exploration everywhere machine learning is being used so if uh, we are able to integrate the machine learning with our lustre file system then it can uh, provide us with uh, enormous uh, results and let us see if you want to do any media processing like rendering of a video visual effects there also the data that is being created you can simply put it there to your uh, fsx uh, for the lustre from there you can have it into the your s3 and you can do whatever you want to do so that is the major benefit of the fsx for lustre it is very much simple as compared to the other or uh, uh, amazon fsx that have been present so that's all we are having in this video see you up in the next video just a quick info for all of you cloud enthusiasts 
If you want to make a career in AWS, then you might want to check out IntelliPath's AWS Certification Training Course for Solution Architect. Learn from industry experts through hands-on session, projects, and case study. Reach us out to know more. So guys, cloud computing is nothing but the use of remote servers on the internet to do a particular task, right? Now you, you would ask like, why do we need to connect to remote computers when I can do everything on my personal computer? Now imagine if you have an application which requires a lot of processing, right? So what will you do? Will you buy a server which has a lot of processing power? put your application over there and then see how your application is functioning. Or if I give you one more option that you can rent a server from a cloud provider and basically do a RDP or an SSH into that, put your application over there and see the working of that application, how it runs. And I also tell you that the moment you are done with the server, you can just give it back to me and I'll charge you only for the time that you used it. On top of that, what if I tell you that it's as cheap as 0.0005 dollars per hour. Isn't that amazing? And that is exactly what cloud computing is all about, guys. So cloud computing for a beginner, it's nothing but the use of remote servers for a personal needs, right? And rather than using our own computers or rather than buying servers of our own, I just want to rent a server on a cloud and I will pay them accordingly to the time that I have used and the prices are as low as the figure that I just told you, right? So this is what cloud computing is, guys. Now, you would wonder how it actually came into the picture, right? So let's go ahead and understand that. All right, guys, so let's take an example to understand this. Imagine you're a developer and you created your first app, which you think is going to be a hit, right? So how do you make this app available to the world, right? Or how do you make this app or website available to the world? So what do you do? You buy some servers and you put that application over there, right? And just putting your application on the servers would not do it. You'll have to connect it to the internet. And once you connect it to the internet, that is when people start to come on your application, come on your website and start to use it. All right. So this is how typically work used to be done. Now, I want to take your focus on to certain things that I just said when I was explaining you this example. First of all, I will have to buy these servers right and guys servers are not cheap they're very expensive and buying a stack of servers will already cost you a lot of money and you're not even sure whether your app will be a hit or not right you've just created your app and you want to try it out and you put it on some servers and because you know you want to make it production grade obviously you'll have to buy a stack of servers which is going to cost you a lot right Second thing is you will have to configure everything manually. If these servers have to be connected to the internet, you will have to do the connections, uh, you know, to this servers manually. You'll have to set up a static IP address. So you'll have to contact your ISP and say that, you know, I need a static IP address for my servers so that people can just go to one particular address and they can visit it. After that, you again have to buy a domain. Let's say if you go to intellipart.com, you see the website, right? So what is happening? In telepart.com in the backend, uh, the domain is getting converted into an IP address by a DNS server. And then that IP address is basically pointing to the servers, right? So you will have to buy a domain. You will have to point that domain to these servers. And that's how it used to work, right? And obviously, if you have these servers, uh, you'll have to hire a team also who's going to manage these servers in case the, the number of users increase. You'll have to increase the number of servers, etc, etc. There are a lot of things that you'll have to do. And because of these things, there were some problems. And because we wanted to overcome these problems, we use cloud computing. Right now, let, like I said, you were using this kind of an architecture before. Now, let's see if we don't use this kind of an architecture and I just use cloud computing. What is going to be the difference? The difference will be that I created my application. Next thing is I'll go to AWS and launch a stack of servers. I'll put my application over there. AWS automatically gives me a static IP address. It has a service to basically give me a domain name as well. I would just configure my domain name to connect to this IP address and I'm done. Right. It's so much ease that I don't have to hire a team to manage my servers because AWS says whatever servers you want to launch, I'm going to handle it for you. Not AWS, it's, it's in fact any cloud provider for that matter. All the servers are managed by them. All the hardware upgradations are managed by them. Everything is managed by the cloud provider. And that is why cloud computing model itself is such a big hit, right? 
So what are the advantages? So first thing is that there, there is little or no investment. So I don't have to buy a stack of servers to get my application up and ready. I can just rent them, right? And the cost is minimal for launching the stack of servers and basically getting them up and ready, right? I don't have to invest much. Even though I'm starting fresh, I have just launched my application. I don't need seed money for setting up an infrastructure, which is going to be huge for the whole world to see right the whole world can access your application but you don't have to worry about it because aws is backing you up right so there is little or no investment second thing is more focus on app development so you can focus more on app development than worrying about whether my infrastructure is fine or not how how is the traffic coming on to my app is my infrastructure scalable enough that it can handle all the traffic which is coming on to it everything is managed by aws uh, once you configure it correctly right Third thing is it requires less workforce. So like I said, if you are buying your own servers, you obviously have to have a team which is going to manage your servers for you, right? Any hardware up upgradations, any security patch that you have to do, all of that is done by a team, correct? But if you are launching your infrastructure or if you're creating your infrastructure on any cloud provider, the cloud provider's headache is to manage the servers. It's their headache to do the security patches. It's their headache to improve or upgrade the hardware once, uh, you know, the processors become slow. So all of that is managed by your cloud provider. And all you will do is focus on your app, focus on your business goals, and then succeed towards the goal that you have, right? So this is an advantage that you get when you use cloud computing. And that is why most of the companies today, so I guess only the companies who started out earlier that is before cloud computing came into the picture are still working on their own servers hosting their own applications but companies who are very young who have just started out uh, for example startups particularly they prefer cloud computing or they prefer their servers to be on the cloud because obviously when you are starting off with a new company you have very limited amount of money uh, that you can invest in things right so it's always a good idea to invest on the things which are required and rest you know if it works uh, in a certain way that they are not costing you much it works that way right so for startups especially cloud computing is a huge thing it's it's a huge bonus and that is why you can see a lot of new business ideas are coming in a lot of new people are trying out their own app or their own websites to provide a particular service reason being the major part of starting up a business was setting up the infrastructure that is handled by cloud computing these days right and that is why you can see more and more young companies are coming up and they are trying out an app if they fail you know there was little investment involved in it so it doesn't matter and that, that is what is encouraging the entrepreneurs of this age so guys this, these are the advantages of cloud computing moving forward now because cloud computing is so huge there are a lot of products which are available on cloud these days right and you won't even know whether they exist in cloud or not for example netflix is the biggest example that everyone uh, is probably using uh, every day in their life the popular service netflix which is a movie streaming service its entire infrastructure is on aws Everything from A to Z, the scaling part, uh, the content delivery network, the networking part, the security part, everything is handled by AWS. Now, don't worry, guys, if you don't understand the jargons that are just used, like content delivery network, security, everything I'll explain in this video. For now, I just want to tell you guys that because of the advantages that cloud computing has to offer and because of the kind of services that you get from cloud, companies such big such as Netflix, AWS, Airbnb, Amazon itself are relying on the infrastructure of the cloud providers so that they never go down. Now, how did it come to these companies' minds to, you know, switch to cloud? So I'll give you a very small example. Netflix uh, suffered a huge blackout on the internet, I think in somewhere around 2008 or 2009 wherein all the services were down you know why because the more more number of users came up to use the service and that's when the servers crashed right the whole application went down and it caused a huge loss to the netflix company itself right and that is when they decided uh dude i cannot manage all my servers i can either do the app development or i can manage the servers there's only one thing that i can do 
So then Netflix started to migrate itself on the AWS infrastructure, which is highly scalable, which is highly available, right? And now seldom do you see that, you know, Netflix services down. In my experience, I've never seen Netflix down since I've been using it in, from the past two, three years. I've never seen Netflix down or I've never seen an error that, you know, uh, the server is out or there's a problem with the infrastructure. I've never seen that, right? And that is because of the high availability that is provided by the cloud providers these days. Netflix is just one example. Other businesses that we are all aware of is the Amazon e-commerce website, right? The Amazon e-commerce website is also hosted on the AWS infrastructure, right? Now, a company, uh, an e-commerce website whose bread and butter comes from a website from online, being online, right? Imagine they are relying on the AWS infrastructure that all of you guys also have, you know, access to right so imagine yourself you're sharing the same infrastructure which the biggest e-commerce company in the world is using so you can be rest assured that your application is in safe hands right another great example of cloud computing is google drive so google drive is a cloud product the google documents the google drive where you can upload all your files and folders are all hosted on the google cloud right and that is again a fantastic cloud product then we have Airbnb, which is actually a website which is hosted on AWS and it's fully hosted on AWS for all its functionalities, scalabilities and availability. Prime Video, which is video streaming service for Amazon. That is also hosted on AWS. And the funny thing is Netflix, which is its biggest competitor, is also hosted on the same infrastructure as Amazon Prime Video, right? Awesome, isn't it? So these were all the products that you see in your day-to-day -day life that are actually cloud products and you won't even know whether they were on cloud or not. So now you know. Moving further, guys. Now let's talk about the cloud computing models. What are the different kind of models uh, that are in cloud uh, that are there in cloud computing, and what are models exactly? So, guys, cloud computing is basically uh, divided into two kind of models. The first model is the deployment model, and the second model is the service model. So, how do we get these two categories? The way you can deploy on cloud has three ways to it, and the way you can access services on cloud has again three ways to it. Right. So one is about putting your application out there. So if you're putting your application out there, you have three options, either to use public cloud, private cloud or hybrid cloud. If you're using a service from cloud, you again have three options, which is infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. Let's understand all these things one by one. Don't get carried away with all the big words used here. We'll understand each and everything one by one. And then as you move along, if you have any questions, you can put it right. So, so far, guys, I've not got any questions. I guess everything is crystal clear to everyone. So moving forward in the next slide, I'm going to start with the deployment model. So if you have any questions, now is the time, guys, you can ask me all out and I'll be happy to answer it for you. All right. So Shambhavi has a question and she says that Netflix is using AWS. So that means all the videos that we see are also hosted on AWS. Yes, Shambhavi, all the videos that you see the software itself, the website exists on AWS. Okay, so she has one more question, but when I install the Netflix app, it's available on my mobile. How is that on cloud? Okay, so Shamvi, there are two sides to it. Netflix application, it's basically a client application. The videos that you get, they don't exist on your phone. They're actually streamed from the internet, right? So your Netflix application is just a client application, but it interacts with the AWS servers on which the Netflix servers have been de deployed. All the videos that you see, there's a service called Amazon S3. All those videos, they exist over there. They're stored over there. And they are basically provided to you using a content delivery network, which is basically nothing but a caching system. That is, uh, I'll give you a very a simple example that if you, if you are residing, let's say in India and you are watching, let's say a US television show. So obviously that US television show is, uh, would be existing uh, on the servers of the U Netflix US, right? But if you are viewing in India, it doesn't make sense to stream all the way from US your video, right? So the server has to be connected to your queries also depends on how far is the server from your application, right? So there's a service called content delivery network, which basically what it does is it caches all the videos that you have to see or you're watching onto an Indian server. 
if you are in india right and that's when you know a server which is nearer to you has all the content which exists on the us server and this is all on demand right so this is how this is just very simple a very small thing that netflix does to improve its service using the aws infrastructure and this this concept that i just told you is content delivery network don't worry if you don't understand what i just told you as you move along i'm going to explain this in detail all right any more questions guys all right so everybody is giving me a go all right guys so if everything is crystal clear let's go ahead and discuss the models one by one so the first model that we're going to discuss is the deployment model so what are deployment models so guys deployment models are nothing but the various ways using which we can deploy our application all right now there are various ways let's look at those ways one by one this is the first way of deploying your application on the cloud infrastructure is called public cloud now what is public cloud public cloud is uh, are the servers which are offered by your cloud provider in which each server can have multiple companies hosting their application all right it could be your netflix and it could be that your you know its competitor that is prime video if you have offered for public cloud your application would share the same server as some other application it could be prime video as well right so but why is there a segregation although there is no problem when there are multiple applications on the same server but what happens is some companies are still skeptic some companies have data policies that they say that you know we have confidential data and we cannot take any risk where uh, you know some other companies also on our server and there's a risk of our data being hacked into right so that's why because of these data policies there were different deployment models that were created so like i said public cloud is when you know the the data that you are providing to the cloud is not that sensitive is not that confidential and hence you are okay when uh, you know aws tells you although there will be no problem when a separate application is also deployed on the same server there will be no harm to your data when they say like okay anyways we don't have any data policies like that right so public cloud is when you are using or the cloud computings or the cloud providers servers and you allow them to host more applications on the same server you are okay with that fact all right so that is public cloud next is private cloud what is private cloud private cloud can be two things the first thing is like i said uh, if you want a separate server all for yourself where you say no matter how much space is empty no matter how much of the server is free i don't want any other company's data on my server i want my data to be isolated i want it to be isolated on this particular server that you have in your infrastructure so that becomes a private cloud the second way of creating a private cloud is you buy your own servers and you create your own cloud in your data center right that is you buy all the stack of servers required and you host your application as if you're hosting on a cloud provider it's just that it's your own cloud that you have created right you have bought your own servers and you're putting your data on your own servers so that is private cloud okay so the third thing is hybrid cloud now what is hybrid cloud guys when you want to have a kind of infrastructure wherein you are using some of the public cloud and some of the servers from the private cloud in that case it becomes a hybrid cloud uh, so let me give you an example let's say there is a research company so that research company the marketing website for that research company exists on the public cloud but on that marketing website also people have the access to login and when they log in they can see their research materials that they're working on okay but this research material it does not exist on the server of the public cloud it exists on some other other server which is private cloud so from a user's perspective i will say that it seems that everything is on the same website but actually the infrastructure is like this that the private cloud is uh, or your sensitive or your research files are basically on some other server or let's say the private cloud right and the website that you're hosting which doesn't have that much of confidential data is actually hosted on the public cloud right so this is a fine example of how uh, a hybrid kind of architecture is created one more example that I can that i can think on top of my head is uh, that uh, let's say there's a company wherein it's it's been there since the past 15 years right so they have some legacy systems that they don't want to touch which they have 
bot and on which the application is working. But what they have decided now is that any of the servers that we are going to launch from now on, any of the new applications that we are going to launch from now on, we are going to launch it on a cloud uh, provider server, right? So in that case, what happens is these servers which were there in your data center, they, they have to be on the same network as the cloud providers servers right that is a public cloud and hence that also that kind of a uh, mixture or that kind of a in arrangement again becomes a hybrid cloud so guys these are the, all the cases uh, you know wherein you can or these are all the ways you can deploy your application on cloud so first we discussed pu public cloud which was basically when the servers uh, they are basically they can be shared between multiple clients of the cloud provider, right? And basically those servers are owned by the cloud provider. Second is private cloud, wherein there are two cases. The first case could be that you own or you ask your cloud provider to give you a separate server stack where no other data will be available. Only your data will be available. That is one kind of private cloud. Second kind of private cloud is when you buy your own servers and you set up a data center and that becomes your own private cloud. That is also a way of creating a private cloud or using a private cloud. Third kind of deployment is a hybrid deployment wherein you use some servers from the public cloud and you use some servers from the private cloud and hence it's called hybrid. All right. So guys, any doubt in whatever we have discussed so far, if yes, please comment in the chat box or Put your question in the chat box and I'll be happy to answer it for you. Any doubts, guys? If there are no doubts, we'll move forward. But if any doubts, now is the time that you can mention it and I'll clear it for you. All right. So Shubham is saying, can you explain private cloud once more? Sure, Shubham. So private cloud uh, is nothing but using uh, using a server which is not shared by anyone else, right? So how does AWS work or how does any cloud provider work for that matter? They buy a very big machine or very big server with a lot of RAM and with a lot of processing power, right? And what they do is they launch multiple instances of virtual machines on it, right? So it could be that, um, you know, you imagine your laptop, you can probably, if, if it's a i3 or it's a i5 with around 8 GB of RAM, you can launch around three operating systems on the same server at the same time using a virtual machine, right? You can do that. Now, similarly, what cloud providers do is they have, uh, they buy a stack of servers and what they do is they launch multiple machine, virtual machines on that server, right? And those virtual machines are owned by people who basically launch it through the AWS console or the Azure console or the GCP console, right? They launch it from there. Now, when your application or when your, uh, when your instance is up and ready, it is actually a part or it's actually a virtual machine, which is a part of a server. But it could be that that same server is hosting seven or eight more virtual machines, which are owned by other people who have created their Azure or GCP accounts. Correct. So if that is the case, then there are some companies like, uh, let's take the example of government agencies, uh, you know, secret, uh, government secret agencies, which uh, are intelligence agencies like CIA or uh, in uh, CIA in US, like Homeland Department in US, all, the, all of them, they have very confidential data, which have to be accessed by their internal employees, irrespective of the fact where they are sitting in the, where they are sitting and in what part of the world they are sitting, right? Now, in those kind of cases, what happens is, although they can buy their own servers, they can set up everything by themselves also. But then, like I said, they'll have to hire a team also that will manage the servers. So what cloud providers do is they give you an option of having your own server stack, which is isolated from the rest of the infrastructure of your cloud provider, right? That server stack is exclusively for you. It'll be a little higher. The price will be a little higher, but it'll again be on a pay as you go model. That is, you can say that for how much ever time you'll be using it for that much time only, you'll have to pay the cloud provider. So that is what private cloud is, that you get a separate isolated server for yourself on which you will be working. You will be putting your applications on it, right? And those applications will nowhere be connected to, uh, or nowhere will be sharing the infrastructure, which uh, the other 
clients of that cloud provider are using. So that is private cloud. Other way of uh, saying what a private cloud is that you buy your own servers and you set up in a data center, right? So although in that case, you're not getting the benefits of cloud computing, but yes, that also is called a private cloud because you buy the same kind of infrastructure, you uh, buy the same kind of infrastructure at scale, at the same scale that a cloud provider does, you buy it at the same scale, right? When I say scale in the same quantity, you set up a data center according to it and it becomes your own private mini cloud right that is also what a private cloud is so all right i guess shubham now you're clear with the doubt all right thanks shubham. so others if there is any doubt in whatever i've explained so far please let me know i'll clear your doubts and if not i will move forward to our next topic all right so everybody is giving me a go guys so great let's move on to a next topic which are service models so we have discussed deployment models that is how what are the various ways in which i can deploy my application on a cloud provider now let's discuss the various kind of services that i can get from a cloud provider okay so let's discuss that so what are service models now guys there are three kind of service models that we get in cloud computing the first one is infrastructure as a service now what is infrastructure as a service basically the cloud provider will give you an access to the server that is you will get an access to the operating system of the server and you can install anything you want in that server and that will become uh, it can either become a database server it can become a website server you know it can become anything so basically when we say infrastructure as a service you're getting the whole infrastructure you're getting the whole system you're getting the whole virtual machine as a service delivered to you right so that is infrastructure as a service second is platform as a service so in contrary to what we got in infrastructure as a service wherein i got a machine that i could use in platform as a service i do not get the access to the operating system Okay, what I do get an access to is kind of like a dashboard wherein in that dashboard I can upload any files uh, that I want and those files would automatically be put on the server by AWS and I can see those files hosted on the server. If it's confusing, let me give you an example. Uh, let's say if I want to set up a website and what I get is infrastructure as a service. So in that case, what I'll have to do is I'll get a fresh operating system on that operating system. I'll have to install a web hosting software like Apache or Tomcat or anything. Once I have installed it, I will have to uh, do an FTP or I will have to transfer my files from a local computer on that AWS server using FTP. Once I've done that, I have to put those files in a specific folder on that particular server. And only then I will be able to access it when I go to the IP address of that particular server. This is the case of infrastructure as a service where I've done everything that I had to do, right? In case of platform as a service, what happens is that I will not get the access to the operating system. All the softwares, all the settings that are required to be done is done by AWS. What I do get an access to is a dashboard where I have a button called upload. I click on that upload button and what it will do is it will upload my website automatically. It will di directly upload it to the location where it has to be. It will give it, uh, give it the required permission so that my website is hosted. So as a user, I don't have to get into the nitty gritties of what kind of software has to be installed, what version of software has to be there. Everything is managed by AWS. I just upload my website and my website gets up and ready on a particular IP address. Okay, so this is platform as a service. It's a basically an automated version of infrastructure as a service where you get specific access on the server that you can just upload your files. There is nothing else that you can control on that server. That is platform as a service. The third kind of service that you get is software as a service. Right. What happens in software as a service is that in contrary to what you got uh, in infrastructure as a service where in Just a quick info guys. Test your knowledge of AWS by answering this question. Which of the following is the central application in the AWS portfolio? A. Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud B. Amazon Simple Queue Service C. Amazon Simple Notification Service D. Amazon Simple Storage and System Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to Interlipat to know the right answer. Now, let's continue with the session.
I did not get access to the server uh, or, or where, I, where I got access to the operating system of the server. I could install anything. I could make that server anything, right? Second thing was platform and servers where I got a dashboard where I can still upload my files and those files will be hosted for me. Uh, rest, everything else will be managed by AWS or the cloud provider on which uh, I'm taking this service from. Third kind of service is software as a service. Now, what is software as a service? You do not get access to a dashboard where you can upload your files. You do not get access to the server where you can do whatever you want on the operating system. What you do get is a software which has already been hosted on the cloud and that software you can use. The straight away example for this would be Netflix. So Netflix is a software, correct? It doesn't matter which server it is on. It doesn't matter whether you can upload your files or not, but you can use the software which is hosted on the cloud. That is software as a service. Software has been provided to you by the cloud provider to use as a service. And that service is a pay as you go service wherein you'll have to do a monthly subscription. Okay. Another example for this could be the Google Docs that you use. You use Google Excel or you use uh, Google uh, Word, right? All of those are softwares which are hosted on the cloud provider and you can use those softwares. It doesn't matter which server it exists on. It doesn't matter what kind of softwares are installed on that server. I just have one software that I can use and it has been hosted on the cloud. So that is software as a service. All right. So this is all about the different cloud models which exist, uh, which are offered to the customers, right? Moving forward, now let's talk about cloud providers. Now, whatever we have discussed so far is in general or is generic to cloud computing, right? Now, these kind of models or these business models that we just discussed have been adopted by various companies which are out there. Right. So companies like AWS is there. This is this is the most prominent one. Second is Microsoft Azure and then you have Google Cloud and there are 100 plus more uh, more companies which give you the same kind of services like uh, another famous cloud provider which comes on the top of my mind is DigitalOcean, which is there, right, which offers the same services just that the jargons that it uses for uh, giving you that service is different. The terminologies would be different, but at the back end, it's doing exactly the same thing, right? So uh, DigitalOcean is there, Joint is there, Telemark is there, IBM Cloud is there, a lot of cloud providers. But why are we, or why have I just showed you these three cloud providers? Because these are the three top cloud providers in the industry right now, which give the cloud uh, services, okay? I'll say 90% of the whole cloud paradigm is actually covered by just these three cloud providers, that is, People, if there are 100 people who are using the cloud computing in the world, out of them, 90 people would be using a service among these three only. Okay. Now, today in this session, we are talking just about AWS. But why are we only talking about AWS? Why are we not talking about the others? Let me walk you through the points. So guys, the number one reason for AWS being so popular is that it covers 35% of the market share uh, that is uh, using the cloud computing platform these days. That means that if there are 100 people who use cloud company, uh, computing or if there are 100 companies which use cloud computing, out of them, 35 companies would be using AWS, right? So that's what the 35% market share means. Second reason is that AWS was way back incepted in 2006 and since 2006, I think it's been 13 years. So since 13 years, AWS has been running the cloud computing business. And when AWS launched its cloud computing business, I guess it was the first and foremost cloud provider which went into the cloud computing domain and thought, okay, I can run a business on it. I guess back then there was no company which was providing cloud computing services except AWS. And that is the reason, you know, AWS has such a huge market share, which is 35%. If you compare it with Azure and Google Cloud, Azure is at 13%, 1.3, and Google Cloud is at 6.5%, right? So Azure is a number two cloud provider in the world and Google Cloud is at number three. So you can just judge by the distance between this 13% and 35% that how huge AWS is, right? And Microsoft Azure has to do a lot of catching up to basically beat AWS right now. And the point that I'm trying to make here is that the reason for that gap is because AWS was launched way back in 2006 and Azure was, I guess, launched in 2012, followed by Google Cloud in 2013, right? So that is the reason most of the companies were already on AWS when Google Cloud and Microsoft Azure came into the picture, all right? So 
Microsoft Azure has 13%, Google Cloud has 6.5%, AWS was launched in 2006, and that is the reason AWS has a more mature model of infrastructure. Now, why is that? Because any company or any product that you launch, it always has, so when the, the first time when it's launched, it always has a lot of bugs to it, and it's as and when the companies or your clients start to use it, you get to know, okay, so this is also a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem that you have to solve, right? And when you solve it, your product becomes more mature it becomes more reliable and since it's been 13 years now that Amazon has been in the game it has matured a lot and when we compare it with Google Cloud or Microsoft Azure they still have a long way to go already although they have uh, launched pretty good products but they still are no match to what AWS has in terms of reliability and that is the first and foremost reasons companies also have uh, you know they stick to AWS as their first choice because most of the companies that they see like we discussed we, we there has netflix there is uh airbnb there is amazon e-commerce company then you have prime video all of them are on aws and they're doing well right N none of them has experienced any downtime being on the aws platform so any company who's trying to launch their product into the market they also stick to aws reason being it's so reliable third reason that why we are learning aws today why you guys are learning aws today is because of the job opportunities so because it has a greater market share because there are more companies who are using aws obviously the job opportunities for aws are also more right when you compare it with its counterparts that is google cloud and microsoft azure so like i said if there are 100 companies and out of those 100 companies if 35 companies are using aws that means 35 companies you can apply on to become a solutions architect, to become an AWS developer, to become an AWS administrator, a cloud engineer, anything, right? So it's always better if you want to get into the cloud domain to first get to know the major player, right? And then obviously you can also learn Microsoft Azure. Once you have understood AWS, it's very easy to actually understand the other cloud platforms like Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud because they're almost the same. All of them are basically giving the same services just as the jargon or the terminologies that they use are a little different. All right, having said that guys, let's move on. And now that we have know that, you know, why AWS is so successful, we understand that why are we learning AWS today? Let me introduce you to what AWS is. So guys, AWS is basically a subsidiary of Amazon.com, which is basically the largest e-commerce company in the world, right? Uh, so the way AWS came up in the market was that Amazon, the largest e-commerce company, was building the infrastructure for its website, right? And they designed an infrastructure which was highly scalable, highly available, it can auto scale itself, it can, you know, downscale itself. So all of these things were part of their architecture of the Amazon website. Now, when they created an infrastructure like this, they thought, why are we only using it for our website? Why don't we make it available to the general public? And they can use it as long as they want in a pay as you go model. And that's how the cloud computing model or the cloud computing business came, uh, came into the uh, picture, right? So the same infrastructure that it was using for its website, it got or it made it introduced to the world to say like I am hosting my website or I'm using I'm hosting my Amazon e-commerce website on this infrastructure if you also want your application to be as successful as reliable as available as my website you can use the same infrastructure and you know what you just have to pay for the time that you used it and the cost is as low as 0. 0.0005 dollars isn't that amazing so that's how AWS came into the picture, right? And now today it offers services in compute, it offers services in storage, networking, management, security, and many more that we're going to discuss as we move along. All right, so this is the AWS story, guys. We we understand now that what is cloud computing. We understand now that the different kind of models that cloud follows. All of those things are followed by all the cloud providers. AWS is one of those cloud providers. And I told you the backstory of it, how it was launched, how it was in accepted and since it's the first player which came in the market it's very matured in terms of its services i think they have covered all their edge cases as to how our application can actually uh, not be of use to a particular company or can fail and they've covered all that so you can be rest assured that if you are deploying an application onto aws it is in safe hands all right moving forward guys now let's talk about the thing that we are here to learn for let's talk about the aws services let's see what kind of domains does aws gives its service 
AWS into. So AWS provides its services in compute. It gives in storage, database, security, management, customer engagement, app integration, etc. So we're going to discuss each one of them one by one as we move along. So first up, the compute domain or the AWS domain is compute. All right, so I think I have a question from Shubham. So Shubham is asking me among these domains, what is the difference between storage and database? All right, Shubham, so storage is basically used when uh, you, you have a workload wherein you want to upload binary files. Like what are binary files? Files uh, which like, like video files, or uh, or mp3 files or photo files all these files are called binary files because they're not data it's basically you know it's content and that content is basically binary in nature all right so all your videos all your music uh, right any kind of file which you execute your games all of those are binary files when you compare it with database database usually deals with data which is textual in nature and has a proper structure it could be unstructured as well but basically textual data that a human can read is included inside a database right but on the other hand files that run on computer for example any program or any video file any music file or any other file in that case these kind of things cannot or should be stored on a storage uh, kind of platform it should not be stored on a database it can be but it should not be because it unnecessarily makes the database the, the size of the database big which actually causes a problem when you're querying through the data when you're using a database all right so guys this is the difference between storage and database shubham is your doubt clear about what the difference between storage and database all right so i've got a yes from shubham others guys if you have any doubts in these domains you can ask me let me explain you all these domains one by one so compute domain uh, basically deals with servers so if you have uh, if you need servers or if there is a workload which needs processing the compute domain will have services that you can launch and implement that workload more on this we'll discuss as we move along all right then you have the storage domain which like i said is deals with storing binary files on the remote servers so for that we have a dedicated services and we're going to discuss those dedicated services in storage then we have a service called database uh sorry a domain called database in the uh, database domain you have a lot of services so if you have structured data you have one kind of database for that or we have one kind of database service for that if you have unstructured data you have another database service for that so we will discuss uh, more on that as we move along. Then uh, there is a domain called security. So all security related to the application that you have uploaded to the servers that you are using uh, to the account that you are using for all those kind of things would be included in security. So there are specific services for each kind of workload that I just mentioned. We're going to discuss that when we reach the security domain. Then we have the management domain, which would include monitoring, which would include uh, deploying the whole architecture at once, right? All those kinds of services comes in management. Don't worry if you don't understand it. I'll explain you more as you move along in that domain. Then we have customer engagement. So sending emails, sending notifications, all those kinds of services comes under customer engagement. And in the end, we have app integration. So services like queues, like for example, if you have an application on which you have to give a lot of jobs, it's better to have a queue where uh, you'll store all your jobs and that queue is separate from the server which will be executing your jobs, right? So these kind of integrations are called app integrations and we'll be discussing the services in that domain as we move along. All right. So guys, these were the domains, the, the main domains that are there in AWS. There are a lot of other domains as well, but we'll be focusing more on these domains since, you know, this is what is actually going to be asked for in your solutions architect exam. And at the same time, th these are what you will generally be using uh, when you become an AWS engineer. All right. All right. So moving forward, guys, now let's start with the compute domain and let's see what all services are there in the compute domain. All right, guys, so let's discuss the AWS services in the compute domain. So here are the set of services which are included in the compute domain of AWS. So this particular service is EC2, Elastic Beanstalk, Lambda, Autoscaling, AWS Load Balancer, AWS ECR, and AWS ECS. Now, for the sake of explaining you guys i've taken the liberty of shifting some services from some other domains which i think should fit in this domain right 
but you don't have to worry the explanation would be the same it's just that you would find it somewhere else in the aws management console uh, like for example auto scaling would not be under uh, the compute domain it would be under some other domain i'll show you when we move on to the aws management console as to where you can find each and every service for now guys let's start with the first service which is aws ec2 and let's see what is it all about so guys elastic compute cloud is nothing but a server it's a raw server it's just like a fresh computer that aws gives to you so what you basically do is you ask aws for server right and that server uh, service is called ec2 so what you what you do is you specify the kind of processor that you want you specify the kind of ram that you want and then you click on launch and what happens after that is you get a server which is basically of that exact configuration now what you do you will have to connect to it remotely so if it's a linux machine you will connect through ssh if it's a windows machine you will connect through rdp right and once you connect to it it will give you the ui of how an operating system actually is if you installed it on your local it will be exactly the same it's just that now it has been in, uh, basically launched on the infrastructure of aws and that can be accessed using uh, various tools like the rdp tools or ssh tools i'm going to discuss more about ec2 i'm going to basically launch an ec2 instance in a moment but before that let's discuss all the services which are there in compute and then uh, we'll do that ec2 demo as well right so guys elastic cloud compute like i said it's just like a raw server that is given to you and on this raw server you can install anything you can make it anything you can basically build it a make it a web server you can make it a database server it can be anything right that is what ec2 is all about now in the diagram as you can see you can launch either a single ec2 instance or you can launch multiple ec2 instances you also have an option of launching uh, of creating a ec2 instance and then installing some softwares on it and then you can launch multiple copies of that particular ec2 instance so that you don't have to launch or you don't have to specify or you don't have to install all the softwares all over again you can create multiple copies of the ec2 instance again right and at some point of time if you feel you want to increase the configuration of your system you can also do that right let's say if my ram was 8 gb over here and then i want to make it 16 gb even that is possible in ec2 and that is why the name is elastic compute cloud elastic means that you can increase the size of the instance or decrease the size of the instance configuration as and when required right so guys this is was about elastic compute cloud or that is ec2 right our next service is elastic beanstalk now elastic beanstalk guys is an advanced version of ec2 how is it an advanced version of ec2 in ec2 what you could do was you could just launch a server right and then you can install softwares on it uh, you can make it a database server you can make it a web app web server you can make it anything right with elastic beanstalk you get certain restrictions on ec2 and there is a certain amount of automation involved so what is elastic beanstalk exactly elastic beanstalk basically is a web application server right you cannot install any other software on it it is a web application server on which you can upload your website and you don't have to install any software you don't have to do anything like i said uh, we 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 talked about what is infrastructure as a service what is platform as a service right so infrastructure as a service is ec2 okay where you get the whole server you get the access to the operating system etc elastic beanstalk is platform form as a service so in this what you get is a dashboard you don't ac get access to the operating system you don't get access to the softwares that you have to install on that uh, server right everything is pre configured all you do is you say that i need a php server it will launch a php server and it will give you a dashboard where you'll have a upload kind of a button you click on that upload button and you'll have to put or upload your website over there so once you have uploaded your website files they automatically go into the path where they have to go and all you have to now do is just go to that ip address or the domain name of that particular elastic beanstalk instance and you will be able to access your website if you compare it with what if the same thing you had to do on ec2 you'll have to first install the software then you'll have to upload the file using ftp because there's no dashboard to upload it so you'll have to download an ftp client connect to the instance upload your files like that in that particular folder and then if you go on to the ip address of the ec2 only then you'll be able to access the website with elastic beanstalk what they did was like if you have a use case where you have to deploy a web application 
you don't have to do all that manual stuff of installing the software of installing or, or putting your files on the server all you have to do is you have to open elastic beanstalk select the environment that you want to deploy and upload your website over there that's it right so it's an automated version of ec2 in which uh, you have certain functionalities of putting a website over there but there is a limitation that only it can be a application web application server right it cannot be a backend server for you elastic beanstalk is only used to deploy your websites guys remember that because the next service of ours is a little different from Elastic Beanstalk, right? And it also has some limitations. Our next service is AWS Lambda. Now, AWS Lambda, again, guys, is an automated version of EC2. It's an advanced version of EC2, but with some restrictions. Now, what are those restrictions? It cannot deploy an application. You cannot upload your website on it, and it cannot host an application for you. What is AWS Lambda? AWS Lambda is basically just used for doing your backend processing. Now, what is backend processing? You might wonder. So let me give you an example. Let's say you have an image processing application. So what do you do? You have a UI or you have a website through which you can upload an image. And what that uh, website does is it stores the image on its storage and then it reduces the size of the image right and then you can download it again now you might be wondering this is one website so ideally everything should be happening on one server in this case but that is not the case over here guys so what happens is your web application is on a separate server the processing happens on a different server right and aws lambda specializes in processing now why is aws lambda preferred for processing is because when you launch a server guys you have to select the configuration that you want right you have to select the processor you have to select the ram with aws lambda you don't have to specify any configuration you don't have to choose what server size should be for my application to cater to the workloads that are coming in AWS Lambda, what it does is it sees what kind of workload it is being given. It automatically scales up if it has to in terms of its configuration and then executes all your workload and gives the result to the server, which is the web application server where it has to give the result on the website. So basically only processing happens on AWS Lambda. Only website deployment happens on Elastic Beanstalk, right? And AWS gave us these two wonderful services so that we can create a distributed kind of an architecture wherein, you know, there is no fault. If there's a fault in one server, it's not like my whole application will go down. I have certain redundancies in place. I have distributed my work among multiple computer nodes so that even if one gets faulty, it's not like my application will go down. We'll discuss more on this as we move along and we talk about auto scaling. But guys, remember this, AWS Lambda is only used to run uh, your background code. AWS Elastic Beanstalk is only used to deploy a web application. EC2 can be used for anything. It's your own private computer. You can install any software, make it a backend server, make it a web application server, make it a database server for that matter. Do anything with it, right? That is what AWS EC2 is. Now, if you see the diagram over here, as you can see that, let's say there's an e-commerce application right and that e-commerce application there's a trigger for uh, basically buying something let's say you order a package right so when you order a package what happens on amazon that entry is made into the database so that entry is stored let's say in dynamo db which is a kind of database in aws right now what happens now once the data is stored in dynamo db you want to do some processing on that data and then go ahead and store it somewhere else right so once the data has been stored in DynamoDB, I need the processing to be done. Now, the, the one way to do it is you do everything on the same uh, server uh, where basically, um, let's say my package order confirmation happened on the web application, right? The web application server triggered this particular action that I have my package order is confirmed. And that's when it issued a command to store the data in DynamoDB. That is all done by my web application server. Now I can also, this server itself can also do the processing for DynamoDB and then store it on Redshift Warehouse. Let, but you know, the processing takes a lot of time. And that is the reason I differentiate my processing on a different server or I make my processing do happen on a different server so that there is no overhead on my website 
so that my website is not becoming slow irrespective of the fact that what kind of workload is running in my backend because that workload is being ma managed by AWS Lambda, right? So my website can be up and running. It will always be available to all the users irrespective of the fact how huge of processing I have to do, right? So that happens by AWS Lambda. One more thing guys, uh, one, one more cool thing about AWS Lambda is that whatever job you give to AWS Lambda, it's not one server which does a job. AWS Lambda takes a job, executes it in one server. If it gets one more job in the meanwhile, what it does is it launches a second server on which that job will be executed. Similarly, if there's a third job which is coming, it will be executed on a third AWS Lambda server. So that's how it works, right? And uh, once the processing is done, uh, you know, it can also give the communication back to the web application. And that's how you get the message that the operation is done. But what you don't understand is how many computers or how many servers are working in the back end, right? So now you know. So AWS Lambda, wrapping up guys. So AWS Lambda is used for uh, executing your back end code. AWS Elastic Beanstalk is used to deploy a web application. And AWS EC2 is a raw server, which you can use to make that server anything, right? It could be a web application, it could be a backend server, it could be a database server, etc. Our next service, guys, is load balancing. Now, why is what is load balancing basically, and why do we need this kind of a service? Now, guys, I told you that whenever we create a production grade application, we basically deal with distributed computing, right? So when we talk about distributed computing, we also talk have to talk about redundancies so that my application is highly available. Now, what does that mean imagine these three servers are your web application servers now if you just had one imagine you just had one in that case what will happen if my there is any kind of fault in this particular server my application will go down right so what i do i launch three exact copies of that server right and what happens in that case is if this server goes down my user can view my website on this server if both these servers goes down my website can be viewed on this particular server right but now you might be wondering how will the user know which server to go on, right? And that is exactly what a Elastic Load Balancer is all about. So Elastic Load Balancer, what it gives you is it will give you one domain to go on or it will give you one IP address to hit on. You hit that IP address and Elastic Load Balancer will automatically analyze where to send the requests. So the Elastic Load Balancer constantly keeps a check on all the instances which are running in your cloud environment and it sees which of them are healthy and which of them are unhealthy. If there is a server which becomes unhealthy, what your load balancer will do is it will stop routing traffic to that particular server, right? And it'll start routing server to uh, your traffic to other servers. And this is the main job of Elastic Load Balancer, which is to distribute traffic among all the healthy instances which are out there, right? Also one more uh, important thing over here is guys, it, if all the three servers are functioning in the healthy state, in what will it do in that case? So it will distribute the data equally among all the servers. Now you might be wondering how will that help? So let's say I just have one server over here with around 16 GB of RAM and let's say an i5 or an i7 processor, right? So it will be able to serve a limited amount of users. Let's say there are 10 people, right? So uh, who are there on the website, let's say the server will be able to serve 10 people. Now what happens if there are 20 people tomorrow? In that case, you always have to plan ahead and you have to keep more servers in your group so that or in your architecture so that if there is more traffic, my requests can go on the other servers so that the load is actually decreased on the first server, right? So what load balancer does is it will never make one server max out on its performance. It will always distribute the traffic equally among all the servers so that the processing or you know the overhead on any server does not go up and my application should not become slow right now you might be wondering that how do i do it do i constantly keep a check on how much traffic is coming on my website and accordingly deploy servers so that answer i will give you in my next service which is aws auto scaling so what is aws auto scaling it automatically scales up the number of servers based on how much traffic is coming onto those servers now how does it do that you can set a certain threshold let's say there are four instances which are running on my architecture so what i can teach auto scaling is that whenever the collective cpu usage goes beyond 80 percent launch one more instance in the group 
and the load balancer should now route the traffic to the new instance as well right so this is what auto scaling is similarly when the cpu usage goes collectively goes below 40 percent let's say decrease the size of my fleet decrease the size of my server fleet so in that case what i'll do is at the moment the collective cpu usage goes below 40 percent it will decrease the number of instances in your auto scaling group right and that's how it works guys and the auto scaling service cannot exist alone it always has to work in conjunction with aws load balancer why because if the size of the fleet is increasing if the size of the fleet is decreasing there should be an entity on top of it which will distribute the traffic equally among all the instances right so if you are making use of auto scaling you will always make use of aws load balancer on the other hand you can just make use of aws load balancer and you might not want to use auto scaling that is fine but if you're using auto scaling you absolutely have to use a load balancer for your traffic routing all right so this is what auto scaling is guys our next service is elastic container registry now what is elastic container registry for this guys you have to know what docker is right so if i have to give you a brief about what docker is docker is basically a tool using which you can launch operating systems in the minimum size possible so the minimum container size that i know of is 40 mb so what you can do is let's say we were talking about distributed computing right so in distributed computing what happens is each of your server plays a different part uh, in your application right so similarly what we can do is we can launch containers now what containers do is they act as a virtual server right but they take the minimum resources possible they take minimum space possible like i said 40 mb is the size of a container which holds an operating system right so in those containers you can deploy applications okay and these applications then run as if they were running on a separate server they are isolated from the operating system System on which the container is running i'm sorry guys if i cannot go in depth of what docker is right now because it's altogether a separate topic but you can understand it like this that it's basically a mini virtual computer that you can run in your system and ecr service basically what it does is it stores these containers in a repository like you have github for storing code you have ecr for storing your container images right for example like i said operating system 40 mb size the image has to be stored somewhere so it will be stored in ecr now if you want to run those images you have a service called ecs so what ecs does is it runs any docker image on the aws uh, infrastructure right and it orchestrates it in a way so that if if there is anything wrong with that container service that container service can again be launched now don't get confused guys with what we do in ec2 now you might have a question that i can launch multiple ec2 instances in spite of that why don't i launch just multiple containers because in that case what will happen is you're still the machine on which the containers are running that becomes node point of failure that means if there is anything wrong with that machine, any number of containers which are running on your particular system will go down, right? So this is also a redundancy that you can make in your architecture that you can also run applications on containers which are running on an auto scaling infrastructure that is a machine on which Docker is running. But if the uh, processing uh, or if the CPU gets an overhead, and the CPU processing increases, you can scale your machines and you can scale your containers as well, right? So if it's a little complex for you guys, you can just ignore this service, which is ECR and ECS. It's only for those guys who, who understand what Docker is. So guys, ECR is nothing but uh, it's a repository on which you can store container images and ECS is nothing but a service to run your Docker containers. If you don't know guys what Docker is, I'll just give you guys a link after this class. It's basically a video for introduction to Docker. It's a half an hour, 45 minutes video. You go through that and then again, you can go through this recording wherein you can find a description for what ECR and ECS is and that'll make more sense to you in that case. All right. So guys, we have discussed ECR we have discussed ECS all right guys so moving forward now let's go ahead and do some hands-on I think it's enough of theory for compute let's go ahead and launch some compute instances in AWS all right so what I'm gonna do is let me first show you how you can create your account in AWS first so let me just jump on to my browser just a quick info for all of you cloud enthusiasts 
If you want to make a career in AWS, then you might want to check out IntelliPath's AWS Certification Training Course for Solution Architect. Learn from industry experts through hands-on session, projects, and case study. Reach us out to know more. All right, guys. So the first thing that you would be doing is heading on to aws.amazon.com. Okay. So once you are on this website, you will see a big orange button over here, which says create an AWS account, right? Just click on that. And that will take you to the next screen wherein you will have to fill out your details. So fill out all your details over here, right? And once you have done that, let's say, let us enter some pseudo values. So let's say it's abc at intellipart.com password. I can set anything over here. Similarly, I'll set anything over here. AWS account name. Let's say it's intellipart hyphen test, right? We'll click on continue. Then it'll ask you whether, what is the account type? Is it a professional account or it is a personal account? So we'll select personal account because uh, we are just trying out AWS, right? So we want to use it for ourselves. Give some number. Let's say I give boot one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the country or region, you can select any region that you are in. Your address, uh, the city that you are in, postal code. So let's say the city is Bangla. State, let's say it's Kanatka. And once everything seems fine to you, just click on click create account and continue. Once you do this, you will reach this screen where you'll have to enter your debit card number or credit card number, right? Enter everything over here and click on secure submit. Once you've done that, the next page will ask you uh, what kind of account do you want to create? Is it a business account or a, a standalone account? What what purpose will you use this account for just it's all logical you just know what you have to answer just remember this you are creating a personal account and it's nowhere related to a business select everything click on finish and you will have a new aws account created for you now one awesome thing about aws guys is that it will give you free tier that is you can launch instances free for one year right and every account that you create on aws or when you sign up on aws you'll get a one year free tier account where you can launch a certain ec2 instance for free and that too for 750 hours a month so 750 hours is actually 30 days and that too for one year right so one year of free instances you can launch so i'll show you guys how you can launch instances as well but this is how you can sign up for aws so once you have signed up for aws guys Next thing would be to basically log in, right? And for that, you'll have to, once you go to aws.amazon.com, just click on AWS Management Console and it'll take you to the sign-in page, okay? So on the sign-in page, just enter the email address that through which you want to connect. One second, guys. So this would be the email address that I want to enter, followed by the password, and this will, make you sign in into AWS. So this is a step that you should reach once you have completed your sign up. Okay. And now what I want to do is I want to launch my first server on AWS. Now, how will I do that? So we, we have studied about the EC2 instance, right? So for launching the EC2 instance, here is the domain. So the domain that we went through was compute. Right. So in compute, you have these many services. You have EC2, ECR, ECS, then you have Lambda, Elastic Beanstalk. There are other services as well. We have not touched those services because they would go beyond the scope of what we intend to do in this session. This session is an overview for AWS, for an AWS solutions architect, right? So the services that we have picked up, there are, there are all the basic services that you should know about. And once you understand all those services, understanding the rest of AWS would be a cakewalk for you, right? So there are so many services in AWS, you have uh, ground station, security, have artifact, you know, uh, if you're into game development, then you have Amazon game lift. But all these services are basically confined to a certain kind of work that you want to do. Like I am not going to develop a game, right? Or I'm not into gaming or I'm not into game development. So this service is not for me. Similarly, there are IoT services that you have to know of, but IoT, not every company would use IoT, correct? Some companies would use IoT and for you to learn the IoT service, it would be a waste of time for you, 
right and that is why what we have done is we have picked up some services which are essential and which most of the organizations will use who are into it and want their application up and ready and we have just selected those applications right or those services also your aws solutions architect exam would be confined to only these services that we are learning all right now what we wanted to do was we want to launch our first server and for that there is a service called ec2 so either you can find it under the domain compute that is ec2 over here or you also have an awesome option over here to search for any kind of service let's say i want to launch uh, or i want to go to ec2 so i can just write ec2 in the search bar and i will get the respective result over here let's click on that and now this link would basically open your ec2 dashboard right so from here you can launch your first ec2 instance there are a lot of options on the left guys do not worry about each of these options these are options that we will be studying about when we purposefully just talk about ec2 service and that will be in the further sessions uh, that we're going to have for now just understand how to launch an ec2 instance and for that you just have to click on this blue button which is here which says launch instance just click on that once you've clicked on launch instance you will get an option to select the operating system that you want to run in your server right so there are a lot of operating systems to choose from you have the amazon linux ami which is a custom linux that aws has created then you have red hat uh, os that you can run you have suze linux you have ubuntu there are a host of operating systems that you can run from your windows as well right so you choose whichever whichever you want and always ensure you choose an operating system which says free tier eligible which would mean that it will fall under the free tier and it will not be charged for you okay so let's say i select the ubuntu server i'll click on select and now it will ask me what is the size of the server that you want how much of cpus do you want how much of memory do you want so the only server so there are a lot of options over here to choose from right but the only server that is free for you would be t2.micro okay which has one cpu and one gb of ram which is enough for demo purposes when you want to try out aws okay so you would select t2.micro if you want to be under the free tier and not be charged so just select t2.micro next you will click on next and then it will ask you for all the details that are over here do not worry about anything just leave them blank click on next next step would add ask you for the hard drive storage how much of hard drive storage do you want so by default it's 8 gb when you're launching a linux instance so we leave it at default if you want you can change this right uh, then click on next you can add tags over here what are tags tags are nothing but metadata to your instance right like for example i can say the name i can add a tag that the name of the instance is something then the department to which this instance belongs to is there so all those values i can write over here and those will serve as a metadata for the instance so that when somebody is searching for all the ec2 instances for let's say the it department they just have to type in department equal to it and list all the instances so for those kind of searches you have tags click on next then it will give you the option of configuring your security group what is a security group it's nothing but a firewall it's a very simple firewall guys in this what you have to tell is so basically the, the, all these rules that you can add over here these are all inbound rules right so inbound means what kind of connections are allowed on this server so there's a ssh connection which is allowed right so you can select the protocol that you want to allow on this server right so uh, right now what has been allowed is the ssh protocol so that we can log into this server ssh means that right if you select ssh it will fill out all the details for protocol and port range by itself now whom do you want the ssh protocol to be used by right if you want it to be accessed by anyone you can just give anywhere why is this option helpful this option is helpful when the ip address of your computer is not fixed let's say you can access this instance from office but you also wanted to access it from home as well right so if you want to access it from home then you have to select anywhere if your ip address is not changing you can select my ip right let's say this is my ip address right now and only i will be allowed to connect to this instance using the ssh protocol but it's the generic use case that everyone deals with is that they want to log in from anywhere right so i'll select anywhere it fills the data by itself and now finally i can just click on review and launch so if you want to delete a rule guys since in this rule i did not define anything i can just delete this from here and now let me click on review and launch okay so now i can review all the settings that i have done 
Once I feel everything is correct, I'll just click on launch. And this is a very important step, guys. Now, to log into any server which is there on the remote system, imagine like if somebody gets your IP address, anybody can access that server and they can make any change that they want, right? But it's obviously not like there's a security layer that we add or which AWS has added to the servers that it launches. It gives you a key pair, right? What is a key pair? A key pair is nothing but it will give you a key that you will have to use while you're connecting to the instance. Okay, so as you can see, there's no key pair right now. So what I can do is I can create a new key pair. Let's name this key pair as let's say test hyphen IntelliPath. Let's say this is the name, correct? I will click on download key pair. So until unless I don't create a new key pair, it'll, this launch instance button will not be active. So this will download a PEM file for you. This is a file which is of the PEM extension, right? So this will be used to connect to our instance. And finally, when everything is set, let's click on launch instance. So now you can see your instances are now being launched. This is a message that you're getting. So I can just go to the instance and see that, okay, so there's an instance being in launch. The instance state is pending, which means it's still in the launch process. I can give this instance a name. Let's call it test. Okay. And now it's in the running state. Great. So now once you have selected test, you can refer to all the details of test in the below panel. So here is the IP address, which will be used to connect to it, right? The instance type, which is t2.micro, the state, which is running, right? Then you have the security group. So view inbound rules, you can see there's a SSH rule that you have added over here, right? And then the next step would be that what is the key pair name for this instance? It's test in telepart, so on and so forth, right? Now that you have launched the instance, the next step is to connect to it. Now, when you want to connect to this instance, there's a software called Putty that you can download, right? So here's a software that I've already downloaded. If you want to download this, just search on Google for download Putty. You will get this link, go to this link, right? Now guys, there are two things that you have to download. One is you have to download Putty, which you can use by clicking on this link. It will take you on this page. Just select, if you're on Windows, just select Putty 64-bit. Just click on it and it will be, it'll basically download the Putty software for you. The other thing that you'll have to download is Putty Gen, right? This is also required. I'll tell you why it is required. So this is basically Putty Gen and the other software that you need is Putty, okay? So once you have both the softwares in place and you have installed both the softwares, next step would be to connect to our instance. So this software of mine is Putty Gen, let me launch it for you. This is Putty Gen, guys. The PEM file that you get, guys, if you have to use it with Putty, the way you can use it is by converting this PEM file first to PPK because that is what your Putty software would accept, right? So first, I'll have to load this file on my Putty Gen, so let us do that. So I'll click on load and then I'll select the PEM file, which is this. It says successfully imported, great. Now I want to save the private key. If I save the private key over here, you it will ask you, are you sure you want to save this key without a passphrase? Yes, right? And let's name this private key something. Let's name it, let's say, test. So as you can see, the format now is being changed to PPK, great. Let's save the file. The file has been saved. Next step is launch your putty software. Right, this is my putty software. The instance that I want to connect is this. This is the IP address that I want to connect to. I'll mention it over here. Then I'll go to SSH. Because I've mentioned the IP address in the session part. Now I also have to put the key using which I will connect, right? So for putting the key, you have to go into SSH. Then you'll be clicking on auth. In auth, I have to select the PPK file which I created. So this is the file, test. Let's select that and let's click on open. So now it will give you a message that the server host key is not cached in the repository. Just click on yes on this message. And now you will see the screen which says login as, right? So now since I was launching an Ubuntu instance, what I have to enter over here is Ubuntu. I'll hit enter and now it will verify the key that I inserted and it will be able to connect to the putty to the server that I created on AWS using the key that I put right and now i'm logged in on my server now i can do anything over here i can install any software that i want so this is how you can connect to an ec2 instance which has launched a linux ami or linux os okay for connecting to windows guys you do not get a pem file you do not get a pem file what you basically get is an rdp file along with the password okay
So you will be given the password, you will be given the username, you will be given a RDP file. So you select the RDP file and then it will ask you for the password. Just enter the password that was given to you by the AWS management console. You click on connect and then you will be able to launch a Windows instance. So there are only two types of OS that you can launch on uh, AWS. One is Linux, second is Windows. So I told you how to connect to Linux instances. Uh, let me also walk you through how to connect to a Windows machine. All right, guys. So now to in order to launch a Windows instance, again, we'll just click on launch instance. We'll let's select a Windows OS, which is free tier eligible. Let's select this, right? T2.micro is the instance that we want to launch. Let's click on next. Let's leave everything at default. Let's click on next. Here you can see the default size is 30 GB because in Windows, uh, it takes a lot of space. So it's 30 GB over here. Let's click on next. Configure the security group. Here you can see uh, that instead of SSH, you have RDP, right? Because uh, for Linux instance, because it's a command line, what you do is you collect through SSH. But because Windows is a GUI based OS, you have to connect through RDP, all right? So we'll click on review and launch. And now we'll select the same key pair, which is there. And let's click on launch instances. So our instance is now launched, guys. We can just go here and we can see it's in the pending state. All right, so let's name this instance as Windows. All right, and now in order to connect to it, this is the IP address that you get. Now just click on actions. So select the machine that you have to connect with. Once it's launched, you'd be able to click on actions and you'd be able to click on connect. So in the connect, uh, so when you click on connect, you will get all the options of how to basically connect to this particular server. So let's wait for this instance to be in the running state and then let's review. Okay, so the instance is now in the running state guys. Now let's click on actions. Let's click on connect. And this is basically the way to connect to it. You can download the RDP file by clicking over here. So as you can see, I got the RDP file. The username is administrator. And if I click on get password, it says password not available yet. Uh, please wait at least four minutes after launching an instance. Okay, so the password will be available once uh, the instance is four minutes since launch. But this is the way you get the password. Okay, now if I click on the RDP file, it will directly give me this kind of a window where it will say, are you sure you want to connect to it? Let's click on connect. And now it is asking for the password. So all you have to do now is wait for the password to be available over here. Right. And uh, once the instance is ready, you'll get the password here. Once you have the password, just put the password over here, click on OK, and you should be able to connect to your Windows instance. So let's give it the time. Let's wait for this instance to get in the running or uh, in the password state. And then we'll just enter the password here and click on OK. And let's see how it goes. All right, guys. So let's try now. So I just click on actions. I click on get Windows password. I get this page. Now what I have to do is I have to choose the key pair path. So in this PEM file will work. So I'll just enter the test and telepath.pem. Remember the PEM file will work and not the PPK. Let's click on open and now let's click on decrypt password. So guys, this is the password for connecting to my instance. Let's copy it, go to our instance. Let's paste it over here and now let's click on OK. Um, now it says the identity of the remote computer cannot be verified. It's okay. Just click on yes. And now you should be able to connect to your server. So here you go guys. Here is a server launched on AWS for you. It's a fresh server. You can do anything that you want on this, right? You can install any kind of tool on this. You can make it a database server, make it a web server. You can make this server anything. Okay. So guys, this is how you can connect to a Windows instance. I've showed you how you can connect to a Linux instance as well, right? This also, you can install any software on this server and it can become anything for you, right? Now, let's go ahead and come back to our slides. All right, guys, so I've showed you how you can connect to an EC2 instance. We got to know how to connect to a Linux instance. We got to know how to connect to a Windows instance, right? And let's talk about the other services as well. So let me come back to my dashboard. So like I told you guys, EC2 is a infrastructure as a service where you get access to the operating system, right? Now there is a service called Elastic Beanstalk and there's a service called Lambda. Let's look at Elastic Beanstalk. How is the dashboard? Look for Elastic Beanstalk. 
right? So as you can see, it says welcome to AWS Elastic Beanstalk and it says just select a platform, upload an application and run it. That's it. You don't have to connect through SSH to that instance in order to install the software and get your application ready, right? So as you can see, when I said get started, it gives me create a web app, right? So you can only create a web application here. It will not act as your backend server, right? It can only host application. So let's give it an application name. Let's say it's test. Okay. And then let's choose a platform platform. What do I want that software or that web app to run? So I can put my web app in .NET. I can put my web app in Go. I can put my web app in PHP. It's all my choice. So let's click on PHP, right? And the application code, let's have the sample application first. And now let's click on create application. So these are all the settings that you have to do guys, nothing much, right? And now it will start to create your Elastic Beanstalk. It will not give you an access to the operating system. Remember this guys, you will not get an access to the operating system. All you will get is a dashboard on which you can upload your website and it will be hosted for you. When I created the EC2 server, I could not do anything on it. I had to install the software. Then I had to put my application on it and only then I'll be able to access it but in this case everything is done automatically i can just upload my code and that's it all right so let's wait for this to be ready and then we'll go forward all right guys so as you can see my elastic beanstalk is now ready and now if i go to this particular url which elastic beanstalk has given me you'll be able to see the web app, right? This is a sample application which has been deployed. I can click on upload and deploy and just I have to choose a file, click on deploy and that website will get deployed automatically over here. I will just go to this link, refresh it and my website will be visible over there. So I guess now you know when I said that you just get an access to a dashboard, you're actually not getting an access to the whole operating system, right? You do not have a control on that. All right, let us look at Lambda as well. So let's see what happens if I click on Lambda. All right, so when I click on Lambda guys, this is the dashboard that you get. And as you can see, it just says uh, run. So if I run it, it says hello world, right? You just have to enter the code here. It will give you the output. That's all what Lambda is. It will not host your application. It can just give you textual outputs in the form of JSON or in the form of textual content. It can just give you that. Okay. Now, if I change something over here, let's make it hello world one, two, three. If I run it, it says hello run world one, two, three. So if you want to create a function, just click on create a function over here. Author from scratch, use a blueprint, browse serverless app repository. You can just see if uh, there's any code that you want to take from what has been done before. You can do it from here that browse serverless app repository, use a blueprint. Here you have a lot of uh, blueprints, which most of the companies use, right? So you don't have to write the whole code from scratch. You can just click the blueprint that you want. For example, it's a microservice HTTP endpoint that is you just have to hit on the API and it'll give you the result. If that is the kind of Lambda function you want, you can also do that, right? Then you have Kinesis, Firehose, Syslog to JSON. There are a lot of things over here. Don't get confused with all the jargons used over here, right? This you will be able to get once you have a hang of all the services in AWS, which we will teach you in the upcoming sessions, right? For now, you just understand what Lambda does, right? Lambda, you give the code, it'll run the code. That is it. It will not host an application. Elastic Beanstalk, it will host the application for you. And EC2, you can do anything. You can also configure your EC2 server to uh, basically become AWS Lambda, but you'll have to manually install all the softwares and then you'll be able to do that job. So I guess hope guys that you are now clear with the basic services of the compute domain of AWS that is EC2, Elastic Beanstalk, Lambda. Auto scaling and load balancing, uh, we will do it as we move along in the sessions because that requires you to know a little bit more, right? So let's move on and come back to our PPTs and let's start with our next domain now. All right guys, so our next domain is the storage domain in AWS and let's See what all services do we have in the storage domain so guys these are the important services that we have in the storage domain of aws our first service is amazon s3 then we have amazon glacier amazon efs and aws storage gateway so let's look at these services one by one and understand what they do 
So guys, S3 is an object storage service, uh, which basically means that all the files which are uploaded on the S3, uh, they are basically regarded as objects. Objects for us as layman users, they don't differ much. I mean, uh, you won't see the difference in terms of when you're using the file or downloading the file that, you know, it was a file before and now it's an object. Object basically is at the back end. That is how you store a file is in the form of an object right so it's basically on the infrastructure side that it makes a difference that each file in an s3 bucket acts as an object right now why do we use s3 why do we need a storage service right is because like we have discussed previously that we need distributed systems uh, on an application the more distributed it is the more fault tolerant it becomes when i say fault tolerant basically it can tolerate faults in its nodes each node in the application whether it be the storage node the compute node it could be the backend compute node the database node each of these node if they fail right it can tolerate that failure in your application can still be working okay so amazon s3 is a file storage system by aws which says that it will give you the availability of 99.99 percent .99 times that means only there's a 0.01 percent probability that you know your service is going to fail otherwise 99.99 .99, it's actually not 99.99 .99, it's 99.9999 four times nine right that is the kind of availability that AWS guarantees that your object will have and obviously you can increase this SLA this basically called a SLA service level agreement that what kind of service will AWS provide to you you can further increase this SLA by providing redundancies by using certain techniques wherein you can take a backup of your bucket at every 24 there is a data corruption you can always get that data back you know from the vaults and then store it back again in the bucket but that is only when you have failure in the s3 service and for that i told you the probability is 0.0001 percent okay that is the kind of service that aws provides so you can be rest assured that if you, if you want to host files on aws if you and if you host it on s3 your files will be available pretty much all the time right that is what you have s3 for now what are the common use cases where you will be using aws s3 uh, you can imagine it like this that if there is a website wherein the logo is there if there are certain images on that website that have to be loaded at the time of a web page reload all those images will be taken from s3 and will be presented over there right so rather than storing all these files on the server on which the website exists you can store all these files all these images on s3 and then you can can just get it from there right s3 also provides you the facility of hosting static web files right so you can host a website also by using an s3 bucket and all you have to do is enable static hosting on that bucket and you will be able to host static websites in that case all right our next service guys is aws glacier so aws glacier is an extended version of uh, the s3 service which is the glacier does not give you a direct access to itself it basically takes a backup of the s3 service so let's say you created a folder in s3 so a folders in s3 are basically called buckets right the root folder in s3 is called bucket so if you have a bucket and you have a lot of files inside that bucket and if you want to take a backup of all those files you can take it using the glacier service in aws right and glacier service the reason we have two services over here uh, the reason for that is that s3 you can get the objects instantaneously the moment you put the link of the object you can download it right you can access it but when we talk about glacier it takes time for the object to be retrieved it takes sometimes takes times an hour sometimes two or three hours to retrieve a file in amazon right so that is the kind of service that glacier is and it's a backup service and it's also cheap so the main difference between s3 and glacier is that if you are taking a backup in glacier it'll be very very cheap i think it'll be one tenth of the cost of the same size of files which exist on amazon s3 the reason for that is glacier is strictly a backup service and because it is low priced because of that there are some 
compromise in then its performance wherein the time to retrieve the object it takes time right it takes 2 3 hours to retrieve an object in amazon glacier when you compare it with amazon s3 it's instantaneously and that is why even the price is higher on the s3 service more about pricing we will talk as we move along in the session right but right now it is very important to understand the functionalities of these services right so why do we use aws s3 for hosting our files and those files can then be retrieved on whatever application we want it's basically anywhere on the internet if you put that link you will be able to download that file so that is what aws s3 is for you if you want to take a backup of aws s3 then you can use aws s3 glacier which will help you to take backup of any buckets or files which are there in your s3 inside it right after glacier guys the, the other service that we're going to discuss is efs so what is efs efs service is again a storage service but it's different from s3 how is it different from s3 that efs service can be mounted on your operating system as a volume right isn't that interesting so you can mount amazon efs as a volume on any computer on the aws network right so you let's say you launch a server of windows on aws and you feel that you know you need a network drive if you guys have worked with network drives then efs is exactly a network drive it mimics the usage of a network drive right and it's also scalable that means the size increases as and when you need it right so that is scalable it is it can be attached to multiple computers that is it can serve you as a shared drive that is it there could be tens of hundreds of computer which have the same volume inside them and that same volume would be efs for you so how does that help that helps when you have a scalable architecture when there where there are seven or eight systems and whatever changes one system is doing that has to be seen by the other system as well so in those kind of cases you use efs wherein they will have a common drive on which the data will change dynamically no matter which server is changing it all the changes will be available on the other servers as well and that is what efs is for you guys right so efs can be mounted on windows machine it can also be mounted on linux machines and the way you use it is i just told you it acts as a shared drive and where do you use it you use it where you want shared data between multiple servers which are working in an architecture all right so that is what efs is for you guys then our next service is aws storage gateway so it basically helps you to connect an on premises system to the aws cloud infrastructure so if there is any storage application which is there on your on premise systems and you want it to be connected to the aws infrastructure you will be using the aws storage gateway service all right so guys this was all about the storage domain in aws let us quickly jump on to our aws management console so i'll show you a few of the services in aws that way so let me jump on to my management console all right guys so here i am on my management console uh the first service that we discussed was under storage which was s3 so let's click on the s3 link and that will give you ui which will look something like this so i have some buckets already configured you can create a new bucket so like i said bucket is nothing but the root folder where you put all your files right so let's say the bucket name is test hyphen in telepath right this is the bucket name then the region that i want to put this is let's say i want to put it in oregon region and that's it let's click on next and keep all versions of an object in the same bucket leave everything at default just click on next leave everything at, def at default and now let's just click on create bucket all right so my bucket is now created i can go inside this bucket and i can upload files over here let's try to upload a file let's click on upload let's click on add files let's go to pictures and then let's try to upload something let's go to documents let's say i want to upload a file and let's say i upload this particular file okay so this is the file that i want to upload i'll just click on next it will now upload it click on next again here are the uh, so this is basically the types of classes that you can access, right? Uh, do you want to access, uh, put it in S3? You want to archive the data, put it in Glacier? All those you can do. Let's click on next and click on upload. So right now we have not changed any setting in S3, right? We are just uploading an object. And as you can see, my file is now uploaded over here, right? Now, if I select this file, I can actually see the properties of this file via this link, right? Here's an object URL that you get. If I click on this object URL, it will say access denied. Why access denied? Because first I have to make that object as public. So for that, what I have to do is I'll be going into 
properties right and over here i will go to permissions and then i will go into public access right so right now it says you can't grant public access because block public access settings are turned on let's go ahead and remove those things so i'll just go to amazon s3 click on the bucket and then uh, let us click on permissions and in this permission i want to edit block all public access i've done that let's save this thing and to confirm these settings just type confirm hit and confirm and my settings are now done now let's go back to overview this is my object right and if i refresh this it says still there's access denied now what i'll do is i'll go to permissions and now i'll give public access so i want to give read object to everyone let's click save now if i go to the website hit refresh i can see the image over here now this link anybody who has access to this link will be able to see this image so you can also embed this link in your website and you will be able to load that page on your website just like that right so this is what the link does this is what the link is all about so if you upload an object guys and you want to make it public just go to the permissions of that particular object make it as yes and you're set all right so this is how you can read from s3 all right guys so now let's start off with efs so i'll just click on the efs service on my aws management console i will reach this page where i will have an option to create a file system let's click on that and now it will ask me for the vpc that i want my efs to be created in now remember guys the vpc that you select here should be the same as the instances on which you want to mount the efs volume so for right now it's vpc 4b5 a233 let's click on next step right uh, leave everything a default guys don't touch anything else let's create the file system now all right guys so my file system is now being created now remember guys the security groups that are attached to this particular efs drive has to be the same as well for your ec2 instances okay so how to check which security group is this efs drive mounted on you can check that by you can check it over here in this table so right now it is in creating state so once it is available you will have the security groups listed over here okay now since my efs is going to take some time to set up let me show you the instances that i've launched so i have two instances one is ubuntu and the other is ubuntu 2 i'm going to mount the same efs volume which i've created over here to basically connect to these two instances right now how to do that first i will click on let's connect to our ubuntu instance let's connect to this ubuntu instance first so this is the ip address and i guess i've already connected to this ip address 172 31 51 195 this is the private ip address for the ubuntu instance and this is the same right so even this is the same so let's close the extra terminal from here and now let's connect to our second ubuntu instance as well so this is the ip address guys let's copy it let's launch a new putty console let's paste the ip address let's select the ppk and let's click on open for clarity let us change the colors of the terminal let's make it orange so that we can differentiate between the first instance and the second so as you can see the ip address for this is 172 31 51 17 and the ip address is same over here as well so that means we have two ubuntu servers that are now open on my putty terminal and what we will be doing is we'll be connecting this efs mount point to my ubuntu instances so this is a security group guys 7f087236 now we'll have to ensure that both my instances have that security group associated with it right so if we have to check the security group for my ubuntu instance here it is guys the security group which you'll have to connect so what you will be doing is you'll going will be going to networking you'll go to actions go to networking and click on change security groups so as you can see it is only launch visit one has been connected to it my security group that i have to connect is 7f087 so this is the security group that i have to connect to my instance so let's connect both of them right 
and now let's click on assign security groups so my ubuntu instance is now connected to the security group of my efs let's do this to our second instance as well let's select the default security group that is there great so now both my instances are connected to the security group of my efs right now what i'll be doing is i will be following a set of instructions that you will find on this console as well right so the first thing that you have to do is on an ubuntu instance you will have to install this package let's do that so this is my first instance let me copy the command and it is already installed great let's do the same on our second instance as well so let's first update the machine sudo apt get update all right once it's updated the next step would be to run that command now let's run that command and my nfs common package will install over here right now what i can do is i can create a directory on my first instance let's the directory be efs test okay great and let's create a directory here as well let's name it as efs test 2 okay now what i'll be doing is i'll be mounting my efs volume so for mounting it just copy this command go back to your server paste the command and put the directory name so in case of my first instance the directory name is efs test let's hit enter great so efs test directory is now connected to my EFS volume. We'll verify whether that is working or not, right? Let's similarly copy the command over here as well. And this would be EFS test two. This is the directory name. Great. So even this instance is now connected to EFS. Let's go into EFS test two. Great. Now, as you can see, if I do an LS over here, there's no file, right? Similarly, if I do an LS over here, there's no file. Let's create a one.txt file. Let's put sudo. Great. If I do an LS, you can see there's a one.txt file over here. If I do a ls over here, you can see there's a one.txt file here as well. That means this is a shared volume, correct? If I create, let's say one more file over here, if I do an ls over here, I can see the two.txt is also available. Similarly, I can create a file from here as well. And if I do an ls over here, I can see that the 3.txt file is also present. So the guys, this is how EFS works. It acts as a shared drive between multiple instances in AWS. All right. So let's come back to our slides guys now. AWS was introduced in 2006. And since then, they have been the largest player in the public cloud market. According to Forbes, AWS grew $4.3 billion revenue just in the second quarter of 2021. The top three companies who offer cloud services in terms of market share are Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud Platform. AWS by itself covers 32% of the public cloud market share. So what exactly is AWS? Amazon Web Services or AWS is a cloud service provider owned by Amazon. It offers cloud services in compute storage, database, content delivery, networking, and other domains. Most of the offerings from AWS are infrastructure as a service offerings, but it also offers PaaS service such as Elastic Benstock and Lambda, which are popular and highly used services. AWS offers you all the necessary tools you would need to set up your IT infrastructure without paying any upfront. For example, Netflix, the world's biggest premium video streaming service, is completely hosted on AWS for its application needs. The world's largest e-commerce company, Amazon, is also hosted on the AWS infrastructure itself. When you see such big players in the respective fields rely on AWS for their infrastructure needs, you as an individual user can trust and be inclined towards AWS for your cloud needs. AWS offers a wide range of services that can be categorized into the following. We have compute and network services, storage and content delivery services, security and identity services, database services, analytic services, application services and management tools. Now we have few applications of AWS. What are they? Let's look into it. The first one we have is storage and backup. That's Amazon's cloud storage is an easily accessible and useful services for business. 
Next we have Enterprise IT. That's Amazon Cloud Services offer the ideal solution to enterprise IT's time consuming pace. Mobile, web and social applications. AWS can launch and scale various applications like mobile applications and SaaS applications. Big data. AWS and big data work well with each other to come up with the power and infrastructure necessary to meet the needs of high end intelligent software. Websites can be hosted on AWS cloud. It is also good for hosting CDNs and DNS and domains. In gaming, AWS makes gaming applications easily available to the worldwide gaming network and provides gamers the best experience in online gaming across the globe. Now, how much salary does a AWS engineer earns? In India, it earns on an average basis 7 to 13 lakhs per annum, while in USA on an average basis he or she can earn $137,000. The reason why Amazon is so huge is because of AWS along with its retail arm. The cloud service has a very high revenue and is growing rapidly. Now did you know that AWS IaaS cloud is 10 times greater than the 14 competitors of AWS combined? Now this speaks volumes about the strong capabilities that this service possesses. Just a quick info for all of you cloud enthusiasts. If you want to make a career in AWS, then you might want to check out IntelliPath's AWS Certification Training Course for Solution Architect. Learn from industry experts through hands-on session, projects and case study. Reach us out to know more. So guys, we have successfully discussed. We discussed what S3 is. We discussed what Glacier is. We discussed what EFS is. And we have discussed what Storage Gateway is. Our next set of services are belong to the database domain. So let's go ahead and understand these services. So the first service. So guys, the database domain comprises of these many database services in AWS. The first AWS services that service that I have is Amazon RDS. Then we have Amazon DynamoDB, Amazon Redshift, and in the end, Elastic Cache. So let's understand these services one by one, starting off with Amazon RDS. So guys, Amazon RDS is nothing but a relational database service. Guys, it's not a database, it's a database service. What do you mean by that is that you will, in under the RDS service of AWS, you can launch these many databases. You can launch the Microsoft SQL Server, you can launch the MySQL Service, you can launch the Oracle SQL, PostgreSQL, MariaDB, Amazon, or you can launch all these databases but what is RDS for RDS basically manages these databases now how does it manage it will make sure that it takes automated snapshots of all these databases which will be corresponding to a particular time it can also ensure that uh, if there are any read replicas required uh, or if there are any replication required in your database that also can be taken care of RDS uh, or by RDS third thing is it also takes care of any security patch which has to be applied on your database database if you enable automatic updates right so this is how rds works guys now again uh, let me emphasize on the point that rds is not a database it's a relational database service in which you can launch all these relational databases all right so i guys i hope rds is clear with you next service is amazon dynamo db now, what is Amazon DynamoDB? It's basically a NoSQL database by Amazon, right? And what is a NoSQL database? Whenever you have to store unstructured data, that is data which does not follow a particular format, you use unstructured database like DynamoDB. Now, alternatives to this, you might have seen or you might have heard about MongoDB or you might have heard about other NoSQL databases. This Amazon DynamoDB is a NoSQL database by Amazon. Amazon, right? So there is no database that it supports. It itself is a database unlike RDS. And in this, you can store unstructured data. Okay. Third service is guys, Amazon Redshift. So Amazon Redshift is a data warehouse service, which basically what it does is under the data warehouse, you will have multiple databases. So those databases can be queried by your warehouse. And it looks as if the whole, all the databases, they combine together to give one database where all the 
data exists, but it is actually not like that. Amazon Redshift comprises of multiple database engines, which it can connect to and give the output as required. Next service is Amazon Elastic Cache. So Elast Amazon Elastic Cache basically is a service which serves as a cache. So what is a cache? A cache is a layer between the client and the web server or the server from which the uh, information is being requested. What happens is, let's imagine you want to get the data for an employee whose salary is greater than 10,000 and you basically want to get all the current cities that the employees are staying in, right? Now, let's say you do this query time and again. Now, what happens? Your server is again and again doing a query on the database uh, using a particular query that this is the data that I want. Now, what happens is when again and again you're doing the same query, it does not make sense to run the same query again on the database, let it do the computing work and get then get the results. So for these kind of data, what Elastic Cache does is whenever it sees that there's a frequently accessed data, it stores that data on the cache, which means whenever a similar request will come, rather than querying the database, the same data will be going back to the customer from the cache layer itself. So it decreases the overhead on the database and it also at the same time increases the performance of your application. All right. So that is what Elastic Cache is all about, guys. All right, guys, so our next domain is the security domain. So in security domain, these are the following services that we have in AWS. So we have the first service, which is AWS IAM and the next service is AWS KMS. Let's check out both these services and understand what they do. So guys, IAM is basically used to authenticate users to your AWS account. Now, the account that you just created on AWS, it basically is the root account for that AWS account. Now, what happens is big companies are companies companies like Netflix, Airbnb, they own only one AWS account. And what they do in that AWS account is they create multiple users with restricted permissions. Okay, so each user can have their own user ID and password, but basically they will be logging into the same AWS account. And that is possible using AWS IAM, right? So you can create multiple users for a single AWS account with granular permissions, such as what actions can they do on the AWS management console. They, you can also restrict them, them to particular services that they can access. For example, the user can just access S3 or he can just access EC2 or he can just read EC2 and cannot stop and start an instance or he can just start and stop an instance but cannot create a new instance, right? Or you can put a, also a restriction that nobody can terminate an instance who whoever users you are adding, right? The account or the user that you signed up with, that is basically the root account. Now, what is the root account? account root, root account always has all the privileges right it has all the privileges can do anything but if you have to put any restrictive access to a particular person you will have to create a user account in IAM so that is one type of account that you can create in IAM the second type of account that you can create in IAM is an application account now what is an application account let's say I have a website which can upload data to S3 now how do I authenticate my website to upload data on S3 for that we have the AWS IAM service using which I can create application identification keys as well. So what you get in that case is you get access key and you get a secret access key. So that access key and secret access key has to be embedded in your program and only then your program is authenticated to upload data onto the S3 service of your AWS account. Otherwise it cannot, right? So this is one of the reasons or these, these are actually the reasons that you use IAM for, right? It can help you to put restrictions restrictive access on user accounts as well as application accounts. All right, moving forward, guys, the next service is KMS. KMS means key management service. So key management service is basically used to create the key pairs that we saw while we were creating EC2 instances, right? So those key pairs are actually created by the KMS service, right? So uh, similarly, if you want more key pairs to be created, you just have to head on to the KMS service and you can create your key pairs over there and authenticate yourself accordingly to whatever service you want. All right. So guys, this was the security domain. Now let's move on to our next domain. AWS services management. All right, so this is our next domain guys. So let's see what all services are included in this domain. 
So guys, these are the domains that are included in this. Uh, these are the services that are included in this domain. So first service is AWS CloudFormation. Then we have AWS OpsWorks. Then we have AWS CloudTrail. And in the end, we have CloudWatch. Now, what is AWS CloudFormation, guys? AWS CloudFormation is basically used to templatize an AWS infrastructure, okay? So let's say I have launched two EC2 instances with a load balancer with an, in an auto-scaling group, which is connected to an RDS instance, which in turn is also, you know, connected to uh, my EFS. So all these things I will have to launch, right? If I know what the architecture is, I will have to launch everything one by one and then probably my architecture would be ready. But what I can do with CloudFormation is everything I can specify in a JSON file. So in a JSON file, I can specify all the resources that I want to launch, all the things that I want to configure in the network, everything I can specify in the JSON file and just run it through cloud formation so what cloud formation will do it will create that whole architecture according to my json file so i don't have to stress too much on you know creating my architecture one by one using either through my management console or through my cli right i can directly do that from by just writing a json file and passing it through my cloud formation so this also helps us when we want to replicate our architecture across multiple regions right let's say i have an architecture in one particular region I want to replicate it across multiple regions so in that case also cloud formation helps us a lot so it's an automation tool which can help us to launch AWS resources by specifying it in a JSON file our next service is AWS OpsWorks now it's a little similar to cloud formation because this also deals in automation but basically this is a configuration management tool so if you guys are aware of DevOps there's a configuration management tool called chef right so chef recipes are readily accepted by AWS OpsWorks and what you can do is in this in AWS OpsWorks what happens is there are multiple layers that you have to configure and all these layers together they form to become a stack okay so what i'll be doing is let's say in the first layer i specify the the ec2 instances uh, that i want to automate on right the second layer could specify what all software that i want to be configured in that ec2 instance so that is how opsworks is helpful guys so a configuration management tool is nothing but which can configure all the software requirements on a particular set of servers at the same time right that means if i have to install let's say mysql on let's say 100 servers how will i do that it's a very daunting task. I'll have to go to each server. I'll have to install MySQL. So OpsWorks makes it easy for me and it makes it easy in a very effective manner. That is every server will have the same configuration that I specify in OpsWorks. Now don't get confused with CloudFormation and OpsWorks guys. CloudFormation is used to deploy an architecture. OpsWorks is used to specify consistencies in that architecture with respect to the software that we are going to install in that okay so and also it's not just a one-time deployment that you'll be doing through opsworks let's say tomorrow uh, your database link and the password is changing right and you have some 200 servers in your fleet how will you do that so that is possible using opsworks all you have to do is just go to that layer where you have specified the link and the password just change that and update or deploy the OpsWorks architecture and then in that case it will update all the servers with that very small change that you specified in one of the layers right so for all these very small changes which are very important and have to be same across all the servers I use OpsWorks right next service guys is AWS CloudTrail so AWS CloudTrail is basically a monitoring service which logs everything which is happening in your architecture right so that logging is not enabled by default to some of the services you can enable logging by specifying that you know aws cloud trail should log each and every action which is happening and it exactly does that it basically would log each and every action or each and every event that is happening inside a particular aws resource once you attach aws cloud trail to it and then that log data basically you can use to do further monitoring by connecting it to probably a BI service which can visualize your log data etc right so that is what AWS CloudTrail is all about 
Then our next service is AWS CloudWatch. Now what is CloudWatch? CloudWatch is basically, again, it's a monitoring service, but it's a little different kind of monitoring service, right? So what you can do with uh, CloudWatch is you can set up alarms. For example, if let's say I want an alarm whenever one of my servers goes in unhealthy state, right? No. So how would I do that? So one thing would be that I continuously hire uh, my employees and they are constantly checking if my servers are in the healthy state or not. Or what I can do is I can configure a very will take very less time to just configure my cloud watch to monitor all my resources and whenever there is a resource which goes in the energy state it can trigger an alarm now what kind of alarm can it trigger it can either email you or it can basically trigger a next set of events it can trigger to create an ec2 instance or it can trigger an aws lambda function it can trigger something else as well so this is what cloud watch is all about it watches all your resources and on basis of that it it can do a, for the a, a simple process that you define in CloudWatch. Moving forward, guys, our next domain is customer engagement domain. So in this domain, we have the following services. The first service is Amazon Connect, and then we have simple email service. So let's look at what these two services do so that they are so helpful in the AWS community. The first service being Amazon Connect, guys. So Amazon Connect is nothing but it's a, it's a full blown customer contact center for your company. For example, you would have seen that uh, whenever you purchase a product, there's always a customer helpline that you can call on, right? and then you get the IVR options in there where you choose and then you get connected to human agent to talk your way out, right? Or you to put your grievances and you talk to your customer service agent, right? Now, if you want to set up something like that for your company, it is very simple to set up that using Amazon Connect. You can build a customer contact center in less than five minutes with Amazon Connect, right? All you have to do is go to Amazon Connect service, click on get started and it will allow you a toll free or a normal phone number based on what you choose. After that, you just have to fill in the agents that you want to be on the other side so that whenever people will be calling that one particular toll free or normal contact number, they should be routed to the agents screen agent screen right and this happens on the internet so there is no need of purchasing carrier plans or something like that right so this is what amazon connect is all about guys and next service is simple email service now this is also plays a vital role in customer engagement you would have seen that you get marketing emails from a lot of companies for example if there are food companies that you order for or if you have went into a store you gave your phone number over there in the contact list, they'll also message you pizza delivery store or grocery stores they all email or sms you one way or the other right this service right here is when you want to have email interactivity with your customers right you can send bulk emails you can also set up your a simple email service to respond to particular reply emails right so that is what SES is all about and this also can be configured to route emails uh, for example if there is an email address that you set up for your company for example support at the rate in telepath.com is our email address right so if you email to that particular email address it will get routed to our support agents who will help you out in solving your queries right so that all can be set in amazon ses guys so this is it for the customer engagement services our next domain talks about app integration right so in this domain we will basically have services which help you to integrate two or three services in aws let's look at what services they have to offer so there are two services basically guys one service is called simple notification service and the other one is simple queuing service let's see what these services are so the first service which is amazon simple notification service basically helps you to send notifications to other aws services in occurrence of an event right so it waits for a trigger to happen and based on the trigger it sends a notification to a corresponding aws service which has to work next for example you can set up a website which can send you an email and all you have to do is let's say whenever a customer purchases uh, some 
something from your website you want to trigger an email to the customer with all the details now if you have to do this on a distributed environment what will you do is uh, the moment there is a trigger that there, there is a cash payment received from a particular customer your lambda event will be triggered right now that can be triggered in numerous ways one way is either your service can directly trigger the lambda event but that is only possible for some of the aws services the other way around is that you can send a notification to sns right so sns will detect the type of notification received and it will have a mapped out road to as to which service it has to notify next so in this case it will receive the notification it will see okay so this is the type of notification received it will invoke the lambda function which will basically send out the email to your customer all right so this is what this is how an sns service basically works as you can see in the diagram here as well that you have a publisher a publisher is a person who sends out the notification right the next thing that you do is uh, the way of filtering out different kind of notifications in sns is that you define topics okay so based on the topics the messages are filtered and what you do is in the topics you will define which service to basically trigger and based on that those services will be triggered and the services to be triggered are basically called subscribers okay so guys this is how an sns service actually works moving forward now let's look at the simple queuing service now what is a simple queue service it's basically a queue for or it's basically a place where you can store all your jobs whenever you have a stateless kind of an architecture what is stateless kind of an architecture let's say you have a system which doesn't have its own memory the prime example for this would be aws lambda so what aws lambda does is it does not know what is happening in your application okay what it knows is just the job job that it has to do for example let's say the job of the lambda server is just to send an email right it will not know whether Whether it has already sent an email to that uh, to a particular customer or not, it will not know whether it has already sent an email to a customer, right? What it will do is it will just pick up jobs. from the queue that you have and based on that it will perform the job and that is exactly why you have a simple queuing service so that it can feed to lambda what the next job is without Lam lambda having to remember what it has to do right so guys this is what the sqs service is now guys this was all about the different aws services that we have and that you need to know in order to get started with aws so for uh, i think we have almost covered all the use cases that you can and counter in an organization and basically your job would be to that based on the problem you would have to suggest an aws service and that aws service implementation also details you will have to know right so based on the knowledge that i've just given you what each and every service does you can now decide what an architecture should basically have in order to get a job done all right moving forward guys now let's talk about a very important topic which is aws pricing now what now we know about all the services that we are going to use right but what will we do or how will we use these services totally depends on the pricing of these services correct so let's move forward and understand how the pricing model works in aws and if i'm using a set of services how will i be charged how much will i be charged so guys the aws pricing options are among these three right the first option is pay as you go model which means whatever amount of time you will be using an instance for or whatever amount of time you will be using a server for that amount of time will be billed to you and will be given back to you so whenever you will be launching any server you will get a per hour uh, basis charge on that particular service right so you can see that service you can see what the charges are and accordingly you uh, you will be charged whenever you terminate that instead of whenever there is a monthly billing cycle of yours which is ending right so the first model is pay as you go model which is widely used second model is save when you reserve now what do you mean by that let's say you're launching a website today right and that website is for your company and you foresee that i will be at least running this website for the next 3 years based on it's just a startup i might not see that much growth but i will sustain it for 3 years and 3 years my website site is going to there right let's say this is the scenario so what you can do with aws is you can opt for dedicated instances or reserved instances so you can say that i'm going to use this instance for 3 years from now on right and i'm not going to back out i am going to use the 3 years uh, this instance for 3 years then what aws will do 
for you in that case is it will give you a counter offer it will give you a discounted price right reason being that it is no longer an on demand service it's a service that you have asked from AWS which you will use for 3 years which means that you will pay you will have th two options in front of you to uh, get this kind of a deal one thing is you can do a full up from payment of 3 years right you can pay all the uh, whatever discounted price they deliver to you you can just give the amount for 3 years and you can use your instance right then you're locked in or what you can do is you can also do a partial up from payment if that eases out the financial stress on you right for example you do not have that kind of money to pay for 3 years so what you can do is you can divide your payments into EMIs and then you can pay it to AWS. That's a partial upfront payment. So with this, you can get discounts up to 70% of the pricing, which is there in pay as you go model, right? So the guys, that's very cheap. So if you have an application where you know the server that you're going to use is going to be there for like three, uh, two or three years, then it's better to go for reserved instances where you can opt for taking a server and you'll get huge discounts on using them. Right. The third kind of pricing is pay less by using more. Uh, what this basically means is the more you will be using your instance, for example, your instance, uh, the, the type of pricing that you get, for instance, is on a per hour basis, right? The more you will use your instance, the less the hourly rates will become, right? So that's also an awesome feature by AWS, which says pay less by using more, all right? So guys, these were the pricing options in AWS. There's one more pricing option that you get in AWS, which is called spot pricing what is spot pricing or spot instances spot instances are basically idle instances which AWS is running and what it does is it offers it to you in a cheaper price right so for example uh, it's 2 p.m. in the afternoon and I know that the load is less at this particular time so what AWS will do is it will offer you some instances at a lowered price rate because those are just sitting idle over there and if you want to use them you can use them so what happens in that case is you take that instance and and you bid it right if you want to take that instance you'll have to bid amount on that particular instance the highest the higher the bid amount is obviously that bid amount will be lower than the actual rates but the higher the bid amount is that instance goes to that particular person right now there is a catch in this basically that if somebody bids higher than what you have bidded in that case your instance will be stopped immediately and it will be given to someone else who has done the bidding higher all right so that's a catch over here but it's but it could be particularly helpful uh, when you are dealing with workloads which are not that important but anyways you have to do them right in those kind of scenarios you can take up spot instances and you can just bid a particular amount which you feel you are comfortable in and in case in future the price goes up your instance will be stopped but at least you're getting your work done in a cheaper rate right so that's the ideology behind spot instances so i guess now it's clear with all of you what AWS pricing options you have. Now let me move ahead and let me tell you a very exciting point about AWS pricing, right? The free tier. So the free tier is basically one time offer that you get whenever you sign up. So whenever you sign up on AWS, if you are using a T2.micro instance, which is one GB of RAM and one vCPU of computer, in that case, it will be totally free of cost to you, right? So what you do get in a month is 750 hours of usage. So you can launch four instances, five instances, all of them together collectively can be run for 750 hours. The moment you cross 750 hours, you'll be charged the normal price. But up till 750 hours of server usage, you will be not charged a penny, right? And that this is what the free tier is all about. Now, it is particularly helpful for people who are trying out AWS or people like us who are trying to learn AWS for our future careers right so i'll request you all guys so whenever you're practicing on aws always be under the free tier because that is literally not going to cost you anything all right so the, the 750 hours that you get are particular to EC2 and RDS. Apart from that, you get some other free tier limits as well. For example, in S3, you have, if you store data up to 5 GB, you will not be charged anything, okay? Then uh, in DynamoDB, if you have to store something, uh, which is, uh, if you're if the instance which you're running is under the free tier, and if you want to store something on DynamoDB, till 25 GB, it is absolutely free. 
okay so guys this is the kind of pricing that you get uh, or these are the kind of perks that you get uh, when you're using aws for the first time for more details on aws uh free tier you can just visit the aws.amazon.com official website and they'll give you all the details for there are a lot of other services as well that they offer free tier in or free limits in for example the amazon connect that we the service that we discussed uh, which was basically a one-stop customer center support center uh, setup in that you get uh, in a month you will get the first 90 minutes of your calling for free and the way you get charged for that particular service is not on the number of hours that you'd be using that service but on the number of minutes a customer is speaking to an agent right that is how you get charged that's i think pretty cool about uh, amazon connect all right moving forward guys i think we have uh, covered enough of theory now let's go ahead and do a hands-on uh, where basically i'll show you guys how to set up uh, your aws services and how to migrate an application from your local computer onto aws so let's start off with our hands-on so guys uh, what i've basically done is i have created a website using which we can upload data on s3 okay so this is how the architecture looks like so basically my website can data upload data on aws s3 and that record is also saved in a mysql database now as of now this mysql database is on the local host and also the website is on the local host and right now my website cannot connect to s3 because it is not being able to authenticate itself all right so this is what we are going to the first step that we're going to do is we're going to authenticate our website to aws s3 to upload data once we have done that we will migrate this website onto aws infrastructure all right so without any ado guys let me first show you how my website basically uh, looks like browser right so guys my website basically exists on localhost slash new right so this is how my website looks like the first First thing that I would have to do is I will have to check if it is able to connect to a database. So basically whatever I will be uploading, I can view that over here as a list, but right now it cannot connect to the database. So what I do is I'll open up my MySQL on my local host. Here it is, right? And now what I'll do is I'll create a database called images. So because that is what I have configured in my code, right? And now let me create a table with uh, the name names and let there be one field called name with the value as varchar and let us give pretty big value so that any length of characters can fit in this particular table. All right. So it says no database selected. Oops. I'm sorry for that. So use images and now let's create the table. So when I do a refresh over here, it should be able to connect, but now it will show you an empty list because there's nothing inside my database, right? If you want to show anything over here, it will basically be visible once a entry is made inside the database. Second thing is right now, if I try to upload anything, let me go to pictures and let me say, let's say this is the image that I upload. If I click on open and if I click on submit, uh, my file basically will not be uh, uploaded. Reason being, it will say the authorized header is is malformed which basically means authentication is not yet given to my account now how can i give authentication to my website so that it can upload on s3 for that i'll have to head on to my aws management console and as we have learned there is a service called iam so i will go inside that iam service and over here what i'll do is i will create a user right and let's say the username is web demo and what i will have to give this user is the programmatic access so that uh, by code this user will be able to access all the services on aws now the kind of services that i want my website to access is only s3 right so let us put an s3 over here and as you can see there's a permission over here which is amazon s3 full access let's give this use access to this particular user and let's review it and let's finally create the user once we have created the user guys i will have the access key id and i will have the secret key access key now this is very important for my application to be authenticated so what i'll do is i will just copy this access key id i will go to my terminal i will create a new page and this is my access id guys and this is what my secret access key looks like 
Okay, so this is my access key. This is my secret access key, and this will be used to basically connect my website onto AWS S3. Okay, now let me show you how my index or how my uh, code looks like, guys. So, guys, this is my code which I'll basically use to upload files onto S3. As you can see, the key and the secret key are not filled as of now. So, let us fill the key first. So the key is this. Let us enter it over here, and the secret key is this. Right. So once I enter the key and access key, uh, secret access key, my website will now be able to authenticate itself onto S3. And now it should be able to upload objects into a bucket, right? Which bucket are we talking about? Let me quickly show you. So there's a bucket that I've just created on S3 and that bucket name is basically test and telepath. So as you can see, there are no objects in this bucket as of now, right? And now what I'm gonna do is let me refresh this website. And as you can see, now it says new record created successfully. That is the image that I chose earlier should now be uploaded over here. So now if I do a refresh, I can see there's one image that has been uploaded. Let's upload one more image for the sake of understanding it. Let's upload this particular image and let's click on submit. So what happens is the moment uh, it takes up a file, it changes the name of the file into a random name and then it uploads it over here. So if I refresh, you can see there's one more image which just has been uploaded. Now, what I can do is I can just go back to my website and I can just click on checklist. So this will give me a list of files which are uploaded onto my S3. If I click on this list, I can basically download the file from S3 and if I click on it, you can see the file. This is what I uploaded, right? Similarly, if I click on it over here, this is the file that I uploaded. Right. Similarly, let me upload one more file so that it's clear for everyone. Let's say I upload. Let us take not let's take let us not take an image. Let us try to put something else. So let's say uh, there's this app, this test dot jar that I can upload. So let's just click on open and let's click on submit. So this is the file. I click on submit. And now if I do a refresh over here. I should have that file. Okay, so that file might be a little larger in size. That's why it's not uploading. So what I can do is let me take this particular image, right? And let me submit this. As you can see, a new record has been successfully created. If I click on checklist, there is a new image which has been added. If I click on this image, I can clearly see that this is the image that I uploaded. Similarly, if uh, let us try some other file as well. Let's choose a file. Let's try to upload this Excel file. Let's click on submit. And when I do that, a new record has been created. Great. If I check the list, this is the Excel file that has just been uploaded. If I click here, the Excel file is downloaded. If I click open this, this basically file should now open, right? Great guys. So I think our website is working fine, but the problem is this website exists on my local host, right? And right now it is basically feeding data onto my local MySQL instance. So if I basically would just do a select star from images, sorry, select star from names. This is the name of the table. You can see that this is all the values that are there in the table. And these are the values that you can see over here. So the first thing that I should do is basically let us deploy a database on AWS on through which my website will basically be connected. For that, I will be heading on to RDS. Uh, since this is the, this database that I'm using is MySQL, let us try to deploy a MySQL database on AWS. Uh, so for that, I will be clicking on create database and the type of database that I want is MySQL. Let's select that. And now let's click on next. Next, I want to create a dev environment or test environment because this is just a POC. So I've selected this and I'll click on next. Uh, next, I can select the MySQL version. So let it leave it at default right now. And I want to enable only options which fall under the free tier usage. Okay, so let's select this option. And everything is filled automatically. Let's identify our DB using a name. Let's say it's web hyphen demo, right? The master username, let's say the master username is Hemant. Let's specify the master password as well. And now let's finally click on next. 
right? Now it'll ask me which VPC do I want to put my instance into. So I have the default VPC where my instance is being launched in. That's great. Uh, second thing is public accessibility. Do I want uh, internet to, act, to be able to access RDS? So yes, I want uh, public accessibility to be enabled. If I select no, in that case, uh, you know, there will not be any public IP which will be assigned to my RDS instance. Only the VPC in which my RDS instance uh, resides in, only the instance is launched in that particular instance or in that particular VPC would be able to access uh, that RDS. So when I say VPC is basically a virtual private cloud or it's basically a virtual network, right? So if I do not ex give public accessibility to my RDS, then it will only be able to connect to machines which reside in that particular network on which it is being deployed, right? Not on the internet. Okay. So, but we, because our website right now is in my local host from local host, I should be able to upload data onto the database of AWS. So for that, I will need public access accessibility, right? Uh, do I want to create a new security group? No, I don't want to. Let us select the default security group. Okay. Uh, what should be the database name? So the database name would be the same uh, that I've given for my local MySQL instance, which is images. Rest, you can just leave at default. Uh, backup, I don't want any backup. So let's select zero and disable monitoring. We don't want that. We don't want any upgrades made to my database right and i think that's it now let's finally click on create database now guys the database instance it takes around three or four minutes to create meanwhile while this database is being created uh, let me tell you the next step that we have to do now since this website exists on localhost i want this website to be existing on uh, basically aws i want this website to be uploaded on aws and for that uh, let us use elastic beanstalk which is the platform as a service uh, service on aws right so let's open the AWS management console and now let's head on to Elastic Beanstalk. In Elastic Beanstalk, uh, you can basically upload your website and I'll show you how you can upload your website and you don't have to configure anything on the instance. Every software, everything uh, will be configured by Elastic Beanstalk itself. So as you can see, when you reach this page, you just have to click on get started and now it'll ask you the application name. Let's say the application name is web-demo right uh, what platform is my website based on so it's based on php uh, do i want a sample application to be deployed previously yes i do so i'll just click on create application now so guys this will basically create a web app for me in elastic beanstalk we have done this earlier as well uh, we're doing it once more so that uh, we can upload our own website onto this particular elastic beanstalk application okay so it'll again take guys uh three four to four minutes for elastic beanstalk to get deployed meanwhile let's check if our rds is ready i'll just head on to rds i can see there's an instance which is running so it is still in the creation phase so once the creation phase is over you would be able to get an endpoint over here so an endpoint is basically a url through which you will be able to connect to your database all right so let us wait for this database to be ready and once it is i will try to connect to this database from my local host and see how that goes all right so it's in the creating phase similarly my elastic beanstalk is also being created uh, let me show you my code guys. Let me explain you my code a little bit, right? So this is my main file. So in this file, basically I am using the PHP backend language on which I have basically imported the AWS SDK, right? This SDK, you can basically just Google on, you can just Google AWS SDK for PHP and you would be able to download it. Now I have included this particular folder in my uh, root directory of my website, which is over here. So this is the folder which has all the libraries, right? And my index.php will basically has included this particular uh, library and then the service that I want to connect to is S3. So we are using the libraries of S3 over here, right? Uh, my bucket resides in Oregon region. The code for that is US West 2. This is my key. This is my secret access key. Don't worry guys, I will be deleting the user account. So don't try using these keys. They will, they will no longer work once I have the username deleted. Apart from that, it's pretty simple. It's a very straightforward code guys. Uh, right now, the database that I'm connecting to is on localhost. That's why the server name is localhost. One, I would want to connect to my RDS instance. All I have to do is change this server name to the endpoint of RDS and then it should work like a charm. 
right? That's it. This is my index.php. My list.php, where I get a list, is basically uh, I'm just connecting to that same database which exists on localhost. And I'm trying to read everything from the table. This is the field that I'm reading. On the front of that name, I am attaching this URL. So this is the URL for my bucket. And this remains the same for each and every object which gets uploaded, right? So I'm uploading, uh, so I'm attaching this along with the name and this I am basically storing in an ahref tag, which basically gives me a link on my website, right? So if I can show you over here, as you can see, this is a list, right? And this is the link. So this link is basically a ahref link in which I have embedded this URL with my file name. All right. So once I've done that, it works great. It works uh, like it is supposed to. Now, uh, I guess we should go ahead and check if my RDS is ready. Yes, guys. So my RDS is now in the available state. So how do you connect to RDS? Uh, there will be a database which has been created on my RDS, but this st still the table is still not created, right? So first I'll have to create a table on this RDS instance, which would uh, basically be exactly the table like what I have on my localhost. So how do I connect to my RDS? So just copy this endpoint guys. And now you'll have to go on to CMD, right? So once you are on the CMD guys, the next step is to go to the bin directory of your MySQL installation. So my MySQL installation is basically in a WAM64. So I'm going to go in there, right? So I'm inside the bin directory now. Next thing would be that I will have to call in MySQL. Hyphen H would be the host name. The host name in my case is the Amazon's host name, which is this. The username for this RDS instance, it's Heymanth. And the password is this. Let me specify it over here. Let's hit enter. And now, uh, if everything has went well, I should be able to connect to my RDS instance. Let's wait. So while this is happening guys, uh, if it gets stuck like this, it could be that, uh, you know, you're not able to connect to your instance. And the reason for that could be in the security group. So you'll have to check if the inbound rules for the security group are open to accept traffic. So let's click on inbound and yes. So this is the problem over here. Uh, it's allowing all traffic, but it's only allowing to this particular security group. So what I'll do is I'll make it anywhere and I'll save it. Once I do this, uh, let us come back here and try to run the command again. I'll enter the password and hit enter. So as you can see, I have successfully connected to my MySQL instance, which resides on AWS. Now this instance should have a database called images. Let's use that. And now let's create a table, which would be the same as what I did on my local host. So let the table name would be names and the field name would be name and the type of information that can go in is varchar. Let's specify that. Okay, so my table is now successfully created guys. And now my database is ready to basically take in data. Now what I'll be doing is uh, let us go back to RDS and let's copy this endpoint. And now let's make our website maybe uh, be able to uh, basically interact with my RDS instance. So it's pretty simple. Just change the server name to the endpoint of RDS. The username in my case is Hemant and the password in my case for my RDS instance is Hemant1994. All right, that's it guys. That's all we have to do. And let's save this code. Similarly, in my list, I will have to change the values from localhost to these variables. I'll save it. And now when I go back to my website, uh, let us open the local MySQL instance also. So this was my local MySQL instance. As you can see, there are only four entries over here, right? Now let's choose a file. Let's try to upload the same XLXX file, the Excel file that is, and let's now click on submit. So it says new record created successfully, but let us check here if this is where my data has been entered. So no, my data has not been entered over here. Let us check on my RDS. If my data is being entered correctly over here, select star from names. So yes, a data has been entered over here with the, uh, this particular name. And if I click on checklist, as you can see, even here, I get the same value. So you can compare that this is the name that I'm getting over here. And this is the name that I'm getting on my website. If I click here, I'd be able to download that Excel file successfully.
great guys this is what i wanted so now my website is basically connected to my uh, database instance on aws it was that simple now the next step is basically to put this website on aws for good so that everybody in the world can access it now how can i do that this is my elastic beanstalk guys and this is the dashboard that i get when i use the platform as a service instance right now it uh, it says here upload and deploy so that's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna click on upload and deploy and now it's going to ask me to choose a file now the way you can upload your website over here guys is you will have to go to your website codes right and then you will have to zip these files like this right so once the files have been zipped this zip has to be uploaded over here so i'll choose a file let me go into that folder where i have the zip here's the folder let's click on open uh version label let's try to give this version label as 1.0 Okay, and now let's click on deploy. So now my website is now getting deployed to uh, AWS Elastic Beanstalk. It will hardly take some two or three minutes for my website to be ready on this particular platform. And once it is, we'll be able to use it via this particular link. This link will basically be my application now that I've shown you on localhost. This will now be available on this particular link. So let me close all the unnecessary windows. And now let's wait for this to be ready. Okay, so it will take around two to three minutes, like I said, and whatever version that I've specified, that version will now be reflected over here. Okay, so it would be AWS colon 1.0. So let's say in the future, I make change to my code, uh, any kind of change to my code, I would be able to upload it over here in the same manner possible. That is, I will have to click on upload and deploy, and then I will have to increment the version. I will show you that as well. Let this complete, and then we will go ahead and check. So as you can see, my running version is now AWS 1.0. Great, so this is what I wanted. Now, it's the moment of truth. Let's try to go to this URL and see if our website is working or not. So great guys, my website is now available on this particular URL. Let's try to check if it is able to upload everything. So let's first check a list. So we have one file, which is there in my database, which is uploaded. Now let's choose a file. Uh, let's try to upload the zip file itself, right? I'm not sure if it will be able to upload. Let's check. So the uploading has started. It says new record created successfully. Awesome. Let's go here. Let's refresh this. As you can see, a new entry has been made. Let's try to download this. So as you can see, the zip is being downloaded. And if you go to our S3, if we refresh over here, you can see the zip is present over here as well. And my zip is also downloaded. If you want to verify if all the contents are fine or not, let's do one simple step let's create a new folder here right and now let's try to paste this extract over here it will extract all the files click on ok so all the files are now being extracted let's do a control x and let's paste here let's delete these files so basically on my localhost hello there should be a file uh, my my website should be up and running so localhost slash hello so as you can see i can see my website over here and if i do a checklist sorry if i do a list dot php here i should be able to see even the list so that means these files that have now been uploaded to s3 are working correctly and also i have successfully migrated my website which is there on my localhost onto Elastic Beanstalk without even going to the terminal, without installing any software on the server, right? It is now up and ready and anyone who will visit this particular URL will be able to access my website, okay? And as simple as that, guys, and it's basically hosting my files as well. My files are now all available on this particular link. So anywhere in the world, if some, anybody would go to this particular link, they will be able to access these files. They just have to click on it and they'll be able to download it. What is Amazon VPC? So guys, Amazon VPC is basically a service. It's basically a virtual private cloud, which is given to us by AWS when we deploy resources on its cloud platform. And what this Amazon VPC basically enables us to do is basically launch AWS resources into a virtual network that we define, right? So VPC is basically a virtual network 
that we define this virtual network can have multiple subparts as well it can have multiple configurable properties as well and the whole service is called amazon vpc right now the definition is not that important but the working is the most important for amazon vpc through which you will be actually able to understand what you can accomplish and what all is possible when you are basically making use of the amazon vpc service so let's go ahead and understand how amazon vpc service basically work so guys this is the skeleton diagram for amazon vpc and you can imagine how you can basically uh, you know how how internet basically works at your home system or in your office system by looking at this diagram so what basically happens is first there is the internet right so you are first always on the internet and from the internet um, you know there is a request which comes in so let's say you are at your home system and if somebody has to uh, you know reach out to your computer let's imagine it like that how will it work so first you have the internet and from the internet there will be a request which will come in now in aws what happens is like i said you have a virtual network that you create so first of all any resource in aws that you create is enclosed inside a virtual network it could be ec2 it could be any databases so it has to be enclosed inside a network right so we will have this network let's say this is the network of ours which is called the aws vpc service and any network or any internet connection which has to come inside this vpc service will have to come in through something called as a internet gateway okay so when you create a virtual network for that virtual network to have internet access you basically need to create a resource called internet gateway and this internet gateway is going to be a single point through which internet uh, requests are going to go out and internet requests are also going to come in right so the internet can basically be accessed using the internet gateway and whenever a request is coming in through the internet the first place that it goes to after the internet gateway is to a resource which is called routing table now what is a routing table now uh, when you create an aws network what happens is you also have some something called as the sub parts of the network or sub networks let's say right so let's say you create an aws network and in that aws network you create two sub parts which are basically called subnet 1 and then subnet 2 so these two subnets will have their own resources inside it so let's say in subnet 1 you have a database which you have deployed and in subnet 2 you have a ec2 machine or a virtual machine that you have deployed okay now let's say if the internet has to reach to this machine which is there in subnet 2 the way it is going to work is first it is going to the request is going to come in from the internet gateway from the internet gateway uh, now the request does not know how to reach the machine so what it will refer to is basically something called as a routing table so in the routing table basically you will have all the details with respect to which uh how can you reach the resource so this resource will basically have a private ip address right and uh, this private ip address can be reached out to using the routing table right or in other words you can also imagine it something like this that how will the internet gateway know about these resources the internet gateway knows about these resources when it is basically a part of the routing table so when the routing table is visible to the internet gateway then these resources are also visible right and from the routing table basically you reach the subnet 2 and in subnet 2 you have that resource okay so this is a skeleton of what aws vpc is first the request comes in through the internet gateway the internet gateway refers to the routing table and from the routing table you basically go through the subnet where you have the resource and from the subnet you go to the resource okay now there are something called as firewalls in this architecture now you will ask okay you just told us that the request just comes in so how is it filtered so that filtering process happens using firewalls and there are two kind of firewalls in vpc the first firewall is called nacls 
right and this uh, network access control lists these are called and these basically operate at the subnet level that means that there is a firewall at a subnet level and there is a firewall or the instance level, level which is basically or the resource level which is basically called security group so there are two levels of firewalls in a vpc network okay so that basically means that when the uh, request is coming in there is no filter which happens on the aws vpc level the only filter which happens is on the subnet level which is the network acl okay from the network acl if the request gets filtered then it basically goes to the security group of the resource so if i were to include these two firewalls in the diagram it can be imagined something like this that once the request will come from the internet from the internet gateway it will look for the instance that it has to go to in the routing table from the routing table once it gets to know where the resource is it will go there and in the subnet it first has to basically in go through the first level of firewall which is the network acl from that firewall it then goes in if the request is filtered out and when that request is filtered out then it encounters another firewall which is basically called security group and if it filters that out then only it is able to access the resource okay so this is the flow diagram of how a request flows in a vpc and now what i'm going to show you guys is basically how to create this kind of an architecture in aws right so what we're going to do is i'm going to quickly jump on to my browser and let me open aws management console all right guys. so first you have to basically go to aws.amazon.com and on aws.amazon.com you basically will sign in and this is where you will reach your aws management console now on the aws management console what we have to basically work with is virtual private cloud and let's try to now create the architecture so this is how our architecture looks like so first what we'll do is we'll create aws vpc right so let's go ahead and create a vpc so we'll click on vpcs we'll click on create vpc and whatever i've explained to you guys we will try and test it out by doing the hands-on so that is what we are going to do okay so first let's name our instant uh, our vpc something so let's call it vpc uh demo one let's call it that and now let's give it a ip address range this ip address range will basically mean that all the resources in this vpc are basically going to have an ip from this particular range which you are now going to define so let's go ahead and define the range let's say it's uh 192 dot one dot zero dot zero slash 16 right let's say this is the range and now we'll basically go ahead and click on create vpc so our vpc has now been created and what we have done is we basically went ahead just a quick info for all of you cloud enthusiasts if you want to make a career in AWS, then you might want to check out IntelliPath's AWS Certification Training Course for Solution Architect. Learn from industry experts through hands-on session, projects, and case study. Reach us out to know more. And created a simple network. We have not defined any of these resources as of yet. Right? We have just created an empty box, which is our AWS VPC. Now, whenever you create a VPC, guys, what happens is automatically uh, when you will go ahead and create subnets it will automatically create some resources and i will tell you that so right now these subnets are of some other vpc that they are not of the vpc that i created right so what i'll do is i'll go ahead and create two subnets which is subnet one and subnet two so let's go ahead and create that so let's click on create subnet let's call it subnet one item demo and the vpc obviously is going to be vpc demo one this is the one that i created now this subnet can be deployed in three availability zones uh, these are basically different data centers that aws has in the region that we are working in let's deploy it in the first data center 1a right and now we have to specify an ip range which is basically going to be part of the main range which is there of the uh, vpc right 
So let's specify a range 192.1.1.0 slash 24. So this is going to be the range of the subnet uh, that we are basically creating right now. So we'll click on create. And now the VPC1 subnet 1 has been created. Similarly, we'll create one more subnet. Let's say it's VPC1 subnet 2. Right, the VPC is going to be VPC demo one. Uh, this time, let's say the data center is going to be of 1B, right, and specify the IP range as well. So, this is going to be the IP range. Okay, let's click on create. Okay, so my second subnet has also been created. So, if we refer to our diagram again, so we basically created a VPC. We created two subnets and now let's create the routing table. Okay. Now, right now I have not created any routing table, but if you go to your routing tables, uh, you will be able to see that this is a this is your VPC's routing table. Uh, it's, as you can see, it's VPC hyphen demo one, and this is automatically created. Okay, so this is uh, whenever you create subnets, a routing table is automatically created. And uh, this routing table, if you want to look, uh, you know, what subnets it is basically associated to. So you can just click on subnet associations. It is not, you know, basically created by, or it is not basically connected to any subnet as of now, right? So a routing table is automatically created. And why is it created? Let me show you that as well. So if you go to routes in this, uh, you will basically see that there is already a route which has been added which basically says that all the ip address from this range can basically talk to each other in this virtual network so this is the default rule which basically says that if i deploy this resource and if i deploy this resource they can talk to each other why because that is the default rule which is present in the routing table okay so these two will be able to talk to each other why because this rule is present and this rule is by default and this rule you cannot delete as well okay so this is one thing uh, now what we want to do is since the, these two subnets can talk to each other but they cannot talk to the internet as of now so that is something that we are going to configure but how does the routing table know that which subnets can talk to each other okay so for defining that what you'll have to do is you'll have to click on subnet associations click on edit subnet association and include these two subnets over here so when you do that now this routing table says that both these resources can talk to each other via the routing table and now what we want to do is we basically want internet to be available in this uh, uh, routing table as well right so we are going to configure that but right now let's not configure the internet and let's see what will be the behavior in case we don't add the internet right what we are basically going to do is we are basically let's go ahead and define the firewalls now so let's first define the network acl so again in this case if you go to nacl this is basically the subnet level uh, firewall so over here you can see there's already a network acl which is created for vpc demo one right so this is also created by default and if you look at the inbound rules or the outbound rules, so what is this firewall saying? That all traffic is right now allowed. So anyone who wants to have access inside the subnet, inside which subnet, inside both the subnets, because both the subnets are associated to this NACL or this firewall right now, all traffic is enabled to all the subnets in this particular network. Okay. Similarly, if you look at the outbound rules, you can basically request anyone on the internet from within these two subnets so that is what our network acl is right now saying okay so we're not going to touch that so let's move on to security groups now and when we move to the security groups uh, over here as well you will be able to see that there will be a default security group which will be created and uh, which vpc is ours we can basically make out by looking at the ids right so our vpc is of the id 
69D, right? So that's what we have to look out in the security groups. So we'll go to security group 69D, right? This is the VPC ID of us. And this is the security group that is basically created by default. So let's name this as default security group or default demo one. Let's name it that. So this is our security group which has been created. And if you look at this security groups inbound and outbound rules, they are going to be very uh, limited, right? So all traffic is allowed, but it is only allowed from within the resources which are connected to this security group, right? So we can change this if you want. So we want anyone to be able to go through this firewall. So I'll just specify anywhere and we'll click on save rules okay so now what you have done is we have opened both our firewalls that is the subnet level firewall and the instance level firewall right one last thing that we should do before we can go ahead and deploy these resources inside these subnets is basically to tell these subnets that these resources can have uh, public ip addresses okay so how do we go ahead and configure that? So just select your subnet. So let's say this is subnet one demo one uh, that I have basically went ahead and selected. So what I'll do is I click on actions, click on modify auto assign IP settings. And here I will say auto assign IPv4 address. So this by this, now what is going to happen that any resource that I'm going to create inside this subnet, it is automatically going to have an IP address. Similarly, I'll do that for my subnet 2 as well. So let me specify the name correctly. This is subnet 2 hyphen demo 1. And in this, again, I will say that basically any resource which is deployed in this should have a IP address, a public IP address. Okay, all set. So now what we have done is we have not configured the internet gateway yet but we have created a network inside this network we have a routing table and this routing table has a default rule which basically is allowing both these subnets to talk to each other we have created this firewall which is allowing all traffic we have created this firewall as well which is allowing all traffic so let's go ahead and test this uh, architecture out so what i'll do is i'll go to uh, ec2 and now i'll go ahead i'll basically go ahead and launch two machines one in subnet one and the other in subnet two okay and there is a behavior that i want you guys to notice so first i'll go ahead and create an ubuntu machine uh, i create a t2 dot micro which is basically going to be a part of vpc hyphen demo one right it is basically going to be in let's say subnet one and other than that everything can be left at default in the security group we are basically going to configure or select the default security group that we created right and now let's go ahead and click on review and launch So now what we'll do is we'll basically select a key that we already have. So I'll select Mac hyphen Mumbai. I already have this key and I click on launch instances. So with this, uh, you know, I have launched a machine in subnet one. Now I want you to notice something. This is subnet one machine. And this is being deployed. While this is being deployed, let's deploy the second machine as well, which is again going to be an Ubuntu machine. Uh, T2 dot micro. It is going to be a part of our demo one VPC. It's going to be in subnet two. Uh, going to be a part of the default security group. Let's review and launch. It's also going to have uh, no a key pair which I already have. And now this machine is also launched and this is going to be a part of subnet 2. Now what is something that I want you to notice? Uh, so first of all, this will have an IP address 
because we specified in the subnet that the machine should have an IP address. Uh, but now if I try to connect to these machines, uh, you will see that I will not be able to connect to them. So if I open my terminal really quickly, and let me try to go ahead and connect to these machines. You will see I will not be able to connect to them. It will basically give me a connection timed out kind of a request. And the reason for that is because I am on the internet. I'm trying to connect to these resources, but this internet gateway is not there. Right, this internet gateway is the only way that this VPC will be able to talk to the outside world. Okay, and because it is not there, you will see I'm getting a connection timed out kind of a thing. So how can we fix this? So now let's go back to our VPC console and let's go ahead and create something which we call as an internet gateway, right? So we'll go to VPC. Inside VPC, we will go ahead and go to Internet Gateways. And in this Internet Gateway, I'm going to create this. This is a default Internet Gateway, which is attached to the default VPC uh, that we created. And what we're going to do is we're going to create one more Internet Gateway. Let's call it IGW Demo 1. Right. And let's create it. Uh, once it has been created, what we'll do is we will attach it to our VPC. So right now it's in the detached state. So I'll have to do and click on actions, click on attach to VPC and attach it to VPC hyphen demo one. Attach it. So it's attached. So now that it's attached guys uh we should be able to see this internet gateway in our route tables right so if i go to my route table so this is my route table this is the demo one route table right so if you go to routes we can click on edit routes and now we can add a route for the internet gateway which is igw hyphen demo one we'll add that and the whole internet can be accessed using this internet gateway we'll click on save routes and now if we go ahead and try to run the same command you can see i'm able to connect to my machine isn't that great right so now since we are able to connect to this machine we should be able to connect to the other machine as well so let me connect and let's go to our second machine's ip address So this is a subnet two machine. Let's connect to it. This is the IP address. All right. So now, as you can see, I have successfully connected to these two machines. And now let's see if these two machines are able to talk to each other, right? So how can we check if they're able to talk to each other? So if you try the public IP address, obviously they will be able to talk to each other because this is going to be via the internet. But what we want to see is whether they can talk within the network. And for that, we are basically going to make use of the private IP address. Okay. So this is the private IP address of subnet two. So what we are going to do is from the subnet one machine, I'll try to ping subnet two. And as you can see, I'm able to ping the machine in subnet two. Why? Because in the route table, we have that entry wherein they are able to talk to each other. Great. 
so now let's try something out so what we can do is we can go to since subnet one is able to able to talk to subnet two let's go ahead and go to network acl that is basically the subnet level firewall and there let's try something out so we'll go to uh vpc and in vpc we will now go to network acls so let's create a new network acl uh it will basically be a uh, subnet 2 hyphen demo 1 and this is going to be a part of vpc demo 1 vpc right and let's say this is for subnet 1 and this is for subnet 2. so uh in this what we can do is we can remove the subnet uh let's remove the second subnet let's say uh, in this subnet i go ahead and i specify that only network connection from uh, subnet 2 is possible from subnet 1 but subnet 1 from subnet 2 is not possible that means that let's say only this machine can ping to machine 1 and machine 1 is able to ping to machine 2 now how is that possible I will just specify that all traffic from machine two is allowed, but from machine one is not allowed. So we'll specify something like this. So one second. Okay, so I basically just have to add slash 20 over here. Save it. Okay, so now what I've specified is that uh, only subnet 2 is able to ping into the uh, network acl now what does that mean that basically means that if somebody is trying to go ahead and ping subnet 1 to subnet 2 it should not be able to do it let's try it out And now you can see since I have edited the network ACL, I am not able to use these machines from my, uh, my personal system as well. And the reason for that is now the subnet is not allowing my machine as well to connect to these machines. Okay, so let me make, make you understand that using the uh, diagram over here. So what we did is basically these firewalls this subnet level firewalls have only allowed connection from a uh, machine in subnet to only this ip address i have added in this firewall now because of that what is happening is from the internet i'm not able to reach this subnet 
why because this firewall is blocking me so i'll not be able to ssh into this machine now okay so let's try to change what we were doing let's again go back to network acl So I'll go to VPC and uh, we'll again click on edit inbound rules. We can again make it 0 dot zero dot zero dot zero slash zero. Save it. And now again, if I come back to my terminal, I should be able to connect. Right. Similarly, I should be able to connect over here as well. Okay, so instead of let's say changing the subnet level firewall, let's go ahead and change the security group firewall, right? So in the security group firewall, what we can do is we can tell that only my machine should be able to ping it, right? And then only subnet two should be able to ping inside it. Subnet two machine should be able to ping inside it. So how can we do that? Let's go to security groups. Uh, so our security group is this one, 69D. So let's go inside it, click on edit inbound rules. And all traffic is allowed only from my IP. This is my machine's IP. And only from, let's say, uh, I wanna go ahead and allow only subnet to to be able to ping inside it. Subnet to machine to be able to ping inside it. Okay, let's click on save rules and let's see how this is going to work now. So now in this case, my SSH is going to work perfectly fine. Right, so if I, I will try anything over here, it will work perfectly fine. If from my first machine, I try to ping machine two. Let's see what happens. So according to the rules that I have configured as of now, uh, if I try to ping subnet one to subnet two, according to the rules that I have configured, it should not connect, right? But let's see if our assumption is correct or not, and then I'll explain whatever the behavior is happening over here. Can you see we are not able to ping the first machine that is subnet one machine to subnet two machine. Okay, this is the subnet two I, private IP. This is not able to ping or on the diagram this this machine is not able to ping this machine. Right. And why is that so? Because in the firewall for these machines what i've configured is that only this machine the subnet 2 machine can go ahead and ping the other machine or the, only this machine's ip address is allowed in the firewall and no other machine can ping which basically means if i go ahead and go to my second instance and if i try to ping the first machine i should not have any problems so if i select subnet 1 machine over here Select the IP address from here, come back, set the IP here, hit enter. You can see the ping is working, right? And why is that so? Because in these security groups, I have specified that only my subnet to machine connection will be allowed. So if I go ahead and change this, if I go ahead, and make this 192.1.0.0 slash 16. If I make that to basically work, now what will happen? So let me just verify if this is a CIDR range. Yes. So this is a CIDR range for all the instances or all the resources in this VPC. If I click on save rules now, you can see that this ping now again started to work, right? Why? Because this 
particular rule is now allowing everyone inside the VPC to be able to ping each other, right? And hence this ping started to work. Again, if I go ahead and if I change it to let's say only subnet one machine being able to ping each other, then it will be a different story. Just give me one moment. Okay. All right. Okay, guys. So now if I go ahead and change this to only subnet one machine's IP address, what is going to happen then? In that case, only subnet one machine will be able to ping subnet two and the other way will not be possible. So if we save the rules, so now you can see both of these are working, right? So let me clear the screen once more and let me start this command. Right. So now if I go ahead and save the rules, you will see that this is going to stop now in a few moments. So what we have now added that we have added that only subnet one will be able to talk. So if we Try this out. So subnet one connections are allowed and subnet two connections are not allowed. So if I try to ping from subnet two to subnet one, this should not be allowed now. Can you see the ping has now stopped? And why is that stopped? Because we have changed the firewalls, firewall rules so that only one machine should be able to able to talk to each other all right great so guys i hope this particular diagram is clear so what we have done so far is we have created a vpc we created two subnets these two subnets we basically had a routing table associated with it which is created by default this routing table did not have access to internet so we created an internet gateway and we included that internet gateway in the routing table and then we were able to basically access both the subnets from the internet all right then we went ahead and configured the two types of firewalls that we learned first the network uh, the, the subnet level firewall and then we configure try to configure the instance level firewall right now let's go ahead and understand the different kind of subnets right now so the only thing that we understood is that we could create two subnets but there can be two types of subnets which you can basically go ahead and create the first subnet is basically called a public subnet and the other subnet is basically called a private subnet so a public subnet is a subnet which can basically be accessed by the internet and a private subnet is a subnet which cannot be accessed by the internet. Now, what do we mean by that? So right now, both our subnets are being able to be accessed by the internet. But what I want is only one subnet should be able to access, uh, should be able to be accessed by the internet and the other subnet should not be able to access by the internet. Now, how is that possible? How is that possible? So it is possible using an architecture like this. So what we are basically going to do is uh, we are basically going to have two subnets. We are going to have an internet gateway, but uh, from the main routing table, we are going to not associate that uh, routing table to our subnet one, right? We are going to create a separate routing table for our subnet two, right? Which is not going to be associated with the internet gateway. So all in all short, uh, in the first routing table, the main routing table, we are going to remove the subnet two, 
and we'll only have subnet one, which is basically going to access internet. And we are going to create one more routing through the table so that uh, our second subnet can associate with it and then be able to talk to the uh, first instance or the subnet one instance. Okay, so let's go ahead and implement an architecture like this. So what we need to do in our existing VPC is here nothing will change. Subnet level, nothing will change. In the routing tables, what we're going to do is, this is my demo one routing table. Let's say this is going to be my public routing table since this already has the internet gateway attached, right? Uh, let's create one more routing table. Let's call it as demo one routing table, but this is private, okay? And this will be associated to VPC demo one uh, VPC. Let's create it. Okay, this is created. Now in the demo one public routing table, we are basically going to go ahead and edit subnet associations. And I want to remove uh, subnet two from over here, which is this. Let's remove this. So only subnet one I want to associate. So I just click on save. So now only one subnet is associated, which is subnet one, which basically means if I try to access my instances, Now let's try to SSH. This is subnet one. Let's try to SSH into it. This is working perfectly fine. Okay, this should not work. Let me check what has happened. So this is the route. This is basically having an internet gateway for this subnet which is fine then we have this routing table okay so in this i will have to edit i will have to select the subnet save it okay And now you can see that this instance has stopped working. I can just quickly go ahead. and try connect to the subnet two machine which is this ip you can see i'm not able to connect now right and why am i not able to connect because for my second subnet it is now not having any route for the internet gateway right but for my first machine it is having a route for the internet gateway. So that's why if I uh, exit this and try to connect again to my first machine, the subnet one machine, I'm able to connect, but for this machine, it is giving me an error now or it is not connecting. Why? Because this machine no longer has internet access. Okay. But what we can do is we can try connecting to this machine. Uh, the subnet two machine from within the VPC, which basically means that uh, if I come back to my diagram, okay. So in this now, what is basically happening is that from the internet, uh, I am from the public route table, I'm able to connect to subnet one machine, but from the internet, I'm not able to connect to subnet two machine. 
so what i can do is and observe uh, you know the, uh, the the reaction over here that i will be able to go inside this vpc and i will be able to connect to subnet 1 from subnet 1 i will be able to connect to this machine right now from this machine i can basically go go through this route table and then connect to this machine do you understand this network architecture right so from this route table obviously i cannot connect to this subnet because this route table does not have any details regarding this particular subnet okay but this particular route table the private route table has uh, basically allowed connections between these two subnets and because of that what we can do is we can basically go ahead and connect to this machine and from this machine i can ssh into this particular machine but it obviously has to be using the private ip addresses okay so let's try that let's try that over here so what i'm going to do is first i need on my subnet one the key pair so let me go ahead and copy the key pair so i'll just go ahead and Copy the key pair on this machine. Done. Let me again go inside it. So I'm inside the first machine now, and I have this key pair over here. Let me give it the required permission. has it and now let's try to go inside the second machine and that we will do now using the private ip and as you can see i'm inside the second machine now so you can see the ip address is 192 dot one dot two dot nine six this ip address is one nine two dot one dot two dot nine six however if i try to go through the public ip address from my machine into it i will not be able to do that since there is no internet connection but because there is a possibility or there is a connection between this machine and this machine i'm able to ssh from this machine into the subnet to machine okay and that is what we have just done great so now we saw how to create a machine with no internet access and i can show you guys that there is no internet access so since this is subnet to machine if i try to curl google.com you can see there is no response right there is it basically just hung why because google.com is not reachable however if i go back to my subnet one machine so i have just ssh i have ssh out i exited the ssh of the second machine and i'm now inside the first machine as you can see the ip address has changed so if i go over here and try to do curl google.com you can see that i'm able to see some content from the internet but in this case i was not able to see any content why because uh, the second machine does not have internet access and the first machine has internet access now in what cases will it be beneficial it will be really beneficial in cases wherein the uh, let's say in subnet 2 i have a resource which i do not want anyone from the internet to be able to access okay i why i don't want that because probably it's a very critical machine for me i don't want this machine to be hacked in any sort of way right so that's why i do not want anyone from the internet to be able to reach it out so 
in that cases what we do is we create private subnets right now there is a use case wherein probably somebody from the internet should not be able to reach out to this subnet but from within the machine if the machine wants to access internet that should be possible so how can that be achieved right so that can be achieved uh, right uh, giving internet access to private subnets that can be achieved by using something called as nat gateways so what are nat gateways nat gateways are basically resources which help private subnets to use the internet now how does it help it by basically giving a proxy connection to the internet gateway so what's going to happen is it's basically going to help us connect to the uh, the private or the public subnet and from the public subnet we will be able to access the internet so basically you can imagine it like this that a nat gateway is going to be a machine which will be deployed in the public subnet and our system is going to ping that machine to access the internet right so that is what a nat gateway so how can you create a nat gateway you can basically just go to uh the vpc menu and then you can go to uh something called as nat gateways here it is and you can click on create nat gateway let's call it demo one hyphen nat uh which subnet do you want it to be uh used in we want it to be used in uh subnet two and subnet 2 it needs an elastic uh, ip to work so let's allocate it so so it has to be sorry it has to be associated with a public subnet because this has to be deployed in a public subnet and then we will try to reach out to this nat gateway from our private subnet right so we will deploy it in subnet 1 which is basically having internet access and then we are going to click on create nat gateway and now what is going to happen is basically it is going to create a machine in the public subnet and this machine we are going to reach out from our subnet to for internet okay so nat gateway was created successfully so if you can see the state is pending it will take some time to get deployed so let's give it that time you can refresh. State is pending. So now what we need to do is once it is deployed, we can go to route tables. We'll go to a private route table, go to routes. And now we can just click on edit route. So now what we want to do is we want to add a route to the NAT gateway so that they can connect to each other. So we'll click on add route we will give all connection to what to the nat gateway and since it is being deployed it will take some time so let's give it that time let me go ahead and again check our nat gateway still in pending state it will take some time So it usually takes around three to four minutes to deploy. So let's give it that time. Because like I said, this is a machine which is launched, right? So this machine is launched and the software is deployed on it. So it takes some while to get deployed. And once it is deployed, you will be able to see it in your route tables. So if we look at the details for the SNAP gateway, you can see 
there this is the private ip address for this nat gateway oh i think we have deployed it in some other vpc guys we have deployed it in custom vpc sorry for that so we'll have to click on create nat gateway nat hyphen demo one um new and this has to be okay this has to be a part of 6d 6d 69d this is the one so we basically connected to vpc subnet one subnet one this is some other subnet that i created earlier we basically wanted to connect it to subnet one demo one this is our uh, vpc right this is the public subnet for us and let's allocate an ip address click on create nat gateway okay really sorry so i selected the wrong vpc in this case so this is the one which is being created now so you will see that this failed so why did, did this fail this failed because in the custom vpc that we that that there is there is one more vpc which exists right so there is no internet gateway which is connected to that uh, particular vpc and that's why it failed right but if we see ours it will basically get deployed in some time So if we select the details for this NAT gateway, now let's verify if everything is correct. So the VPC is VPC hyphen demo one, subnet is subnet one hyphen demo one. This is the IP address. So this IP address is according to the CIDR range of subnet one, which is again correct, right? Okay, this looks good. Okay, so as you can see, the NAT has been created now. And now if I go to route tables, if I go to the private route table, click on edit routes, click on add route. Here, if I go to NAT gateway, I can see the NAT demo one new. I can add the destination as 0.0, .0 click on save routes. This is done, right? Now, what has changed? So now if I try to access the subnet to machine, I will still not be able to SSH into it from my terminal, from the outside. So if I try this out, this will still not work. Why it will not work? Because uh, this subnet still does not have outside internet access, From but from within it, it can go ahead and use the internet. So now if I try to SSH into my second machine, this is now my, subnet to machine and from here if i now do a curl on google.com you can see that the internet can be accessed right so how is that possible that is possible using nat gateways finally let's go ahead and understand what is vpc pairing now, now vpc pairing is a very simple concept now what it says is if you have two vpcs and if they want to be able to interact with each other, you basically just have to create a pairing connection. That's about it, right? You could create two VPCs, and if these two VPCs want to interact with each other, not on the internet, but using the internal network, you can do that by creating a pairing connection. Now, how can you create a pairing connection? So first of all, what you can do is, uh, let me go to VPC. Let me quickly go ahead and see the three VPCs that I have. So I have a default VPC, which everyone has when you create, uh, you know, an AWS account. So what I'll do is I'll basically go ahead and launch an EC2 machine in the default VPC. So I click on launch instance. uh select the ubuntu server 
and I want to deploy it in the default VPC, which is correct. Uh, select the default security group. Launch it. So this is my default instance, which is there in the default VPC. Now what I want is this instance should be able to talk to subnet one machine and subnet two machine via the private IP addresses. So if you see the private IP address for this is 172.range, right? And uh, the subnet one and subnet two machine are in the 192.range. So I want these two machines to be able to talk to each other. So right now, if I go ahead and uh, this is my subnet one machine now. If I go ahead and try to ping this particular machine, the default machine using the private IP, obviously I will not be able to ping it. You can see the ping is not happening. However, uh, if I go ahead and connect to this machine, using the public IP. I'm able to connect, right? But this machine is not able to ping this machine over the private IP. Now we are going to change this. So how can we change that? Uh, come back to your VPC console, scroll down to the VPC pairing section. Okay, so there is something called as uh, VPC peering. Peering connections. Let's click on create peering connection. And let's say this is a VPC or let's say this is demo one to default. So who's the requester? Let's say uh, demo one is the requester. This is the CIDR range. And what I want to go ahead and connect to is the default VPC. And I want to click on create pairing connection. Okay, so you can say it says pending acceptance. Okay, and now what you can do is click on actions, click on accept request. And now you can see this pairing connection is now active. Okay, but that does not mean, mean the ping is going to work. The ping is not yet going to work. What you have to do is you have to go to route tables. So since this is a subnet one machine, I'll have to add a route in the subnet one table. Let's add a route that anyone should be able to connect to the pairing connection. So if I add this range, click on save routes. Okay, one second. So 192.1.1.0 slash 24, save routes. And here, I think we'll have to add this CIDR range, which is 172.31. Okay, the route has been created. And now, same I will have to do in the default route table as well, which is this one for the default VPC. So I'll select this, edit routes, add a route. This will be for 192.1.0.0 slash 16. 
pairing connection. This is the one. Click on save routes. And now you can see the ping has started to work. So now what is they being able to ping each other? So basically, this is my subnet one machine. My subnet one machine is now able to ping the default uh, instance that I created in the default VPC. Why? Because we have created the pairing connection. Uh, similarly, from here, I will be able to ping the subnet one machine. So it will take some time. Uh, let me check. Okay. I think in the security group I have not enabled, so I'll have to just change the security group settings quickly. Uh, this, this is the default one, demo one, security group. I'll have to go to inbound rules. And here, this, this small rule I'll have to change. And I basically want to allow everyone to be able to connect. And once this is done, even my second instance is able to talk to my other VPC, which is there in the other instance. Right? So guys, this is what VPC pairing means. That two VPCs are now able to talk to each other by creating a pairing connection and having their connection details in the routing table. So guys, this is how you go ahead and create a VPC pairing connection. So first of all, EMR is called Elastic MapReduce and it is a managed cluster platform. So this will simplify big data frameworks. So let's say you want to run Hadoop on the cloud. So instead of running a server, downloading Hadoop in that and configuring every single step, you can just go ahead with Amazon EMR, just type uh, in the name of your cluster, choose the software, choose the big data tools which you need. Once you've done that, you can give how many nodes you want, that is the master and slaves. So let's say one master, two slaves, you can have that. Once you mention that, you'll have to provide a role and that's it, you'll just have to click on create cluster and it'll do the rest for you. So that's how simple Amazon EMR is. Now let's look into the benefits of Amazon EMR. So first of all, if you look into this, uh, there is cost efficient. So that, as I told, uh, you'll just have to pay as you go. Then allows AWS integration. You can integrate it with other AWS services. Then comes easy deployment. As I told you, you'll just have to give in few details and hit click. It'll automatically uh, do that. And then comes scalable and flexible. So as I told you, there is auto scaling available. And also it is flexible because you can terminate it. You can stop it whenever you want. It is reliable because they provide you an SLA of 99.9%, .9%, which basically means it never goes down. It is always on. And then secure. So obviously AWS provides you a lot of security features. You can use IAM, which is for identity and access management, where you give permissions to users. If they have, if they have the permission, they'll be able to use this particular service, EMR. If they don't have the permissions, they'll not be able to use it. And then easy to monitor. So there is a service called CloudWatch. So it is auto automatically integrated with all the AWS services. So you don't have to even do anything. You can get the metrics automatically. Finally, easy management. You're not going to manage anything. You're not going to uh, patch anything. You're not going to add any uh, code. You're not going to debug it. Everything will be taken care of by AWS. You'll just have to uh, set it up and that's it. So we've seen the benefits as well. Then the EMR architecture. So how exactly it uh, 
so how exactly it is uh, what is that hosted in the cloud so that would be your question right so let's say in your local system you would have the how to pick a system because you'll know you will be downloading it and then you will install it you will configure it you will set it up in the cloud it is almost the same architecture so you can see that emr architecture remains identical to the normal hadoop cluster architecture local file systems of the nodes hdfs or emrfs are used as storage nodes for emr so you can use the local file systems of the nodes that is local file systems in the sense the local file systems which is hosted in the cloud so that local file system is basically amazon s3 so s3 is the backend for hdfs so as i told you s3 is used for storage so s3 is also used for storing hdf that is storing files in it so using the emr file system that is emrfs amazon emr extends hadoop to add the ability to directly access data stored in amazon s3 it is not that you will have to push the data into hdfs and then you will you will have to analyze it instead you can store the data in amazon s3 itself so directly from s3 you will be able to query and analyze the data most often amazon s3 is used to store input and output data and also the results are stored in hdfs so these are the temporary files are basically stored in hdfs the input data and the output data both are stored in s3 so this is how it basically works guys it's pretty simple it's a cluster format uh, if you know about the big data services it is the same architecture on aws as well so if you don't know the architecture i uh, tell you so i ask you to go and please go and check that out check out hdfs check out hadoop check out map reduce and all that so once you get uh, an idea of that you will get an idea of how it is hosted on the cloud because it's similar so let's say it will have a backend server running and in that backend server hadoop will be installed configured and everything would be set up over there and once that is set up guys uh, amazon s3 it is pretty simple i'll show you how to start up with that as well and then you will be able to set up uh, whatever service you want hive hadoop spark uh, hbase anything so this is the basic architecture okay so the main processing frameworks available for emr is hadoop map reduce and spark so one more thing the uh, most popular frameworks are hadoop and spark there are other frameworks which you can use on emr as well but the most popular ones are hadoop and spark okay so now emr applications that is what are the other applications available on emr as i told you you can see over here it supports many applications hive pig spark streaming platform it supports yarn it supports hue it supports mostly all the uh, apache uh, products that is the hadoop ecosystem products so you can go ahead and look into that uh, more so we'll not be covering this a lot now next i'll be doing a hands on using hive on emr so let's do that so in addition amazon emr also supports open source projects that that have their own cluster management functionality instead of using yarn so instead of using yarn if you are using your own resource management then that is also fine so emr allows that as well okay guys so we've seen that so now let's do an hands on on amazon so first of all to start off just a quick info for all of you cloud enthusiasts if you want to make a career in aws then you might want to check out intellipath's aws certification training course for solution architect learn from industry experts through hands on session projects and case study reach us out to know more with this you will need an aws account so i suggest you to get an aws account soon and start practicing okay so right now i'm already in the emr console i have logged in and it's pretty simple and you can just search emr over here and click here and you will be inside the emr yeah so i am here so just one second i'll have to show you s3 okay first of all let's uh, create a bucket here so what we are going to do we are going to create a bucket to get our output so our output will be stored in the bucket we are going to create so this is the this is very simple click on create bucket provide a name so let me give as youtube live webinar 1 and i'm going to just create i'm not going to set up anything i'm just going to create this 
So it is this simple start bucket. So a bucket is basically a repository or a folder where all the files are stored. So it's pretty simple guys. You will just have to remember that. So a bucket is basically a folder where you can store all kinds of files. It may be video, audio, all kinds of binary files can be stored here. So we've created a bucket. So you can see there's an upload option as well, but we're not going to upload anything over here right now because this bucket is for our output. Okay, now let's start with EMR. But before starting off with EMR, I'll just get a file one second. Yeah, so the file is over here. Yeah, okay. Cool. So we are going to create a cluster. So why creating a cluster? I'll be explaining that. So first of all, to start off with EMR, uh, get yourself an AWS account, but there is no free tier in EMR. So there will be a small charge. It will be around let's say 0 0.04, something like that. It will be a very small amount. So you can go ahead with that. But make sure that you terminate your uh, cluster immediately. So create cluster. So first of all, to start off with EMR, as I told you, get an account. Then you can start off with this. Then come to Amazon EMR. Go to clusters. Click on create cluster. OK, so now it's the simple setup. It's very, very simple. So first of all, give your cluster a name. I'm going to name it as webinar cluster, okay? And then uh, let logging be on. Logging in the sense, whatever happens, the setup, the, let's say, the configuration, everything will be loaded and it will be stored in this folder. So it will be stored in this folder in S3. So let it be, that's fine. Next, coming down. So this is going to be cluster. We are going to uh, start with a cluster and software configuration. So this is where you'll have to choose guys. So here you can see core Hadoop. That is Hadoop, Hive, U, Mahout, Pig, and Test. So anyway, we are going to only use Hive. So I'm going to choose first one. Then there is for HBase, Presto, and Spark. If you want more options, if you want to choose multiple services, you can click on go to advanced options and so, and you can see here, you get to see all the available applications. You can choose whatever application you want. Example, TensorFlow, uh, Zookeeper, uh, if there is Kafka, then there is Flink, Tez. You can choose whichever you want, and then you can set it up. But right now, we're going to go with quick options because it's easier to understand at the start. So it was the same. So I'm not going to change anything. And so you can see. Yeah, so I'm going to go with core Hadoop. And this is the most basic instance type in EMR. So let it be. And the number of instances are going to be three. There will be one master and two core nodes, which is basically one master, two slaves. So that will be a master slave architecture. And then I'm going to choose an EC2 key pair. Anyway, we're not going to use this. But if you want to log in to the Hadoop system and check out what is happening inside of it, you will need this. But anyway, we're not going to open it, but still I'm showing you. Uh, so key pair, you, you can learn about the key pairs and how to log in with a key pair from our other AWS tutorials in our YouTube channel. You can check that out. Okay, so uh, this is my key pair and choose a permission. Uh, I'm going to go with default because it's already configured as we'll be taking the data, of, uh, pushing the data into S3. So I'm going to go with this, uh, yeah. Okay, so now you can see this and if I hit create cluster, it will start, but I'm not going to do because I'm going to go and do this exact same thing in advanced options. I think I understood this part. If I click create cluster, it will create a cluster. So the, there's, there's one small step in this. That is, we'll have to uh, mention the input data and the output folder where the uh, result has to be stored. So I'm not going to make any changes. It is going to be the exact same configuration. I'm not going to change anything. The only change we'll be making is adding a step. So our step would be a Hive program because that's what we're going to do. We are going to include a Hive script. So I'm going to click that and I'm going to click add step. Okay, so you can see script S3 location. So we'll have to provide the location of where the script is available. Then we'll have to provide the S3 location of the input files, and then we'll have to provide the output location, which we created. Okay, and an argument. Okay, so that is fine. 
coming down so this is what i wanted to show you guys so uh, if you want to check out this you can just go ahead with the documentation provided by aws for amazon emr so this is one of the tutorials they provide so this is the script link so the script is over here i'll explain to you about this this is the script this is the script link and this is the input folder so as you can see this is the input folder of the s3 bucket and inside this bucket there is a uh, sub file called cloudfront inside that there is a sub file called code and inside that there is the script file okay that is fine and then there is the input okay and this is basically a command which aws told to add in the argument section so that if there is any uh, keyword mismatch it will automatically take care of it okay that is fine next coming to summary so this is the script which will be running in hive okay so you can see this and this is pretty much pretty much it uh, what exactly we are doing right now so this sample shows you how to analyze cloudfront logs stored in s3 using hive so we are using hive on emr to analyze logs which are generated from cloudfront but we are not going to do anything in cloudfront that logs are already stored in s3 but not in mine in aws's official sample repository so we are going to take that data push it into hive and once it is in hive this script will run this script will process the data and give us the output and we can download it and check the acquired results so to check that First of all, you'll have to set it up. And before that, you can see over here, you'll have, so this script is creating a table. So it's creating a date. It's, uh, you can see local time, location, bytes, host, uh, OS, and browser. So what we're going to do is we are just going to get the count of the OS uh, inputs. So coming down, you can see total requests per operating system for a given time frame. So what result we are going to get is, for example, uh, there is Mac OS, there is Windows, there is Ubuntu, then there is Android, so all of that operating systems. So uh, let's say in CloudFront, there is an application running. Uh, so app CloudFront is basically uh, CDN, okay? So there is a, so let's forget about that. Let's just concentrate on this. There is an application running, guys. So that application could be accessed from all kinds of operating systems, from a Windows system, from a Mac, uh, Mac system that is an Apple laptop, or from an iPhone, from, uh, from a Safari uh, browser, uh, which is an iOS, then there is uh, Ubuntu, then there is Android. So that application could be accessed from all these operating systems. So the output we'll be getting is how many hits were from each Windows or Mac or uh, any operating system. So the output would be the operating system and the number of hits this particular application got from that operating system. So this data is already available. So it's not going to be dynamically changing. It is static data. Okay, so I think I've explained to you this part. Now let us start off with configuring this. So first of all, I'll have to provide the S3 uh, location. So this is the S3 location. So I'm going to provide this. Done. Next is the S3 input location, which is this. I'm going to provide this. Next would be our output S3 location. So for this, we can search over here. And this is the bucket which should contain our output files. So I'm going to click it, select. Okay, next is the argument. I'm going to copy this and paste it over here. So now this action on failure is, if this particular code or this particular process fails, it should continue and create this particular cluster or you can cancel and wait. Uh, so basically the cluster will be stopped and then terminate cluster. If this particular uh, little, uh, uh, for this script we are running fails, then this cluster will be automatically terminated if you give terminate cluster, but I'm not going to give that, I'm going to give continue. If this step fails, our cluster will still be active. So that's what it means. So now I'm clicking on add. And you can see we have set this up. That is the only extra step. I'm just going to give next, next. I'm not going to change anything. Yeah, so you can review it once. 
So you can see it is proceed without an uh, easy to keep pair. I'm going to give my keep pair and create cluster. So guys, it will take from five to uh, 10 minutes to create this. So you can see the steps over here. Uh, you can see first this step will be completed. That is the setup will be completed. Then Hadoop and debugging everything will be completed. Once that is done, the Hive program will start running within the cluster. Once that is done, we'll be able to see our output in this particular bucket. So if I open this bucket right now, you'll not be able to see. Let me just refresh. Yeah, so I'm inside the bucket. So right now there are no files inside this bucket. Once this is done, we'll be able to see that. So as I told you, it'll take some time. So let me go to, let me click on clusters. Here you can see I already had a cluster which I terminated. So the, it, you can see it is my cluster because once I went into advanced options, I did not change the cluster's name. So it was my cluster only. So it's the same. It is right now starting. And once we see complete over here, then this process will start. And once this is complete, this process will start. And only then we'll be able to see the output. So then we'll download the file and see the output, guys. So I think that's clear right now. So this process is still starting. So as I told you, it will take from five to 10 minutes to this getting completed. The thing is we added a step before we launched. You can also add a step once it is set up. So you can see here, you can also add a, uh, a sorry, you can also add a step once you've uh, created your cluster. You can choose a pick program, a hive, a streaming program, or a custom jar program. So if I want to add another hive program, it's again the same setup and you can do that. Okay, so we've seen this, it's still starting. So there is nothing else to do over here. Going back, okay. So while doing this, I'll also explain the other things about this cluster because there is no uh, need to waste your time as well because it's everybody's precious time over here. Okay, so coming to hardware, you can see this because we wanted to launch three instances. One is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, one is a master instance, two core instances. You can see the two core, core instances are created. The master instance is currently under creation. And so right now we have not enabled any scaling policy. Let me explain to you about the scaling policy. So it is basically for auto scaling. Click on edit, come down. So you can see enable cluster scaling, use EMR named scaling. So come, come over here. EMR will automatically increase and decrease the number of instances in core and task nodes based on workload. So if the workload increases, it will automatically increase the number of instances. If the workload decreases, it will automatically decrease the number of instances. Okay, let me close this. I'm seeing running over here. Yeah. So the instances are running guys. So you can check out the steps over here as well. You can see the instances are running, but the steps are still pending. So now this step has completed. So once the instance is run, it got set up in four seconds. If you want to check out this logs, just click over here. So right now there are no logs. So once the log is created, you can just refresh and see over here and that logs will be available in S3 and you can go check out those logs. But this step is still running. And now it is completed, guys. So let's go over here, refresh this, and hope that we get an output. And we got an output. So let me open this folder and let me download this. Okay, sorry, that's not the folder. That's not the folder which we want to download. We can download that or we can go inside and download this. So the thing is we have two nodes that, so why do we have two nodes is that we'll be splitting work and giving it to each instance. That is the uh, half or some of the work will be given to the first instance and some of the work will be given to the second instance. So you see two files over here. So this file would have been uh, processed in the first instance. This file would have been processed in the second instance. So now let's download Sorry, I think it's not possible. Let me click download the first one. 
click and download sorry i downloaded it multiple times okay so we've downloaded it i'll go to the folder so as i told you the output would be uh the os name and the number of hits and you can see this let me open this as well yeah okay i think uh, you're able to see right now you can see android 855 hits windows 883 hits linux 813 mac 852 os x which is for the apple laptops uh macbooks so it's 799 and in ios it's 794 so we've got the files guys over here so this is this actually means that our program ran successfully we created a hive uh, sorry we created an emr cluster successfully we ran a hive program on it and we also got an output the thing is this file is very small that's why we got an output in less than a minute but if your file is very very large and it takes a lot of time to process then obviously it will take around 10 to 15 minutes according to the size of your file and sometimes it can also take uh, hours because you might have uh, let's say petabytes of data so going back over here you have successfully created the cluster we ran a hive program and both of the steps have succeeded let me just click here yeah so both of the steps have been uh, succeeded so it is waiting because right now there is no process running if you want to add a process you can click on step and add another program to run your uh, program and process data so you can do that you can see all the interactive jobs over here. If there is any current job running, you can see the job. So for example, we were running this Hive program. So while running, we could have seen that job over here. So the thing is, this cluster can uh, be shared among other users in my AWS account so that all of them can run a job at the same time. And we can check all the jobs running over here. So I think that's uh, pretty much it. So it's pretty simple to start off with this. It's pretty simple to create a cluster, run your own program with your own input data set. The thing is, while running the Hive program, we gave an input uh, data link. So instead of providing that link, you could, you could provide your own data set, and you could provide your own Hive script, and you could provide your own output location. So output location is pretty simple. You can just give any location which you want. But the input script and the input data location should be provided and that's it it will automatically run the script and get your data processed you can download the upload and take the data and do whatever you want with it now what we are going to see is terraform so we'll have to understand a few things before getting into terraform. now this is my aws account now this is my AWS account. For example, in this case, this guy is, is a system administrator. And this guy is a system administrator. Okay. Who's handling this environment? Who's handling this environment? AWS Cloud. Now what happens? He is the one who set up all infrastructures in our cloud environment. All infrastructures in our cloud environment. Like it can be, he is the one who architected the design and that a cloud application, cloud environment consists of EC2, VPC, and other services like S3, database, RDS, etc. etc. Now here, in this case, let's consider he is working for four years in a company. He worked for a company. He worked for four years in a company. Then if he moves out of the company or the organization, if all of these environments, whatever he has set it up, if it doesn't have any proper, if it doesn't have any proper documentation, what will happen? A new guy who is coming, a new guy, whoever is coming, will not understand what exactly it is, like how the infrastructure is being created, what is what is the purpose of 
what what is the purpose of ec2 service how many ec2 services are there and everything will be in a mess basically no but the new guy will not understand how exactly the entire architecture has been designed or created and and the next thing everything is a manual task everything is a manual task in the sense here if i wanted to create five ec2 instances i will have to create it five ec2 instances manually the same way if i wanted to create a vpc i will have to create it manually and everything is a manual process in creating all of these services using a console so now whatever we are doing it here is is all through console so whatever i am creating it here is all through console again if i wanted to create an ec2 instances what i will have to do again i will have to go launch an ec2 instance and and again i'll have to create it then in this case a new tool called as terraform comes into picture it, it 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 is not a very old tool at all it was it, it was developed in the year 2014 if i'm not wrong it was developed in the year 2014 okay now what this tool does it it came up with a new concept called as infrastructure infrastructure as code now what we do instead of creating it manually over console so what we do is we create it as a code and we deploy it now what happens anything which you created will have a trace of the code correct like whatever if i if i create a three ec2 instances and i will have a code of it like so that and moreover what happens is it brings reusability like i play new all those things it brings in reusability so all you do is you write code once and you use it multiple times and moreover it brings in automation automation of infrastructure automation of infrastructure and how this code is being created so they call it as it's a language so the whatever the code which we write to create this environment is called as hcl is called as hcl language and and how do we do it how do we create it and we will see everything different terms of terraform terraform is to code your infrastructure that is as simple as that like instead of creating everything over console manually so what we do is we create everything using code and what is that code and that is that code is nothing but hcl an extension of terraform file is called as .tf files .tf like for ansible we you we save it on save it as .yml file right likewise any terraform script will be saved in the form of dot dot tf files now using terraform using terraform what are all the services we can code there are lots and lots of services which can be coded using terraform like major cloud platforms like aws google cloud azure azure ibm and then other providers like for example if you wanted to manage any other any other software in nutshell i can show you the list of providers which terraform supports terraform providers now using using terraform what all we can create these many services we can code it so if i wanted to create for example if i wanted to create what all we have seen here ha huh. let's consider if i wanted to create an sql service sql server using terraform we can create it for example if i wanted to create a chef cookbooks i can use terraform to create it if i wanted to create azure active directory 
Terraform supports. If I wanted to maintain the entire AWS cloud or Azure cloud or Google cloud, everything is supported using, everything is done using Terraform. GitHub, GitLab. So whatever we have seen here, for example, let's consider a use case where I wanted to create a user in GitHub. Now what we do, we we manually log into GitHub and then we create user and then we we whatever the permission which we wanted to assign it to the user, we will be able to do it. Now using Git, I mean using Terraform. We can do the similar setup also. See here, if I wanted to create any GitHub repository, I can create it. How we will create it? Let's see. But what are the whatever the manual task which we do using a console, which can be achieved using Terraform as well. And the main purpose of it is to code your infrastructure. How does it benefit? It benefits in such a way that we can keep track of the every resource which we configure using Terraform. And also, uh, if we wanted to reuse it, we reuse the code. For example, I write the code once like function, and then it can be used later everywhere, wherever we wanted. Now, we need to understand few terms before we get into uh, creating any, any services using Terraform. Those are. Here, the first one is resource. Resource is nothing but, for example, if I wanted to create an EC2 instance, let's consider I wanted to create an EC2 instance. EC2 instance. Now, what we define? No, before resource, let me put few things, few more, few other things also. Providers. So providers are nothing but which one we are going to use it. For example, if it can be AWS or it can be GCP or it can be Azure or it can be Redis, whatever it is. So whatever, what, what we are going to code using Terraform. So which one it is. And the structure, basic structure remains same. But the functionality wise, it differs from providers to providers. For example, in AWS, we call it as EC2 service. In GCP, it is called as VM. Correct? Those technology terminology differs, but the core concept remains same. And the next one is next one is resource. What is resource? Let's consider we are using the we are using AWS provider. We are using AWS provider. Inside the AWS provider, inside the AWS provider, I wanted to create an EC2 instance. EC2 instance. In this case, what we what we do, we create a resource. We create a resource. This is called as resource. Any services inside your provider is called as resource. Whatever we are trying to create is then called as resource. Variables. So variables are nothing but an input value which can be defined while writing our Terraform script. Output. Now, output is the resultant value. For example, using a provider AWS and creating an EC2 instance. Okay. Let's consider an input value I'm giving. So if I wanted to create an EC2 instance, what all is required? What all is required? If I wanted to create an EC2 instance, now what we can do is we can input these values by creating our EC2 instance. That is nothing but variable. And the next one is, for example, after creating this EC2 instance, it will come up with some values. For example, instance ID, correct? Automatically it comes up with. Then instance IP address. And these are the output values. So whatever the input values which we are giving it, from that 
we will get an output value. So that is called as output. Okay. Terraform plan. This terraform plan is a command. Okay. Terraform plan is a command in the sense, for example, I have P score using all of these, uh, I mean, all of these things, I've created a terraform script. Now I wanted to test that script before I actually apply it. In that case, what we will do, we will run Terraform plan. So Terraform plan, what will happen is, it will just do a dry run before we apply it. That is what Terraform plan. Terraform apply. So Terraform apply is a command which is used to, to apply all your changes. In the sense, uh, if I wanted to create any EC2 instances, first what will I do? I will create, I will create, I create the uh, Terraform script. Then to test it, I will run Terraform plan. Then if everything looks good, then what we will do? We will create, I mean, we will then run Terraform apply. Then Terraform apply will apply all your changes in the script in the script then terraform destroy so destroy will delete all your changes whatever is there in your delete all your changes delete all your changes and the next one is terraform init here Let's consider we are using AWS provider. Correct. Okay? Now here let's consider this is your machine from where you are, you are running all of these scripts. Now here, all we would have done is install Terraform into this machine. Terraform into this machine. Now I want commands which is specifically for AWS. Which is specifically for AWS, correct? Only then AWS related uh, configurations will work. In that case, after writing all your code, first you will have to run Terraform, Terraform init. So what it does, is, what it does is it initializes all modules or the all the required modules which are essential to run your script. That is nothing but Terraform init which initializes all your modules which are required to run your service. I mean, run your scripts. That is nothing but Terraform init. Then what else is required? Very important thing is TF state file. TF state file. Name itself says in the sense, TF state file is nothing but a state file which holds all configurations of whatever you have created using, whatever you have created using, using term. In the sense, for example, I wrote a script where it creates one EC2 instance. Okay. Now, in the same EC2 instance, I mean, the same script, what I'm doing it is, I'm creating, excuse me, I'm creating one more EC2 instance. Now, first one EC2 instance configuration is already added. One configuration is already added. It's already there. Correct. Now I'm adding second one. In this case, what it should do, it should not create the instance which has been already created. All it has to do is it has to create only the second one. How Terraform will know that one instance is already being created? And only the second one has to be created. And in that case, state file comes into picture. So any configuration which you run, it first checks with your it first checks with your TF state file whether all of these configurations are matching your TF state file and with your to the current configuration file which you have written. If anything is missed, then it will then it will create the required services. So that is the function of PF statement. Cool. Now, 
and this is one of the most predominantly or widely used tool in devops industry at this point of time till now any uh, infrastructure related activities are uh, handled manually now everything is being coded and terraform is one of the one of the important tool which has been used in the industry and i would really recommend you guys to go through it so we we'll use aws for our for our configuration what is the first step first step is to install terraform on your machine now what i will do i will use one of my uh, ec2 instance which i have created Okay, first what we will do, let's install Terraform on that machine. So how do we do it? All you'll have to do is download Terraform. You will get the version of it. So all you can do is whichever version you wanted to install. If, if, it, if you're trying it in your local machine, you can use, uh, you can download Windows and then try it. Or if you have any, Windows machine, just download accordingly. Let me download this one here. Copy. And then double get. Yes. Now I've downloaded the downloaded the file. Actually, you, you will see something called as this. Then what you need to do is you will have to move this file to if it is Linux machine, move Terraform to user local pin. Then what you will have to do, check then CD space user local pin. Then once it is done, Terraform. Why it is not running? Terraform to user. Okay. So you will have to move, just download the file, just copying it and just writing it here so that then move the file to move, unzip, first unzip, unzip, second move the file to move Terraform to user. Okay. Once it is done, you will be able to, you, you can check and verify with the command Terraform iPhone iPhone. And the latest version is this one. 12.24 uh, is the latest version which is available. Now we are set with this. Now what is the next step? Let's consider we wanted to create an EC2 instance from this machine. In this case, what we will have to do is, now one logical question, okay? If I wanted to manage, if I wanted to manage this account, what is required? For example, if I wanted to manage this AWS account using an CLA, what is required? So what we need to do is, we need a credential where we can manage the account using our Terraform or whatever it is. For that, what we will have to do, first we will have to go and create one user. If somebody is new to the cloud, so what you will have to do is go to service, IAM, IAM, IAM is the service, which is used to create your 
uh, user accounts. Then go to users. Then I'm creating a user with the name Terraform. Terraform. So all it needs is just programmatic access. Right? So I'm just giving programmatic access and then click next. Here, what we'll do, we'll attach existing policies directly. We'll give administrator access so that using that Terraform account, it can do anything it wants over this account. But in real time, you will have to come up with a best practice solution where we can actually give access to the console in a better way for any uh, programmatic access. Now let me name it name Terraform, just Terraform and then click review, create user. And then let me download this credential 73. Now here, now here, what we are trying to do? So we are trying to create an EC2 instance using this. So what I'm doing it is I'm just going to one directory, and then what I'm doing, I'm creating one directory, KTAR, and then press. And then I'm going into that. I'm creating one more directory, okay, DAR. I'm creating DevOps. So in this directory only, we will have all our configs. All our configurations will be in this directory, correct? Here, what we'll have to create, we will have to create one file called as main dot here let me create one file here in this let me get into this file insert now what is the first step if we wanted to manage we will have to define provider and mandatory so now first what we will do we will define a provider here we will define our provider here version is nothing but earlier they were using 2.2 uh, version 2 with 3 they have included so many other new services also like ECS cluster so many other services were also included in version 3 with new features that, that that's it now what I'm doing it I'm just doing this one that's it and provider AWS version region now it is done now what we will have to do we will have to download that provider into our machine how do we do it which command we use that to initialize all modules terraform terraform in it so okay now we know that we wanted to configure aws account now how aws i mean how this Terraform will know that which AWS account I will have to manage? It will not know. Okay? In that case, what we will have to do, we will have to configure credentials of that AWS account with this Terraform. How do we do that? End of the year. So what are the keys which we have created? Just give me on. Access key ID. What was the ah, Now here we will have to give our credentials whatever we have created.
access key id chef tensor pass your access key id and then pass your that's it good this is our configuration now this is our configuration now let's create an ec2 instance let's create an ec2 instance now our terraform is ready to configure our aws account okay now here what we will do we will create an ec2 instance using terraform so how do we do it you can either use main.tf or if you really want it no you can create multiple files also at this point of time it's not do that what we do we continue editing our file if if i wanted to create any resource then what i should use i should use a resource correct okay? i should use a resource now let's go and get the now what we are trying to configure we are trying to configure ec2 I'm trying to make it simple so that you understand it. That's it. So this this one we have seen, right? Access key and secret key. Now, access key and secret key is unique to each and every account. For example, I have an AWS account. You also have an AWS account, and others will also have their own AWS account. now using terraform how will i define which aws account i will manage it and that is where a access key secret key comes in okay now let's see now what it does ami is nothing but like for example like ami is nothing but like when we launch an ec2 instance what we do like see what are we do with man what are we doing with your manual we are doing with there also we select an ami right so instead of just selecting over console so what we do is we give an ami id every image as an id every image as an id and that is what we are giving it here every okay now what are all the features it supports let's consider if i wanted to create an ec2 instance these are the arguments which you can pass it in the sense which which availability zone you wanted to pass like us east 1a or us east 1b everything now at this point of time what what else is required as mandatory what else is required we need key correct we will create key name so these are the arguments which are being passed to the script so that we can create an ec2 instance now let's consider key i fun name which is nothing but i have one key which is devops and tag is nothing but the name which we 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 generally we give while creating an ec2 instance now name equal to let's consider terraform first instance terraform instance terraform instance now our first script is ready now what are we are doing see this aws underscore instance is the keyword which resource is what which we are creating which resource which, which we are creating here 
we are creating aws instance this is the name of the resource which we are giving it okay and for this aws instance to launch an ec2 instance what all is required we can pass see anything required is mandatory these arguments ami and instant type instance type is mandatory to launch an ec2 instance these two parameters are mandatory other than that we can customize all other configurations all other configurations we can customize it now till here we are done a resource aws instance terraform ami we have given instance type we have given key name we have given and then we have given a name for this ec2 instance okay now what is the next step we will have to terraform terraform plan correct so why do we do terraform plan so we run terraform plan to check whether all our configurations are done properly or not let's do it here now here see it is asking in which region we will have to configure it you remember so while configuring providers there was one option here region correct which i have deleted it region now here you can define your default region us east type and one is virginia I have defined it here. Now, if I run Terraform plan, use case to one. Wait, wait a second here. Because he understood me. Now, what will I do? Terraform. Now what it says? It says new machine will be launched. So this will be the configuration. Now what will I do? So how will I create a new machine here? I mean, if I want to apply these changes, what will I do? what will I have to do? Terraform. Terraform. Apply. Which command? Apply. Terraform apply. Now you will have to give yes. The moment you give yes, it says error. No subnets found for the default VPC. Please specify the subnet. Now what happens is, since whatever we have given it here, since whatever we have given it here, it tries to launch it on the default subnet. Now when I deleted my default subnet, Delete it when you look at here VPC. See here, I've deleted the default subnet and I've created my own subnet. With that configuration, what it does is, so, so whatever we have done here, so whatever we have done here, it tries to create this EC2 instance in the default subnet. Now that is what we got an error. See, for launching source instance, we see no subnets for the default VPC. Please specify the subnet. Now what we will do, we will go, Configure main.tf and then include one more configuration, which is nothing but submit. Let's check whether it is right. Submit underscore 
ID. That is the argument which we will have to pass. And this is the submit ID. Now again, what we will have to do after making changes, error form plan. Okay, now if you look at here, it will say that subnet ID is this one. Okay. Earlier, when you look at, you would have not seen that. Now, Terraform apply. Cool. Now we can see that one resource is added. Let me go to my EC2 instance. Earlier it was one instance, and now it is two instances. Two instances. Second instance. This instance is running here, and whatever configuration which we have given, it has come up. Now, now you can see one thing here. It did not have any public IP address. Correct. Okay? It did not have any public IP address. Now, in this case, what we can do, what is required if I wanted to, if I wanted to connect to this machine, a public IP address is required, correct? Now, let's create a public IP address for this machine and then attach it to it. Now, in this case, Terraform apply is already done. Earlier, you will not see one file called as terraform.tf state. After you apply your first change, after you apply your first change, this file will get created, terraform.state file. What is the purpose of this terraform.state file? It maintains all the information about your configuration. It maintains all the information about your configuration. This is your instance ID, see? This is your instance ID. The state file maintains all information about the resources which are configured using Terraform. Now let's see. Now what is the second requirement? Now what is the second requirement? If we wanted to attach any public IP address to that machine, if we wanted to attach any public IP address of this machine. Okay. Now in this case, what we wanted to do? Any guesses? If I wanted to create a public IP, if I wanted to create a public IP, there is a resource called as AWS EIP. Okay? There is a resource called as AWS EIP. Just go there. Here, what will I do? I create and so this. Now what we are doing? Here we are we are creating. Here we are creating one more resource, which is nothing but AWS EIP, and let's name it as let's name it as the Raform form iPhone instance EIP. Now this is nothing but getting a value of this is how we get value of other machine. So whatever we got it here. See the whatever we are getting it here. The, what is this? Uh, syntax is the older version syntax. Here we actually we don't need that. This uh, all of these things are not required. Now what I need to which machine we are attaching this elastic IP to this machine. Correct. And what is the resource name? It, which is AWS underscore instance. And what is the name of the resource? What is the name of the resource? Which is Terraform. It is Terraform. And ID, to understand that, we will have to understand a bit about what are all the values it results. Let's consider where is the EC2 instance, AWS instance. Let's 
See, attribute reference is nothing but what are all the values it can result. In the sense, see, what are all the values you get it in your TF statement. Here, uh, what is that ID card? See, this value it results from this configuration. What is that configuration? This value holds this machine. Now, what we are doing it? Now, what we are doing it in this configuration? I'm creating one more service, which is nothing but EIP, and this will and this will after creating that elastic IP, it has to be attached to this EC2 machine. How do I know that to which EC2 machine I will have to attach using this configuration value AWS instance dot terraform dot ID. This ID actually holds what the value of that machine, which is nothing but this one. This actually this one. This one, the value this one, let's consider if I run this value, what will happen? Terraform home plan. See what happens. It creates an EAP and then attaches and gets attached to that EC2 instance. Same way, what will happen? Let's see if I give that value. I'm replacing it with. So we are, these are dynamic values which we can get it. How do we get it? AWS underscore instance underscore sorry dot terraform dot id now again if i run terraform plan see we got the same value now let me apply it terraform apply last for check select yes now you don't see that public IP, any public IP is being attached here. Now, if I refresh it here, see one IP got attached to it. And this is how it works. Now, if using the same concept, what we can do is we can create any number of services which AWS provides with bit of fine tuning that is required. That is required according to a configuration, the best practices which we follow and everything. Now, let's talk about something called as variables. Now, the same concept is same. Variable is nothing but if you wanted to input any variable, then we use concept called as variable. Correct? If you wanted to pass any values from the user or get values from the user, then we define, define variable. And how do we do it? There are multiple ways to do it. One, what you can do is you can create a file called as variables.tf, whatever it can be. I will be giving it, I'll give it as inputs.tf. Inputs.tf. You can create the same method also. I created with, with the name inputs.tf. So what we can do is let me get some values from uh, the user. Why do we have to give this value automatically here? If I give everybody can use it, right? So what we can do is we can define it as a variable so that it doesn't be exposed. Now what I will do? I will define it in such a way that give var dot access underscore key and then var dot secret underscore key. 
So in this case, after defining it here, so go to inputs.pf file, we will have to define that variable. So how do I define that variable? Key name is variable and give the name variable. Let's what is the name I'm going to access underscore key then open bracket and then go close bracket and then name is we will have to define which variable type it is now what what variable type it is that is string and for, there are different types of variables also like uh, list of string maps of string tuple of string string lots of other things are also there this point of time let's not get into that level so there's value which which we require there is string and how do we do it type equal to string that's it and the same way we have one more variable also secret underscore key type equal to string and then close now with this what happens now let me check the configuration whatever terraform plan see now here it asks for the value what is the value var dot access key which i will have to get it from and then secret value That's it. Just a quick info for all of you cloud enthusiasts. If you want to make a career in AWS, then you might want to check out IntelliPath's AWS certification training course for Solution Architect. Learn from industry experts through hands-on session, projects, and case study. Reach us out to know more. So introduction to AWS DevOps. The first thing is why DevOps on AWS? So you can use DevOps on any cloud service or, or even on your on-premise uh, environment. So if you have a business running, you will uh, have an on-premise environment. You might have an infrastructure for yourself. You can run it on it also. But why AWS DevOps? That we'll see moving on. So first, what is AWS DevOps? AWS DevOps is a set of developer tools which is provided by Amazon Web Services. This allows us to create a CI CD pipeline from the scratch to the deployment stage that is from the source for example a version control tool maybe github maybe azure repos maybe aws code commit so from the source stage till the deploy stage we can do everything it is the same as uh, any devops tools any devops lifecycle or any devops process but the tools are provided by aws and then so why aws for devops what are going to be the benefits of using DevOps on AWS. So the first thing is fully managed services, guys. So we know why do we use a cloud service? Because we don't want to manage our tools or uh, the VMs we have launched, the data we have stored. We don't want to manage it or we don't have to install softwares on it. We don't have to do anything. It is all taken care by AWS. They take care of our infrastructure. So that is the first reason, guys, fully managed services and then built for scale. Uh, because AWS DevOps, you will be using it on existing services like uh, EC2 or Lambda. So when you use on them, they already have a scaling feature within them. So obviously it is built for scale. So you can easily scale it uh, up or down. And then programmable. You can write scripts, you can write shell scripts, you can create a program which you can implement inside AWS developer tools which can uh, actually impact your DevOps lifecycle. And then automation. So DevOps is mainly automation. So 
Automation is one of the main reasons and automation is av uh, available in everything like Azure DevOps, AWS DevOps, even in GCP if you are implementing DevOps, automation will be available over there. Or if you manually use DevOps tools to create a DevOps lifecycle, even then automation is required. So DevOps main motive is automation. And then secure, yes, AWS provides security and it is their first priority. And then pay as you go. Pay as you go model is that whatever you use, you only pay for that, nothing else. For example, you'll launch a virtual machine using code deploy. So that virtual machine is running for two hours and then it gets terminated. So you'll have to only pay for that two hours time. You don't have to pay for creating a virtual machine and running it. You don't have to pay a month's fee. You just have to pay the money for that particular two hours. So moving on. Now we've discussed what are the benefits of having DevOps on AWS. Now we'll see what are the tools provided by AWS. So these are the four tools provided by AWS guys and these are the most basic tools. There are still more tools for uh, developing but these are the four most basic tools for creating a DevOps lifecycle. So the first one is code commit and then code build and then code deploy and code pipeline. So let us discuss them let's uh, discuss these developer tools in detail now so first let us discuss code commit so the name suggests that code commit is a version control tool it is like github so it is like bitbucket it is a version control tool guys but it is provided by aws and it also provides the same features github provides or bitbucket provides you can do all of those uh, stuff which is available over there like committing uh, pull requests, merging branches, you can do all of it even using code commit. You can also see over here code commits, uh, code commit allows five active users per month. So basically this is going to be your private repository. So it allows five users per month. For ex if you have a startup and you only have five members, you can actually use code commit and you won't be charged even a single rupee. And also you will be given 50 GB of space every month. So for example, our repositories may be maximum of a size of 1 MB or 2 MB, but 50 GB, they provide 50 GB of space for the repository guys. And also 10,000 Git requests per month, like pull or push requests. So this is code commit. It is a tool. It is like GitHub. It is like Bitbucket. It is the same kind of tool, but it is provided by AWS. And then AWS code build. So the name suggests that this tool is for building your application. So it provides a fully managed CI service that is continuous integration service. It will compile your source code. You can run uh, tests, you can run unit tests and also pr provide uh, software packages and store it in AWS uh, S3 so that you can take out those packages and use it to deploy your application. So you can see here AWS code build 100 build minutes that is for if you run a build, it might run for 20 seconds. So like that, you can run any number of builds which come up to 100 build minutes. And also it runs using build.general1.smallcompute type usage. So it runs with this and for every month you get 100 build minutes free. Moving on, AWS code deploy. This is one of the important service guys. This service is used to deploy your application on any service you choose like EC2 or Lambda. So it is an automated deployment tool which can deploy services like EC2, Lambda, Beanstalk. So even in, if you launch Beanstalk, it will be launched in an EC2 instance or Fargate and also your on-premise setup. So these are the four benefits provided by AWS Code Deploy. So first is automated deployments and then minimize downtime, centralized control and EC2 adopt. So the first one is automated deployment says when you set it up, whenever there is a change in your repository, it automatically uh, runs again, it builds again, it builds your code again and it gives it back. So that's what automated deployment means. Sorry, uh, it doesn't build and it stores, it actually deploys it again. Whenever there is a change in your code, it deploys and the change will be visible in your website and then minimize downtime. So whenever the code is changed, it is automatically, it takes very less seconds. 
your website will be down for maybe one to two seconds and the change will be on your website guys so it minimizes the downtime for example when you do it manually you will have to go to your system or your server where your website is launched and you will have to change your code over there when you do that the downtime increases but using code deploy you can minimize that so i'll show that in the demo guys and then centralized control you can just use your command line interface of aws or the management console and you can control all of the operations happening in code deploy code commit and code build and then easy to adopt you can see works with any application and same experience whether you are deploying it on ec2 aws or lambda that means if whatever service you are deploying it to maybe ec2 or lambda or fargate or elastic beanstalk it provides you the same ui with the same experience so it doesn't change it is the same thing but the deployment environment is different so this is code deploy guys and then finally aws code pipeline so we are going to use code pipeline we can use code pipeline to create a ci cd pipeline guys we can use all those services to do that so first thing it is a continuous delivery tool that's why it is called a ci cd pipeline so it is also fully managed by aws as i told you that is one of the benefit and also you can automate your website or you can automate your application which is running on code deploy so when you create a pipeline whenever there's a change in code it automatically pushes it to code deploy and the change will be made so that's how you use code pipeline guys you can see over here uh, take it as an example pipeline you have some website over in your source that is your github so you build it and you test it using some uh, programs so after testing it you can give any number of stages this is staging this means you will be seeing this deployed but you will be seeing it in a uh, ip address which only you might see you might have given the security group like that but in production when it gets deployed in production then you can uh, view your website using the ip address or the dns name from any other computer guys so this is how you use aws code pipeline and then so you can see over here uh, easy to integrate aws code pipeline with github or with your own custom plugin so you can integrate github and code pipeline easily you can just click on connect to github there is an option for that or you can use your own custom plugin like you would have created something in bitbucket or any other version control tool you can even use that and then also it is pay for what you use it's the same thing guys and also there is no upfront costs or long term commitments so it is basically free whatever services you launch using it for example the ec2 instance so those are charged not these services like pipeline or code deploy and also rapid delivery which basically means whenever there is a change in your code and it is applied to the master branch it will be applied to your uh, website directly and then configurable workflow the workflow you will have an ui you can configure your workflow how it should happen which is the deployment server which is the production server which is the qa server or you can mention builds or you can skip builds so you can uh, create a workflow for your own advantage and then get started first this basically means it's pretty easy they have a lot of documentation guys you can just go on create your own pipeline in no other than like half an hour so it takes only that much time and then it is easy to integrate you can integrate aws code pipeline with any service you can integrate with even jenkins so this is what they say easy to integrate so right now let us move on and let us create a cd pipeline using code pipeline and code deploy guys so let me open my github repository so let me close this so this is the github repository which i am going to use guys so you can see over here index.html abspec.yml readme uh, this is the readme file and then we, i have some scripts so first i'll show the index.html file so it is basically a hello world uh, H html and then the next thing the most important thing is abspec.yml so this is a yaml file so what it does is you can see over here the source is index.html destination is this so this is where apache 2 installs its uh, index.html file but we'll be deleting that file and launching our hello world application so you can see here before install 
script slash install dependencies and script slash server start server so i'll show that what actually is there i'm going to scripts install dependencies so in install dependencies you can see guys it updates the instance after updating updating the instance it will install apache 2 and also guys in your script make sure to make sure to provide minus y this means yes because you cannot go inside and click uh, enter yes so whenever you provide minus yes it will automatically take the command as yes and it will install the whole uh, software so whichever software needs a yes provide a minus y guys so if you don't provide it will fail and then it will remove the index.html file in so it will remove the index.html file in this location that will be created by apache dot apache 2 and that will be the ubuntu default page created by apache 2 but i don't want that page to be launched i want my page to be launched that is my uh, hello world page so these are the stuff i wanted to show you appspec.yml uh, i'll show why we need that where it will be used so now let us start off with our management console so the first thing we'll be doing is we'll have to create a code deploy guys so i'll go to code deploy first and also i'll open so if i go to code deploy basically you can see all of this over here you can see source repositories you can actually create a repository guys uh, to create a repository is very simple you can just provide a name for example website and then if you want you can provide a description or you can just create that's it but one more thing you cannot use your repository from your root account you will have to use it from your iam user which you can create but you cannot use it from your root account guys so i'm not going to use this i'm directly going to use from my github so this is uh it's actually pretty simple and then build build this for uh, as i told you it is for building your application but right now i'm launching my website so i'm going to use only code deploy and code pipeline guys so first thing we'll have to do is we'll have to create a here you can see ec2 then aws lambda and ecs i'm not going to use lambda or ecs i'm going to use my ec2 instance so you will have to click on ec2 and then create application you will have to select it over there because we'll be creating a deployment group which will be directing which will be targeting the ec2 instance uh, which we mention which we mention using tags if you want to use lambda you can choose that also but i want to use my ec2 instance guys so now we'll have to create a deployment group but to create a deployment group we will need a ec2 instance but currently i don't have an ec2 instance guys so because we'll have to mention ec2 instance over here i'll have to mention my uh, tag over here so before moving on with creating a deployment group uh, i'll create a ec2 instance so first what is deployment group so deployment group is it uh, directs or it targets to which instance should this particular code deploy application should deploy the application to that is the website so deployment group so let me create the ec2 instance first let me teach you how to do that and also how to install code deploy agent in that because without installing code deploy agent in your instance you will not be able to uh, use code deploy for your instance any instance which you use so i'm going to use a ubuntu server guys so i'm going to ec2 so i think you would have learned how to launch an instance from our other videos which are available in our channel so currently i'll not be explaining each and every step in creating an instance but i'll teach how to create an instance which will benefit in using code deploy so the first thing you'll have to do is you'll have to go to ec2 uh, dashboard and then go to instances click on launch instance guys so you can see over here choose ami ami is amazon machine images basically this means the iso file that is you can see this is amazon linux this is red hat this is uh, suz linux this is ubuntu and also you'll be having microsoft windows so you can choose any of this and launch the server but i want a ubuntu server guys i'm going to launch my website in my ubuntu server so i'll be selecting this and then these are instance types you can choose any instance but i'm going to go with free tier eligible uh, instance t2.micro which doesn't cost me any money up till 750 hours every month so you can use this particular instance you can run this instance for 750 hours every month 
So I'm going to go with t2.micro next. And here number of instance, I just need one instance. And then one more thing guys, this is the most important thing. You will have to include a IAM role. So why an IAM role? Because the code deploy agent should access your EC2 instance and also the EC2 instance should be connected to your code deploy agent. So to give a connection between these two AWS services, you will have to attach an IAM role. I already have created an IAM role guys. So I'm just going to go to EC2 code deploy. If you don't have one, you can just go here. I'll tell the basic how to create a role. So role, create role. You will have to choose the service which you are creating the IAM role for. So EC2, next permissions. And here you will have to provide code deploy. So you can see Amazon EC2 role for code deploy. You can just choose this and next, next you can provide a name over here and create the role guys. So I already have created a role. So you can see over here EC2. So I already have created a role using that particular permission. So I have created, if you want, you can create it. If you already have, you don't need to. So I have it, I chose the IAM uh, role. And then also I'll have to enter user data. So what does user data mean? <coughs> so basically user data is the commands or scripts which you want to run while the instance is being created. Once the inst instance gets created, these commands and these scripts will be automatically run. So we don't need to open the instance and run all of these. This will be automatically run if you enter the user data over here. So I have the user data over here guys. You can see over here, basically it will update my instance. It will install Ruby. Uh, actually Ruby is required for, uh, for code deploy. And then if you want, you can install wget or wget is already available in your EC2 instances. And then I'm going to this location and there I'm going to install my code deploy. After installing that, I'm just modifying my uh, permissions. And after that, I'm installing code deploy, which, which got downloaded. After it gets downloaded, now I'm starting code deploy guys. After installing code deploy, I'm going to start the code deploy service. Only if it is started, then I can connect my EC2 instance and code deploy. So I'll, end, I'll copy these and enter it in code deploy guys. That's it. So this is what we have to answer. And you can see over here, it asks for, I've given minus Y. So basically minus Y means uh, yes. So when you install Ruby, it basically asks yes. So providing minus Y doesn't uh, affect that. It will provide yes automatically. So we've done all of the required things over here and then adding storage, 8 GB is more than enough. And then you'll have to add a tag guys. So to add a tag, hit on add tag. Then I want to, the name is, sorry, the key is going to be name and my value is going to be web server. So this is going to be my value. Why I'm creating this tag? Because I'm going to use this tag to so I'll have to enter this tag over here so that this code deploy identifies this particular instance guys. So moving on next configuring security group. So already SSH is available, but I actually don't need to SSH into my instance, but right now I'm going to uh, allow an HTTP rule because I need HTTP because I'm launching a website guys. My website needs HTTP. Without HTTP, my website will not be able to be uh, seen using a URL. And also it can be seen from any IP address across the world. If they are using my IP, uh, IP address from any browser, from anywhere in the world and through internet, they can see my website guys. So reviewing and launching it. This is just for uh, making sure if everything is right. So I'm good with it. And you'll have to choose the key pair guys. Uh, if you already have a key pair, you can just choose the existing key pair and move on and click on launch instances. And now your instance has been launched. So you can just go to view instance. You can see my instance is being created right now. It's in pending state. So only if this is running. So right now I, I think I can see it over here. So right now just I'll go back 
And now let me start creating this deployment group. So my instance, let it get created. So my deployment group name is going to be web server deploy. So web server deploy one. And one more thing, you'll have to enter a service role guys. This service role allows this code deploy to connect with EC2 and other services like S3 or whichever you mention. So I have this service role. You can also create a service role for code deploy. So I showed you how to create a, a service role for EC2. So this shows how to create a service role for code deploy guys. And then let it be in place and then environment configuration. In environment configuration, you will have to mention whether you are going to connect your auto scaling group or your individual AC2 instances or your on-premise instances. I'm going to connect my EC2 instance, which is running right now. It is initializing guys. So right now, if I just hit name and you can see many values, my value was capital W web and capital S server. So I'm going to choose that. So now you can see there is one matching instance. If I click here for details, you can see over here and my instance is showing. So this is the instance and it is showing so that I have co connected this code deployed uh, group. So it is connected with this particular instance guys. My deployment group targets to that instance. So now I'm good to go. And here you can see deployment settings, deployment configuration. So one at a time, half at a time, all at once. Why should you become a cloud engineer? Now guys, let's start off with the basic necessity. What is the salary that a cloud engineer actually earns, right? So let's talk about that. So what we have done is we have basically collected data from a lot of sites, which basically do job postings. We have done it from ZipRecruiter. We have done it from Indeed. We have done it from Glassdoor. And this is what we have seen. So in the US, a cloud engineer, uh, an average cloud engineer basically earns $128,000 per annum. In India, an average cloud engineer earns around 7 lakh rupees per annum. And in the UK, you have around 60,000 pounds per annum. Okay, so guys, this is an average salary. Now, based on your experience, let's say you have a 10 or 12 years of experience in the IT domain and you plan on to shift onto the cloud sphere. In that case, you might even get a salary up to 20 plus lakhs per annum in India. Right, I'm just talking about with the limited experience that I have. So I have friends who have salaries for 25 plus lakhs per annum, but that given that they also have a very strong background in the IT domain, right? I also have seen people who have basically shifted from now non-IT domains and they started in the cloud sphere. And even in that case, given that, you know, you can implement what you have learned in your past experience in the cloud domain, they easily can grab a salary of around 12 to 15 lakhs based on their experience right so this these are the two things that i talked about the other thing is it also depends like i said on your experience and if you're a fresher and you're just starting out you know and you're thinking of basically starting off with the cloud domain you can easily earn around 4.5 to 5 lakhs per annum if you are a fresher given you have you don't have any experience in the industry and you are just starting off as a cloud engineer in this space, right? So this is the salary that you get when you basically become a cloud engineer and based on your experience, you can expect a different or a varied uh, salary exposure. Okay, moving forward guys. Now let's talk about the things which are important for you to get a higher salary. Now, how do you differentiate yourself from the people who are also there appearing for the same profile and are there in the interview room? So what differentiates you is your certification. So what are you certified with? Are you certified from AWS? Are you certified from Microsoft? Or are you certified from Google Cloud? Now, these are the top three cloud providers in the market right now. And each and every company who works on cloud would have their product on any of these cloud, right? And basically that is the reason any company who is basically expecting a cloud engineer uh, in their firm, they would expect you to have a certification from either of these three, right? And once you get certified, that basically tells the company, okay, so now you're certified in this particular domain. We now know that you know cloud up till a 
particular proficiency and then they start asking asking questions from that particular level now this might not be helpful for some people who have a hybrid kind of a profile wherein they are working as a software developer full time and they also work on cloud for some part of their project right but if they try to shift their domain they might get a job even without getting certified that is also possible but usually certification helps you when let's say you are working in a domain where cloud is not at all used right let's say you're working as a system administrator and let's say you're working for a company like IBM which have their own private cloud so what you don't have experience in or what you cannot put in your resume is that you have worked on AWS you worked on GCP you have worked on Azure on certain projects you that you cannot put so for people like these for people who don't have the working experience in these domains that are AWS Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud if you are planning to become a cloud engineer you would be to get Get certified in these cloud domains, right? So once you get certified, that basically tells the company, even though this person has not worked on production for these clouds, this guy has been basically certified by a parent body of the cloud provider. For in our case, let's just talk about AWS. So in case of AWS, the parent company is Amazon. So Amazon certifies this guy that he's proficient in their cloud infrastructure, right? And this is what the certification tells me. Now. On this certification, obviously, you'll have to also do some projects uh, that you would be doing independently and that you'll have to add to your resume. And that is how you will tell the company that you are appearing for that I have done some projects in cloud. Although I did not get the time while I was working in my company in the production environment, but this is what I've done in the side time of mine, right? I've done these projects and I've also got a certification from this company that I am a solution architect or a developer or an administrator, whichever certification you do, right? So a certification is very important and with the certification you can expect a salary hike, right? And the salary, average salary which we have discussed, this, this 139,000 is just a number. But whatever we discussed, you can aim for those salaries if given you don't have the experience in a current company with the certification. So you will have to get certified if you want to become a cloud engineer and you don't have the relevant experience right now. Okay, moving forward guys. Now let me tell you some of the average salaries based on the certifications. So if you are an AWS certified solutions architect, in the US you can expect around $130,000 per annum. If you are an AWS certified developer, you can expect around $130,000. And if you are a Microsoft Azure certified solutions architect, you can expect around $121,000. Now, all these salaries are basically the average salaries. So what I can tell you is, from $120,000 to $130,000 in the US, you can earn once you get certified by these companies and given you have the relevant experience, okay? Now, you might have noticed over here that you have something called as a solutions architect or you have something called as a developer and all of these are basically certified by AWS. So what are these? Now guys, uh, for the people who are from the IT domain and if they want to make a shift to the cloud and you also want to bring along with, your, uh, with you the experience that you have in the IT industry, what you can do is, uh, let's say you are a developer right now. Okay, and what you want to do is you want to become uh, or you want to do development in AWS with, let's say you have an application on Node.js and you want that Node.js application to interact with some services on AWS. So what we'll have to know, you'll have to know some SDKs, you'll have to know how to interact with AWS APIs. So all that knowledge is basically gained by a person who is a AWS certified developer. When we compare him with a solutions architect, the solutions architect job is not to code. So most of the people uh, that I've trained or that I know basically are solutions architect. The reason for that is when they started off in, uh, in their IT journey, they did not know much about cloud and they started off as a normal software engineer or a, or a system admin or something like that. And now for the people who don't know coding, right? And they still want to be in cloud, people can easily crack the solutions architect profile. The reason for that is in the solutions architect profile, what you have to know is how to plan things. What you have to know is how to architect applications without happening or without knowing the actual implementation of the code. So that is what the solutions architect profile is. But mind you guys, this profile is super tough as well as you progress in your career. 
So you will find architects who were developers before, who were system admins before. They have the complete knowledge of the inside and out of the product. They can code also and they also know how to plan. So those kind of people are also solutions architect and obviously their sal salary are on the higher range. If I talk about a solutions architect who knows coding, who knows in and out of the application and knows multiple clouds, his salary can go up to 40 plus lakhs per annum as well in India, right? So that is the kind of scope that you have when you get yourself quinted with AWS. It's a journey that you'll have to start with, right? But you will even find solutions architect who are sitting at four or five lakhs per annum. And those people are basically freshers who have joined the industry and they just know AWS, right? You will also find solutions architect who are around 14 or 15 lakhs based on the experience that they had and now they have shifted to cloud. So based on your experience, you can go up the ladder, right? The Certified Solutions Architect Associate is just a certification. But what matters is what experience you're bringing to the table. And that, that just makes everything change or that makes the rice tolling when you're basically applying for a job. Okay, uh, moving forward, guys. Now let's talk about what is the cloud engineer also. We have talked about why you should be a cloud engineer, where I talk to guys about we have talked about the money aspect. Let me also give you one more aspect, guys, that uh, Forbes uh, or some independent body, uh, we are going to, going to discuss about it in the future, uh, in the next couple of slides. But they have predicted that whatever revenue cloud is earning right now in 2019, by 2023, that revenue itself of the whole cloud industry is going to double, right? So that basically means whatever number of job postings that I'm going to show you today, they are going to basically double or triple by the year 2023 or 2025, right? So that's the kind of growth that cloud is going to see in the future. And if there is any time to shift to the cloud domain, it is right now, right? So if you are thinking about moving to the cloud domain or if you want and are intrigued with what cloud is and you want a job in the cloud domain, Right now is the time that you should migrate from your current job role to cloud, right? Now, what will you do when you become a cloud engineer? What exactly will be your role? Let's discuss that. Now, guys, a cloud engineer or like for my friends who are not acquainted with what cloud is, guys, cloud is nothing but in the most simplest terms possible. It is the use of remote servers on the internet, okay? So if you have remote servers on the internet and you use them from the comfort of your own laptop, you are basically on cloud. You're basically using servers which are not there in your premises. You are not, uh, you're using servers which are away from you. So that means you're using the cloud. So don't get confused with what cloud means. Cloud basically means you don't know where the server exists. You just have an IP address. You have the username and the password. And you just type that and you are you can see the desktop of that machine and you can do anything you want. That is cloud, right? In the most simplest terms. But it gets a little complex when we talk about, so I talked about a server that you would be existing on cloud that you can connect with, right? Now you have specialized servers in cloud which can do a particular task. For example, you have backend servers, you have frontend servers, you have database servers, and you can do a mix and match of these servers and create a whole ecosystem of application around you. So this is what a cloud engineer knows. He knows how to use the services provided by a cloud provider in the best, in the most optimum fashion possible and create a highly available and highly reliable application out of it, right? Doesn't matter if you code the best application in the world, but if your infrastructure is not supporting your application, you won't get the kind of performance you want out of your application, right? And that is exactly why you need cloud engineers because they know how to deploy your application. They know which server to deploy it on or which service to use it on, uh, use on cloud provider to deploy a particular application. If I were to give you an example of how it works uh, from the top of my mind is there are two backend languages. I'm not sure if everybody of you would have heard of it, but just here to the example and you'll know what I'm talking about. So there is a lang programming language called PHP and there's a programming language called Node.js. Now Node.js, 
Redis basically works on single thread while PHP works on multi-thread, right? So what happens is when you have to choose between PHP and Node.js for your application, let's say you work in a company and that company has made an application, development team has made an application and now they come to you asking or they, they, they are planning to make an application and they come to you asking which programming language should we use? Should we use PHP or should we use Node.js? Now you as an architect, you tell them that, you know, if you're using PHP, it's a multi-threaded language. If you use Node.js, that's a single-threaded language. Now this is something that you will find in any of the documentations. But what needs to, what what an architect needs to know is what are the advantages of using single-thread language and what are the advantages of using a multi-thread language? When you use a single thread language you cannot give that language processing uh, intensive tasks for example if there is one task that requires a lot of processing that would not function well on node.js uh, given it's a single threaded language right while on php if there are multiple threads which can run at a sim uh, single time that particular language can accept process you know an application which involves a lot of processing right but if your application uh, does not have that much of a processing it's just uh, about doing crud operations on databases right in those kind of scenarios, you can use Node.js because it performs way better than PHP. Now, this knowledge which I just told you is a knowledge that an architect should know, right? Or a person who is handling a team or who's going to deploy your application on a particular infrastructure or in a particular environment should know. And this is similar to this knowledge in infrastructure, a cloud engineer should also know, right? For example, if my application is process intensive, it, it, if it requires a lot of processing, how much of RAM or how much of CPU would a single server require that I have to plan? Which service on the cloud? Like for example, in AWS, there are three types of compute services, mainly, right? You have EC2, you have Elastic Beanstalk, you have Lambda, right? So where to put which application you have to know. For example, Lambda requires backend uh, or basically does backend processing for you, right? So backend part of your application would go on AWS Lambda. Now, obviously if it's going on AWS Lambda, you'll also have to make it highly available. So AWS Lambda handles it for you. But when we talk about your front end, where a lot of users are gonna ping your website, that task will basically requiring a lot of scaling up and down because the traffic is not the same at every time. What I basically mean by that is, let's say uh, you are running a company and at around 4 p.m. you get the maximum traffic, right? So in that case, you need a server capacity of around nine or 10 servers at that time. And at 6 p.m. the traffic drops, okay? At that time, you don't need those many servers. So how to configure the auto scaling properties and cloud providers, right? That and all, all this knowledge is what an architect gains when he he basically gets certified or you know when he roasts himself by doing work day in and day out as a cloud engineer right so guys a cloud engineer role uh, to sum it up is to know what application would go on what service of the cloud and what would be the best practices of deploying an application that is what a cloud engineer should know right now he has to work on planning he has to work on architecting then he also has to work on managing the infrastructure once it's deployed and obviously he also has to look at how we can monitor and support this particular application all this planning all this implementation is done by the architect or the administrator or the developer but essentially they are known as cloud engineers and this is what your role would be when you shift into the cloud domain so to sum it up if you are applying the best practices and uh, whatever principles you have learned in cloud then that profile would sum up to become a cloud engineer profile now moving forward guys let's talk about the skills that a cloud engineer should have right so a cloud engineer or a person uh, if I'm a company and I'm, if I'm hiring a cloud engineer, I would expect certain skills out of a person. So I would expect he would, he should know some programming language. I would expect he would know some Linux scripting uh, skills uh, that he should have. I would, I would expect him to have some troubleshooting skills and I would expect him to know multiple cloud domains. Now, this is not what I think the companies would expect. This is basically a the research that we have done and i'll show you in some moment guys some i'll show you some job descriptions from companies who are basically hiring cloud engineers and i'll show you what kind of skills that they ask right so how to become a cloud engineer so i told you guys some companies expect some skills now how to get yourself acquainted in those skills but before that let me show you 
actually what are the requirements and skills that are expected from a cloud engineer so guys a job description is what we will be looking at so in this particular section of job roles and responsibilities i'll be showing you some job descriptions from multiple companies and then we'll sum it up and see what are the required skills which the industry is demanding right now to become a cloud engineer okay so let's start off with the first job description so this is a job description which is by cisco right and they are basically hiring a cloud infrastructure engineer and what they expect this guy to know is devops he should know how to resolve customer issues that is he should be customer centric right he should know how to deploy cloud applications on aws he should know about vpcs which are basically services in aws ec2 again a service etc right so these are the skills that they expect from a cloud engineer you would be wondering what is devops over here right so i will explain that in a few moments but as you can see these are all the skills that they expect from a cloud engineer in the cisco company now let's go ahead let's talk about amazon so amazon is also hiring cloud engineer and what they expect is they should know troubleshooting they should have experience with aws google cloud rackspace software management etc they should know a programming language among java perl ruby or python and they should have experience in managing full stack applications right this is the expectation from a cloud engineer by amazon company then there is a company mcafe which i'm sure all of you know now in this you are expected to know aws you are expected to know azure you are expected to know google cloud right you are expected to know cloud formation which is basically a service in aws you are expected to know puppet ansible and chef which are basically devops tools you are expected to know python right so all these skills are required so what i'm trying to tell you is it will not work if you just know one cloud provider it will not work if you just know one programming language you have to know a combination of multiple things and only then this cloud engineer profile can be take on okay and more and more skills and more and more relevant you become with the job descriptions for example i'm not focusing on a, on any one company what i've done is i have generally taken out skills from multiple cloud engineer profiles and then i have accumulated them together let me show you how that looks like so the required skills are these so if you were to sum it up if you want to become a cloud engineer you should have knowledge of aws azure and gcp right then you should have a experience in any of these programming languages python java go r clojure i would recommend you if you are planning on to learn a programming language you should basically either learn python or go basically because they are huge uh, when it comes to the demand that they have right now you should have a little experience in linux operating systems not a little actually i'll say you should be an intermediate in your linux skills then you should also have no tools like puppet chef git docker kubernetes nagios terraform etc right so don't get scared guys with all these big words i'm not only telling you the problem or what all the companies expect i also give you a solution as to how you can prepare for this okay so and you should also have an understanding of apis and web services okay so these are all the skills that are required to become a cloud engineer and i would say even if you gauge around 60 to 70% of these skills you can apply for a cloud engineer job this is basically job description for a generic company which is out there now how relevant you become to become a cloud engineer is this list the more and more you know this list the more and more you become relevant and you can apply for any cloud engineer job as you move along okay now let's talk about what are the skills that we have summarized so i've told you guys that you should know linux so first off when you start on the journey of becoming a cloud engineer you should start off by learning linux if you know linux you can skip this but if you don't know linux first you should learn this right then you should start off with all the cloud providers that is aws azure and gcp you should start learning that once you are done with linux and cloud providers you now know how things work on cloud okay now what you have to know is how companies implement or upload or basically help their development team to integrate their development tools with cloud and that is exactly what devops is for uh, if i were to give you an example let's say there's a developer in a company and what he knows is basically a place where he can upload your code right for example uh, a developer's best 
friend is basically a version control system. Let's assume he is using GitHub, right? So all he knows is how to code and how to upload it on GitHub. But from GitHub, how do you test that application? And if the test is complete, how do you make it available on production? That life cycle is basically what DevOps caters to. Okay, now how does cloud fit in DevOps is when you have deployed an application on, let's say your production server, most of the companies now are basically using cloud, right? Which basically means they don't have any infrastructure of their own. Probably the developer's machine would be there in the company, but the server on which the application is deployed is not in the company, it's on the cloud. So I think you got the idea that whenever your applications are either getting deployed on testing server or on the prod server, these servers are nothing but these are servers which are deployed on the cloud, which could be either AWS, Azure or GCP. So how to create the DevOps lifecycle on the cloud is what you'll have to learn. And that's why you also have the DevOps tools as a skill when you want to become a cloud engineer. Then you should also know a programming language. The reason for that is I told you guys uh, a cloud engineer should also know how to code. The reason for that is let's say an application stops working, all right? And now the developers have no clue why it's not working. So it's your job to understand the code and understand where exactly the problem is occurring. And that's why it is recommended that you should know a programming language. Otherwise, if you're planning to aim for the cloud developer role, in that case, what you'll be doing is you basically will be implementing your application with the cloud, right? And if you're integrating your application with the cloud, which basically means you have to interact with the services of the cloud, then you have to know how to implement SDKs, right? In a programming language. And that exactly would be covered when you know a programming language, right? And finally, because Today, in this today's world, we are no longer working with monolithic, monolithic applications. What are monolithic applications? There is no one code which will basically run my whole application. You basically have different parts of the application deployed separately and these different parts interact with each other. And these are what APIs are in the most simplest terms. Okay. So if you did not get that, let me just tell you in a brief uh, sentence that earlier all the applications had one single code base and they were deployed and the application used to work. But what happened was as we progressed in the software development uh, journey, we realized that let's say I'm using the Uber app and I have to add a feature in the payments section. So I'll have to open the whole code base again. I'll have to go to the payments uh, section of the code and I'll have to make changes and then upload the whole code again. This unnecessarily broke something or the other in the whole code base. And now what we follow is a microservices architecture. And in the microservices architecture, what we do is we basically break the application into multiple parts. And then these parts interact with each other using API endpoints, right? So as a cloud engineer with the modern applications that we deploy, you should also know what are APIs. Okay. So these are the required skills for you to become a cloud engineer and you should follow this particular fashion when you are basically preparing for a cloud engineer role. Okay. Now I told you guys how you can prepare for a cloud engineer role right now. If you were to do it on your own, this is the way. If you want help from us uh, or from any e-learning company, I'll tell you a way as to how you can learn that as well. Okay. But before that, I'd like to tell you guys the present is good. I mean, if you want to become a cloud engineer right now, it's the best possible time you can become. If you become right now, what is the future that lies in front of you? It should not be like that in two, three years, the demand goes down, right? So let me tell you the future of a cloud engineer. So guys, these are basically some statements that I have picked up from these companies. Like Forbes says, cloud engineer or cloud architect profile is in the Forbes top 15 list of highest paying tech jobs right now, right? Forbes says, Around $146,000 is the median salary for a cloud professional, which is basically a jump because when they did the survey in 2016, it was $22,000 less than the figure that you see right now. So as the number of years are passing by, the, the obviously the inflation is also there, but $22,000 is not the kind of inflation that you would see, guys. Right? So it's a huge jump in the median salary, in the average salary of a cloud engineer. Then according to Glassdoor, in, in the last month alone, right, we are talking right now in August 2019. So in July 2019, there were 5,765 jobs posted in India just for a cloud engineer. And there were 33,272 jobs which were posted that were in the US. Okay. 
so this is the huge demand that you can see that is there for a cloud engineer profile similarly uh, there's a company called canalysis so they say aws which is the biggest cloud provider in the market right now it owns around 31.5% of the cloud market share now you would think that you know 31.5 is not a huge number but when you compare it with azure which is the second largest cloud provider it has around 14 or 15% of the cloud market share which is actually the half of what aws owns and it is the second largest cloud provider microsoft azure so as you can see aws has a whole lead and the reason for telling you this is when you are planning to learn about the cloud providers you which which I basically told you three which are aws azure and gcp you should always start with aws given you don't know aws yet right the reason for that is once you learn aws and let's say you know you plan on going on with the other skills like the devops skills and the programming languages skills you can actually skip azure and gcp for a while because when you apply for jobs 31 out of 131 companies would be using aws 16 companies would be using microsoft azure and if i were to go by my memory around 8 to 9% or 6 to 7% is actually by gcp so out of 100 31 companies are aws 16 companies microsoft azure and 6 to 7 companies would be google cloud so this is the current figure so if you go by probability you are likely to get a job as a cloud engineer if you know aws then you know if you know in microsoft azure and gcp but our aim is to know all the three but if you were to plan as to how to learn all the skills that we have discussed today you should start with aws so this point is specifically for that and finally according to report linker uh, so this was the fact that i was talking about in the beginning of the session that right now the cloud industry has the revenue of around 258 billion dollars annually right So by 2023 this is going to become 623.3 billion dollars that's more than the double of what the cloud industry is gaining right now right so this basically just tells us how much the cloud industry is going to grow in the future all right moving forward now let's talk about the job roles that you have in cloud so i told you you can become a cloud engineer you can become a cloud engineer but actually a cloud engineer is basically a generic profile which companies post on the job portal it 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 is basically built up with a combination of job roles so what are those job roles so the first profile is solutions architect which i told you about wherein you have to plan you have to know the in and out of your application you should know which part of your application should be deployed on which service of the cloud that job is basically the solutions architect job then you have the cloud developer so cloud developer is a person who knows how to develop applications and also how to write sdks so that the application can interact with the cloud services so that's a guy who is a cloud developer then you have a person who is a sysops administrator a sysops administrator is a person who basically manages the infrastructure once it has been deployed by the architect right so once the uh, 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 the infrastructure has been either designed or applied by the architect the sysops guy's job would be to implement that architecture or handle that architecture according to the norms that has been specified by the solutions architect so this is what a sysops administrator is so for all my friends who have an experience in development and they feel that you know i want to stay in development right now i don't want to become a full stack cloud engineer i basically want to be in development but i would want some of my job to include cloud then your profile that you are aiming for is cloud developer for my friends who are already system administrators and they basically want to skill up themselves by becoming system administrators for particular cloud uh, provider they can basically aim for the sysops administrator profile and for the people who want to move up the ladder they basically have around 14 to 15 years of experience either or basically they are from a non it background and they want to shift in the cloud domain you should start off with the solutions architect profile okay there are some more profiles which are basically cloud network engineers so people who are focused on just networking aspect of cloud if you want to 
become a network guru then in your case you should opt for the cloud network engineer profile and then you have the cloud devops engineer which is basically a profile which basically expects you to know cloud in and out which expects you to know devops in and out and this is basically the profile that i was telling you about that you should aim for right you should know all the skills that are basically expected from a person who is a cloud engineer and basically then would become a generic cloud engineer who can apply to any company so this is the th that guy so your aim is this if you want to start off from a particular point your your point would be this you become a solutions architect first get yourself certified in that then work your, your way up for cloud devops engineer and similarly you can become a cloud developer or a software administrator and then you can get certified in cloud devops engineer similarly for cloud network engineer as well. hey guys welcome to this session by intelipa in this session, we're going to look into AWS interview questions and not in the regular way. So we're going to try to simulate how the interview process happens and tell you and show you how exactly you should answer the interview questions. And once that will be done, we'll also add a set of interview questions which you can use to clear the next interview you get into. And before moving on with the session, please subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss our upcoming videos and also leave a like if you enjoy our content. Now let's begin with the session. Hi, Eman. Hi, so, hi, Korea. Let's start off with this interview process. So let's start with the introduction of yourself. All right. So I'm basically a developer and uh, I wanted to switch my domain to cloud. So that's why I basically took up upon myself that I've learned AWS. I've done a lot of projects as you can uh, see in my resume. And uh, yeah, so I mean, this is my first job as a cloud engineer. Yeah, I see your resume and I think you worked as a developer first. So how exactly did you learn AWS? So I basically self-learned and I also took a course uh, from Intellipad. So I did my training over there and there I have done a lot of projects uh, which actually gave me the confidence that yes, I can actually contribute to an organization like yours and uh, be a good cloud engineer. So now looking at your resume, it seems that you have worked on FSX. Yeah. So what do you think is the difference between FSX and EFS and what gives the edge that you chose FSX over here? Okay, so uh, FSX basically is, a, is again a shared uh, drive uh, service as EFS is. But the major difference is that when you're using FSX, then you get high IO, right? So whenever we have an application which requires high input output rate, then it's better to use FSX because even the pricing is on the higher side, right? Uh, if you do not have an application which requires high or intensive IO uh, configuration, in that case, we can use EFS. And the application that I had to use in my project had a high IO and that's why I chose uh, FSX. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, so now let's look into RDS. So there is an RDS cluster where blue green deployment has not been set up. Okay. Okay. So now if the master goes down, what exactly will you do to bring the cluster up? Okay. So if my master will go down, that means uh, I'm, I will not be able to write anymore on the clusters, but the read operations will still be valid because I will have uh, multiple read replicas. Had there been a blue green deployment in that case, what I could uh, simply do was I could switch to the other cluster but since you said there's no blue green deployment that basically means there's only one master right and that master you said it went down right so what i'll do is i'll basically promote a read replica to be the master and that's how my write operations will again start okay. yeah okay so now let me ask you some very basic questions sure. which are also really important so how is stopping and terminating an instance different from each other? Okay, so when we stop an instance, what basically happens is that uh, the storage is detached from the server and this server is basically given back to AWS, right? But when we terminate an instance, what happens is even the storage is uh, like erased and it's given back to AWS along with the server. So uh, in, in terms of pricing, if I were to explain, if you stop a server, then you're only charged for the storage, right? But when you terminate a server, you are not charged for anything and the server basically goes out. Okay. Yeah. So in the same pattern, let me ask you another basic question, sure. which is also really important. So how exactly do you choose an availability zone? 
okay so uh, when choosing an availability zone the first thing that i have to make sure of is the target audience that i'm catering to for example uh, let's say i have an application where the user base is more in the mumbai region right so what i'll do is i'll have to choose a region which basically is nearer to the mumbai region in order to reduce the latency so latency is one thing that i'll have to make sure of second thing that i have to make sure of is um, whether the pricing is something which the organization is agreeing to right for example uh, let's say in the us i'm getting a very less price for the server and let's say in the india wherever i'm launching the server the price is very high right so that factor also has to be catered in when basically i'm thinking about where to launch a server right so if the latency is low if the price is low uh then i mean it comes down to uh which availability zone will i be choosing right so whatever so sometimes what happens in aws is if you are trying to launch an instance right it will say it is not available in a certain availability zone so that's why we will be basically setting or we will be trying out our application in the region or in the availability zone where i do not get any errors after doing all the research about latency and the pricing part and then i basically decide that this is the availability zone that i'll be deploying my server in okay got it yeah. Okay so now let's look into the next question. Yeah. So give me the difference between stateless and stateful systems. Okay. So uh stateful systems are the systems where the server remembers about uh whatever the user was doing or whatever job it was doing. Okay. Right? Uh, if I were to give you an example, let's say I have uh, 10 jobs that I I want my system to execute, okay. right? And what my system does is it basically scales itself to three or four servers. and these three or four servers are now basically solving the 10 jobs that we gave them now if the first system has to pick up a job he should know that the second or third system has already solved that job or not right so this is basically a stateful system where they are aware about uh, you know their surroundings but when we talk about stateless systems in stateless systems uh, the systems are not aware about what has already happened or what is going to happen right for example uh, uh let's say again taking the same example if you have 10 jobs and four systems are doing it uh it might be because all these four systems are not knowing what the other systems are doing they might do the same job repetitively right so to avoid that we basically make sure that uh, you know the applications are stateful sometimes stateless applications also make sense right uh but i mean if we don't have that disadvantage in place then stateless systems make sense otherwise they do not oh got it yeah so now tell me this is aws lambda stateful or a stateless service okay uh so honestly i have never worked on aws lambda so i would not know whether if it's a, a stateful or a stateless uh, service okay so guys a very important thing over here so if you do not know about something that is being asked in the interview So it's better to say you do not know about it than to give a wrong answer since it gives a wrong signal to the interviewer that you might do the same when there's a critical uh, you know situation in the company and something which you do not know of you might give a wrong suggestion. So it's always good to basically uh, talk about what you know and the things that you do not know of uh, it's better to tell the interviewer that you're not comfortable in that topic. So let me answer that question for you. So AWS Lambda is a stateless system. Okay. Okay. So now on that, mm -hmm. another question. So how to make an application stateful while using AWS Lambda? Okay. So uh, any any stateless system, if you are dealing with, uh, let's take the same example wherein I have uh, four servers and I have a sequence of jobs which I want the four servers to execute parallelly. So uh, to make it stateful what I can do is I can add a queue in front of my servers yeah. and when I add a queue I have all the 10 jobs so what will happen is the moment a job is taken up by a server this queue will delete that job uh, from itself right so in that case my system will always get jobs which are not taken up by any other server and hence we can it can mimic the behavior of a stateful system come on yeah okay So now let's look at our final question. Sure. So you have a video transcoding application, and the videos are process recording to a queue. 
So now, if the processing of a video is interrupted in one instance, it will resume in another instance. Okay. And currently, there is a huge backlog of videos which needs to be processed. And for this, you should obviously add more instances. But these instances should only be available until the backlog is reduced. Okay. So now, which instance type would you choose to make this happen? So I'll give you some options. Let's say on demand, squad instances, and reserved instances. Okay. All right. So guys, if you noticed here, this is a pretty big situation which the interviewer has given. So in this situation, the first part of the situation says that there is a video transcoding application. If the video is interrupted to be processed in one system, it resumes in another. Right. And finally, the question is about which instance should you use? So the first of the part of the question is actually not relevant to the answer. And this sometimes happens uh, to basically just confuse you right to make you think that it is related to each other but in this particular question it is not related okay so now now the main question that uh, the interviewer has asked is that i have the uh, videos which have to be processed and they have to be processed fast since there's a huge backlog which is already there so we need to add more instances and these instances are only required till the time uh, you know, the videos are actually processed and the videos when the videos are no, no more there, then we don't need the servers anymore. Now, the three options that I've got, uh, which are actually also the AWS pricing options for EC2 is reserved instance, on spot instances, or you have uh, on demand instances. So reserved instances, we will only use when, uh, you know, there is a time length that I know that I want the servers for, for example, I need it for one year or a three year time of frame. But here, since we do not know that amount of time that we require the servers for, reserved instances will not make sense. Uh, now, since this is this application, uh, we, we basically require more servers. Why? Because we want to get uh, rid of the backlog very fast, right? So in that case, spot instances also, they do not make sense because spot instances will stop the moment the pricing goes up, right? So the only option that we are left out with is the on-demand part. So on-demand instances will be perfectly suitable for this kind of a scenario. Reason being that uh, we just want them till the time that the videos are processed. So we know uh, that once the videos are done, I have to terminate the instances. And that feature we get in on-demand instances. We do not get this in reserve because uh, I'll have to, you know, uh, I have to commit to a time in reserved instances for the time that I'll be using the servers for. So for this option, I think uh, uh, on-demand instances would be the correct option. Okay, Heaven, got yeah. it. All right. So the first question says, what is the difference between an AMI and an instance? So guys, an AMI is nothing but a template of an operating system. It's just like a CD that you have uh, of an operating system, which you can install on any machine on the planet, right? Similarly, an AMI is a template or is, is, is an installation of an operating system which you can install on any servers which uh, fall into the uh, Amazon infrastructure. All right, you have many types of AMIs. You have Windows AMI, you have Ubuntu AMIs, you have uh, CentOS AMIs, etc. There are a lot of AMIs that are present in AWS Marketplace and you can install them on any servers which are there in the AWS infrastructure, all right? Coming on to instances, what are instances? So instances are nothing but the hardware machines on which you will install AMI. Right. So like I said, AMIs are templates which can be installed on machines. These machines are called instances. And again, instances also have types based on the hardware capacity. For example, a one CPU and one GB of machine is called T2.micro, right? Similarly, you have T2.large, you have T2.extra-large, then you have IO intensive uh, machines, you have storage intensive machines, you have memory intensive machines, and all of these have been classified in different classes, right? Depending on their hardware capability. So this was the difference between an AMI and an in instance. Our next question asks us, what is the difference between scalability and elasticity? All right, so guys, scalability versus elasticity is a very confusing topic. And if you think about it, so scalability is nothing but increasing the, the, the machine's resources. For example, if your machine has 8 GB of RAM today, you increase it to 16 GB. Therefore, the number of machines are not increasing. You are basically just increasing the specification of the machine, right? And this is called scalability. 
When we talk about elasticity, we are basically increasing the number of machines present in an architecture. We are not increasing the specification of any machine. For example, we choose that we require a 3 GB machine with around 8 GB or 10 GB of storage, right? So any replica which will be made or any auto scaling which will happen, it will only happen to the number of machines. It will nowhere be related to the specification of the machine. The specification of the machine will be fixed. The number of machines will go up and down and this is called elasticity. On the other hand, scalability is called, uh, is basically terms as the change of the specification of the machine that is you're not increasing the number of machines you're basically just increasing the specs of the machine for example the ram the memory uh, the hard disk etc and this is the basic difference between scalability and elasticity moving forward our next question is which aws offering enables customers to find, buy, and immediately start using software solutions in their AWS environment. Now you can think of it as, say, you want a deep learning AMI, or you want a Windows Server AMI, which specific software is installed on it, right? So some of them are available for free, but some of them can be purchased in the AWS marketplace. So the answer for this is AWS marketplace. It's basically a place where you can buy all the AWS uh, systems that you, or, or all the AWS, uh, uh, or non AWS software that you require to run on the AWS infrastructure, right? So the answer is AWS marketplace. Moving on, our next question would fall under the domain of resilience architecture. So all the questions that we'll be discussing henceforth in this domain will all be dealing with the resiliency of an architecture. All right. So a customer wants to capture all client connection information from his load balancer at an interval of five minutes. Which of the following options should be chosen for his application? All right. So I'll read out the options for you. The option A says enable AWS CloudTrail for the cloud balancer for the load balancer. Option B says CloudTrail is enabled globally. Option C says install the Amazon CloudWatch logs agent on the load balancer. And option D says enable CloudWatch metrics on the load balancer all right now if you think about it cloud trail and cloud watch are both monitoring tools so it's a bit confusing but if you have studied it deeply or if you understand how cloud trail works and how cloud watch works it is actually not that difficult all right so uh, the answer for this is a that is you should enable aws cloud trail for the load balancer reason being uh, option b is not correct cloud trail is not enabled by default or is not enabled globally to all the services option c says install amazon cloud watch so option C and option D, you will not even consider reason being that you're talking about the log of the client information, right? What all people are connecting to the load balancer, what IP addresses are connecting to the load balancer, etc. CloudWatch deals with the local resources of the instance that you are basically monitoring. For example, if you are monitoring EC2 instance, CloudWatch can monitor the CPU usage or the memory usage of that particular instance. It cannot uh, take into account the connections which are getting connected to your AWS infrastructure, right? On the other hand, CloudTrail deals with all these kind of things wherein client information or any kind of uh, data which can be fetched from a particular transaction, all of that can be recorded in the logs of CloudTrail. And hence for this particular question, the answer is enable AWS CloudTrail for the load balancer. Moving on, our next question is in what scenarios should we choose classic load balancer and application load balancer? All right. So uh, for this question, I think uh, the best way to answer this question would be to understand what exactly is classic load balancer and what exactly is application load balancer. All right. So a classic load balancer is nothing but, uh, you know, it's an old fashioned load balancer, which does nothing but round robin based uh, distribution of traffic, which means it distributes traffic equally among the machines which are under it. It cannot recognize which machine requires which kind of workload or it requires which kind of traffic. Whatever data will come to a classic load balancer will be distributed equally among the machines which have been registered to it. On the other hand, application load balancer is a new age load balancer, which basically deals with identifying the workload which is coming to it, right? It can identify the workload based on two things. It can either identify it based on the path. For example, uh, uh, you can say that um, you, you have a website which deals in image processing and video processing. So you can say it, uh, it might go to intellipa.com slash images or slash videos. 
So if if the path is slash images, the application load balancer will directly route the traffic to only the images servers, right? And if the path is slash videos, the application load balancer will automatically route the traffic to the video servers. And this is application load balancer. So whenever we, whenever you are dealing with multivariate traffic, that is traffic which is meant for a specific group of servers, you would use application load balancer. On the other hand, if you have servers which uh, which do the exact same thing, right? you just want to uh, distribute the load among them equally then in that case you would use a classic load balancer our next question says if you have a website which performs two tasks that is rendering images and rendering videos both of these pages are hosted in different parts of the website right? but under the same domain name which aws component will be apt for your use case among the following all right so this i think is an easy question reason being we just discussed this right so the answer for this is application load balancer reason being the kind of traffic which is coming is specific to its workload and this can be differentiated easily by an application load balancer okay so we are done with the resilient architecture questions now let's move on to the performance architecture domain where we'll be discussing about how to uh, about architectures which are performance driven right so let's take a look at the first question so the first question says you require the ability to analyze a customer's clickstream data on a website so they can do behavioral analysis so your customer needs to know what sequence of pages and ads their customers clicked on this data will be used in real time to modify the page layouts as customers click through the site to increase stickiness and advertise click through which option meets the requirement for captioning and analyzing that this data all right so the options are amazon sns aws cloud trail aws kinesis and aws ses so let's first uh, start with the uh, odd one out uh, options right so we have amazon sns which deals with notifications so obviously because we want uh, to uh, basically we, we want to track uh, user data right so sns would not be the app choice for it because sending multiple notifications in a short amount of time would not be apt similarly ses would also not be the app choice because then we will be getting emails on basically the, uh, the user behavior and this would amount to a lot of emails so hence it's not an appropriate solution uh, i think uh, then we have aws cloud trail and aws kinesis actually both these services can do this work but the keyword over here is real time right you want the data to be in real time so since the data has to be in real time you will choose aws kinesis cloud trail cannot uh, pass on logs for real time analysis kinesis is specially built for this particular purpose and hence for this particular question the answer will be aws kinesis moving on then our next question is uh, you have a standby rds instance will it be in the same availability zone as your primary rds instance okay so the options are uh, it it it's only true for amazon aurora and oracle rds second option is yes third option is only if configured at launch and the fourth option is no all right so the right answer for this uh, i want you to think about it like this that whenever you want a standby uh, rds instance it will only be there when your rds instance stops working now what could be the reasons that your rds instance could stop working probably it could be a machine failure or it could be a power failure at your uh, at 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 the at the place where your server has been launched it can also be uh, probably a natural calamity which would have struck your uh, data center where your server exists so all of these could be reasons which could lead to disruption in your rds service right now if your standby rds instance is also in the same availability zone as your primary these conditions cannot be tackled or these situations cannot be tackled all right so it is always logical to have your standby machines in some other place right so that uh, even if there is a natural calamity or if there is a power failure you your instance is always up and ready and because of that aws does not give you the option of launching your standby rds instance in the same availability zone it always has to be in another availability zones and that's why the answer is no your rds instance will not be in the same availability zone as your primary instance all right so our next question is you have a web application running on six amazon ec2 instances 
consuming about 45% of resources on each instance. You are using auto scaling to make sure that six instances are running at all times. The number of requests this application processes is consistent and does not experience spikes. All right. So the application is critical to your business and you want high availability at all times. You want the load to be distributed evenly between all instances. And you also want to use the Amazon AMI for all instances. Which of the following architectural choices should you make? All right, so this is a very interesting question. So basically you want to run six Amazon ECD instances six Amazon EC2 instances and they should be highly available in nature and they would be using an AMI of course because they are auto scaled. So which among the following would you choose? So you have the options deploy six EC2 instances in one availability zone and ELB, deploy three EC2 servers in one region and three in another region and use ELB. You should deploy three EC2 on one AZ uh, that is availability zone and three in another availability zone and you should deploy two EC2 instances in three regions and use an elastic load balancer. All right. Now, uh, the correct answer for this would be uh, C. The reason being that AMIs are not available across regions. Right. So if you have created an AMI in one region, it will not be automatically available in another region. You, you will have to do some changes and only then or uh, do some operations and only then it will be available in the another region. So this is reason number one. So the region options mentioned over here get casted out because of this reason. Second, if you look at the uh, first option, which says deploy six EC2 instances in one availability zone, that defeats the purpose of high availability. Because uh, like I said, if there is any natural calamity or a power failure at a data center, then all your uh, instances will be down. So it's always advisable to have your servers distributed. But since we have that uh, limitation of using an AMI and therefore uh, and also the limitation that it is not uh, accessible across regions we would choose distributing our instances among availability zones and I'd say uh, we have we just had the option of uh, two availability zones right it could be three availability zones and we could deploy two two servers in each and this would also amount to high availability all right and of course because you want to load balance traffic uh, if you apply an elb on top of uh, three availability zones it will work like a charm regions um, across regions it can become a problem right and uh, but in availability zones it definitely works and it will work perfectly all right so the answer for this question is uh, you would be deploying ec2 instances among multiple availability zones in the same region across an elb so our next question is why do we use elastic cache and in what cases all right so the answer for this uh, is basically related to the nature of the service of elastic cache so elastic cache as the name suggests it's basically a cache which can be accessed faster than uh, your normal application for example if you talk about uh, a database instance from which you are gathering information right if you're always dealing with the same kind of query for example you're always fetching the password for particular users right so if you're using an elastic cache that data can be captured or can be cached inside elastic cache and whenever a similar uh, request comes in which is asking for that kind of data your mysql instance will not be disturbed the data will directly be relayed from elastic cache and that is the exact use of elastic cache right so you use elastic cache when you want to increase the performance of your systems right or whenever you have frequent reads of the similar data so if you have frequent reads of similar data, we will probably be querying the same kind of data every time. And basically that will increase the load on your database uh, instance. But to avoid that, you can uh, you can basically introduce an elastic cache layer between your database and your front end application. And that would not only increase the performance, but also decrease the load on your database instance. All right. So uh, this was all about performant architectures, guys. Our next domain would deal with secure application uh, and uh, their architecture. So let's go ahead and start with the first question of this domain, which talks about 
A customer wants to track access to their Amazon simple storage service buckets and also use this information for their internal security and access audits. Which of the following will meet the customer requirement? So basically you want to just track access to the S3 buckets. Now if you want to track access, let's see what are the options. So you can enable CloudTrail to audit all Amazon S3 buckets. You can have, uh, enable server access logging for all required Amazon S3 buckets. Enable the request a page option to track access via AWS billing or you can enable AWS S3 event notifications for put and post. All right, so I would say the answer is A and reason being why is the answer not B because server access logging is actually not required when you want to deal with tracking access to the objects present in the S3 bucket. A uh, requester pays option to access via AWS billing. Again, it's not required because there's a very simple feature of CloudTrail which, you, which is available to all the buckets across S3. So why not use that? And using notifications for S3 will not be apt. Reason being, there will be a lot of operations that would be happening. So rather than sending notifications for each and every operations, it is better that we log those operations so that whatever information we want of the, out of the log, we can take and rest, we can ignore, right? So the answer for this is Amazon uh, using AWS CloudTrail. Okay, our next question is, imagine if you have to give access of AWS to a data scientist in your company. The data scientist basically requires access to S3 and Amazon EMR. How would you solve this problem from the given set of options? Okay, so you basically want to give a particular services access to an employee and we want to know how would you do that, okay. So the options are, uh, we should give him credentials for root. Uh, second option being create a user in IAM with a managed policy of EMR and S3 together. Create a user in IAM with managed policies of EMR and S3 separately. Give him credentials for admin account and enable MFA for additional security. Okay, so a rule of thumb guys, never give root credentials to anyone in your company. Even yourself, you should never use root credentials. Always create a user for yourself and access AWS through that user. All right. This was point number one. Second, whenever you are, uh, you want to give permissions to services or uh, uh, permissions of services to of particular services to people, you should always create or use policies that pre-exist in AWS. Right. So when I say that, I basically mean never merge two policies. Okay, so for example, if you if you are using EMR and S3 together, that basically means that you create a policy with, that gives you, uh, you know, uh, the required access in one document. That is in one document, you mention the access for EMR and the in the same document, you mention the access for S3 as well. Well, this is not suggested. Reason being, you have policies created by AWS, uh, which is, uh, which are basically created and tested by AWS. So there is no chance of any leak in terms of security aspect. Second thing is, see, needs change, right? So if tomorrow your user says he doesn't want access for EMR anymore, he probably wants access for EC2. Right. So in that case, what will you do? If you had the policy in, in the same document, you would have to edit that document. Correct. But if you create a document separately for each and every service, all you have to do is remove the document for EMR and add the document for the other service that he requires, probably EC2. You just add the document for EC2 and your S3 document will not be touched, right? So this is more easier to manage than to, uh, you know, writing everything in one document and editing the code later to give permissions of specific services that he requires now, right? So that is something that is not much manageable. So the answer for this is create a user in IAM with a managed policy of EMR and S3 separately. All right, let's move on to the next question. So how would a system administrator add an additional layer of login security to a user's AWS management console? So, okay, so this is 
a simple question. The answer for this is enable multi-factor authentication. So a multi-factor authentication basically deals with uh, rotating keys that the keys are always rotating. So every 30 seconds, a new key is generated and this key is required while you're logging in. So once you've entered your email and password, it will not straight away log you in. It will again give you a confirmation page for a code that you have to enter, which will be valid for those 30 seconds. Now this can be done using apps. So you have a app called, uh, if you have an app from Google, you have apps from other uh, third party vendors as well, right? So these apps are basically compliant with your AWS, right? And you can use them to uh, have access to the keys which are changed at every 30 seconds, all right? So it is better, uh, so you, if you want to enable multi-factor authentication, it is the best way of adding a security layer over the traditional username and password information that you enter. All right. So our next domain uh, deals with cost optimized architectures. So let's discuss these questions as well. So our first question is why is AWS more economical than traditional data centers for applications with varying compute workloads? All right. So let's read out the options. So we have Amazon Elastic Compute costs are billed on a monthly basis. Okay. Amazon EC2 costs are billed on an hourly basis, which is true. Amazon EC2 instances can be launched on demand when needed, true. Our customers can permanently run enough instances to handle peak workloads. All right, so I'll say because this question is talking about the economical value of AWS, option B and option C are correct. Reason being you're charged according to the R and at the same time, you can have them on demand. If you don't need them after two hours, just pay for two hours and then you can, you don't have to worry about where that server went, right? So this is very economical as compared to the fact that when you buy servers and their need finishes, say after one or two years, when their hardware gets outdated, so it becomes a bad investment on your part, right? And that is the reason AWS is very much economical in terms of, uh, uh, reason being that, uh, you know, the it, is, it charges you according to the R and also gives you the opportunity of using servers on the basis of on-demand pricing. All right. So this would be the answer. So option B and option C would be the right answer for this particular question. Moving further, uh, our question says you're launching an instance under the free tier usage from EMI having a snapshot size of 50 GB. How will you launch the instance under free usage tier? So the answer for this question is pretty simple. It is not possible, right? You have a limit on how much of size, snapshot size you can use uh, that would fall under the free tier. 50 GB is not the size, uh, is basically a size which will not fall under the Amazon free tier rules and hence this is not possible. All right. Our next question says your company runs a multi-tier web application. The web application does video processing. There are two types of users which access this service, premium users and free edition users. The SLA for the premium users for the video processing is fixed, while for the free users, it is indefinite. That is a maximum time limit of 48 hours. How would you propose the architecture for this application, keeping in mind cost efficiency? All right, so to rephrase this question, basically uh, you have an application which has two kinds of traffic. One is free traffic and one is premium traffic. The premium traffic has an SLA that the task say should be completed in say one hour or two hours. Uh, the free traffic, they do not guarantee it when it will finish and it has a maximum SLA of 48 hours. So if you were to optimize the architecture for this uh, uh, at the back end, how would you design the architecture that you get the maximum cost efficiency possible using this architecture. All right. So the way we can deal with it is uh, there is a thing called uh, spot instances in AWS, which basically deals with bidding. So you bid for uh, AWS servers in the lowest uh, price possible. And as long as the server prices are the, in, in the range that you specify, you have that instance for yourself. So all the free users who are coming to this website can be allotted to spot instances because there is no SLA. So even if the prices go high and the systems are not available, it does not matter. 
right you can uh, wait for the applications for processing if you're dealing with free users but for premium users since there is an sla you have to meet a particular deadline i would say you use on demand instances they are a little expensive but i think because premium users are paying for their uh, membership that should cover that part and spot instances would be the cheapest option for people who are freeloaders or people who are coming free on your website because they do not have any urgency of their work and hence can wait if required if the prices are too high for you all right so our next domain will talk about operationally excellent architectures so let's see what all questions are covered in this particular domain all right so imagine that you have an aws application which is monolithic in nature so monolithic applications are basically which do not uh, which 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 have the whole code base in one single computer right so if that is the kind of application you are dealing with it's called a monolithic application now this application requires 24/7 availability and can only be down for a maximum of 15 minutes if had your application been not monolithic i would say that there would be no downtime but since it's a monolithic application the question has mentioned there is an expected downtime of say 15 minutes how will you ensure that the database hosted on your ebs volume is backed up now since it's a monolithic application even the database resides on the same server as that of the application so the question is how will you ensure that your database is backed up in case there is an outage so for this answer i'll say the answer is pretty easy you can schedule ebs snapshots for a ec2 instance at particular intervals of time and these snapshots would basically act as a backup to your database instances which have been deployed on ec2 so hence the answer is ebs instance back uh, snapshots all right our next question is which component of aws global infrastructure does aws cloudfront use to ensure low latency delivery now aws cloudfront is basically a content delivery network which basically means if you are in the us and the application that you are accessing has servers in india it will probably cache the application in a us server so that you can access that application faster than to send traffic packets over to india and then receiving them back all right So this is how CloudFront works. It basically caches the application to your nearest server, and so that you get the maximum latency. Uh, sorry, the minimum latency possible, and the, it is possible using AWS Edge locations. Okay, so Edge locations are basically the servers that are located to uh, near your uh, near your place. or near a particular availability zone which basically cache the applications which are available in different regions or are at far far places just a quick info for all of you cloud enthusiasts if you want to make a career in aws then you might want to check out intellipaths aws certification training course for solution architect learn from industry experts through hands on session projects and case study reach us out to know more